Chapter Seventeen of the Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, Home Again, eighteen fifty three through eighteen fifty six. Anti slavery work, stirring times in the United States, addressed to the ladies of Glasgow appeal to the women of america correspondence with william lloyd garrison the writing of dread farewell letter from georgiana may second voyage to england after her return in the autumn of eighteen fifty three from her european tour mrs stowe threw herself heart and soul into the great struggle with slavery much of her time was occupied in distributing over a wide area of country the english gold with which she had been entrusted for the advancement of the cause with this money she assisted in the redemption of slaves whose cases were those of peculiar hardship and helped establish them as free men she supported anti-slavery lectures wherever they were most needed aided in establishing and maintaining anti-slavery publications founded and assisted in supporting schools in which colored people might be taught how to avail themselves of the blessings of freedom she arranged public meetings and prepared many of the addresses that should be delivered at them she maintained such an extensive correspondence with persons of all shades of opinion in all parts of the world that the letters received and answered by her between eighteen fifty three and eighteen fifty six would fill volumes with all these multifarious interests her children received a full share of her attention nor were her literary activities relaxed immediately upon the completion of her european tour her experiences were published in the form of a journal both in this country and england under the title of sunny memories she also revised and elaborated the collection of sketches which had been published by the harpers in eighteen forty three under title of the mayflower and having purchased the plates caused them to be republished in eighteen fifty five by phillips and sampson the successors of john p jewett and company in this country and by sampson lowe and company in london soon after her return to america feeling that she owed a debt of gratitude to her friends in scotland which her feeble health had not permitted her adequately to express while with them mrs stowe wrote the following open letter to the ladies anti-slavery society of glasgow dear friends i have had many things in my mind to say to you which it was my hope to have said personally but which i am now obliged to say by letter i have had many fears that you must have thought our intercourse during the short time i was in glasgow quite unsatisfactory at the time that i accepted your very kind invitation i was in tolerable health and i supposed that i should be in a situation to enjoy society and mingle as much in your social circles as you might desire when the time came for me to fulfil my engagement with you i was as you know confined to my bed with a sickness brought on by the exertion of getting the key to uncle tom's cabin through the press during the winter in every part of the world the story of uncle tom had awakened sympathy for the american slave and consequently in every part of the world the story of his wrongs had been denied it had been asserted to be a mere work of romance and i was charged with being the slanderer of the institutions of my own country i knew that if i shrank from supporting my position the sympathy which the work had excited would gradually die out and the whole thing would be looked upon as a mere romantic excitement of the passions when i came abroad i had not the slightest idea of the kind of reception which was to meet me in england and scotland i had thought of something involving considerable warmth perhaps and a good deal of cordiality and feeling on the part of friends but of the general extent of feeling through society and of the degree to which it would be publicly expressed i had i may say no conception as through your society i was invited to your country it may seem proper that what communication i have to make to friends in england and scotland should be made through you 
in the first place then the question will probably arise in your minds have the recent demonstrations in great britain done good to the anti-slavery cause in america the first result of those demonstrations as might have been expected was an intense reaction every kind of false evil and malignant report has been circulated by malicious and partisan papers and if there is any blessing in having all manner of evil said against us falsely we have seemed to be in a fair way to come in possession of it the sanction which was given in this matter to the voice of the people by the nobility of england and scotland has been regarded and treated with special rancor and yet in its place it has been particularly important without it great advantages would have been taken to depreciate the value of the national testimony the value of this testimony in particular will appear from the fact that the anti-slavery cause has been treated with a special contempt by the leaders of society in this country and every attempt made to brand it with ridicule the effect of making a cause generally unfashionable is much greater in this world than it ought to be it operates very powerfully with the young and impressionable portion of the community therefore cassius m clay very well said with regard to the demonstration at stafford house quote, it will help our cause by rendering it fashionable End quote. with regard to the present state of the anti-slavery cause in america i think for many reasons that it has never been more encouraging it is encouraging in this respect that the subject is now fairly up for inquiry before the public mind and that systematic effort which has been made for years to prevent its being discussed is proving wholly ineffectual the key to uncle tom's cabin has sold extensively at the south following in the wake of uncle tom not one fact or statement in it has been disproved as yet i have yet to learn of even an attempt to disprove the north american review a periodical which has never been favorable to the discussion of the slavery question has come out with a review of uncle tom's cabin in which while rating the book very low as a work of art they account for its great circulation and success by the fact of its being a true picture of slavery they go on to say that the system is one so inherently abominable that unless slaveholders shall rouse themselves and abolish the principle of chattel ownership they can no longer sustain themselves under the contempt and indignation of the whole civilized world what are the slaveholders to do when this is the best their friends and supporters can say for them I regret to say that the movements of Christian denominations on this subject are yet greatly behind what they should be. Some movements have been made by religious bodies, of which I will not now speak, but as a general thing the professed Christian church is pushed up to its duty by the world, rather than the world urged on by the church. The colored people in this country are rapidly rising in every respect. I shall request Frederick Douglass to send you the printed account of the recent colored convention. It would do credit to any set of men, whatever, and I hope you will get some notice taken of it in the papers of the United Kingdom. It is time that the slanders against this unhappy race should be refuted, and it should be seen how, in spite of every social and political oppression, they are rising in the scale of humanity in my opinion they advance quite as fast as any of the foreign races which have found an asylum among us may god so guide us in all things that our good be not evil spoken of and that we be left to defend nothing which is opposed to his glory and the good of man yours in all sympathy h b stowe during the kansas and nebraska agitation eighteen fifty three through fifty four mrs stowe in common with the abolitionists of the north was deeply impressed with the solemn sense that it was a desperate crisis in the nation's history she was in constant correspondence with charles sumner and other distinguished statesmen of the time and kept herself informed as to the minutest details of the struggle at this time she wrote and caused to be circulated broadcast the following appeal to the women of america quote, the providence of god has brought our nation to a crisis of most solemn interest 
a question is now pending in our national legislature which is most vitally to affect the temporal and eternal interests not only of ourselves but of our children and our children's children for ages yet unborn through our nation it is to affect the interests of liberty and christianity throughout the world of the woes the injustice and the misery of slavery it is not needful to speak there is but one feeling and one opinion upon this subject among us all i do not think there is a mother who clasps her child to her breast who would ever be made to feel it right that that child should be a slave not a mother among us who would not rather lay that child in its grave nor can i believe that there is a woman so unchristian as to think it right to inflict upon her neighbor's child what she would consider worse than death were it inflicted upon her own i do not believe there is a wife who would think it right that her husband should be sold to a trader to be worked all his life without wages or a recognition of rights i do not believe there is a husband who would consider it right that his wife should be regarded by law the property of another man i do not believe there is a father or mother who would consider it right were they forbidden by law to teach their children to read i do not believe there is a brother who would think it right to have his sister held as property with no legal defence for her personal honour by any man living all this is inherent in slavery it is not the abuse of slavery but its legal nature there is not a woman in the united states where the question is fairly put to her who thinks these things are right but though our hearts have bled over this wrong there have been many things tending to fetter our hands to perplex our efforts and to silence our voice we have been told that to speak of it was an invasion of the rights of states we have heard of promises and compacts and the natural expression of feeling has in many cases been repressed by an appeal to those honourable sentiments which respect the keeping of engagements but a time has now come when the subject is arising under quite a different aspect the question is not now shall the wrongs of slavery exist as they have within their own territories but shall we permit them to be extended all over the free territories of the united states shall the woes and the miseries of slavery be extended over a region of fair free unoccupied territory nearly equal in extent to the whole of the free united states nor is this all this is not the last thing that is expected or intended should this movement be submitted to in silence should the north consent to the solemn breach of contract on the part of the south there yet remains one more step to be apprehended namely the legalizing of slavery throughout the free states by a decision of the supreme court in the lemon case it may be declared lawful for slave property to be held in the northern states should this come to pass it is no more improbable that there may be four years hence slave depots in new york city than it was four years ago that the south would propose a repeal of the missouri compromise women of the free states the question is not shall we remonstrate with slavery on its own soil but are we willing to receive slavery into the free states and territories of this union shall the whole power of these united states go into the hands of slavery shall every state in the union be thrown open to slavery this is the possible result and issue of the question now pending this is the fearful crisis at which we stand and now you ask what can the women of the country do oh women of the free states what did your brave mothers do in the days of our revolution did not liberty in those days feel the strong impulse of women's hearts there was never a great interest agitating a community where woman's influence was not felt for good or for evil at the time when the abolition of the slave trade was convulsing england women contributed more than any other laborers to that great triumph of humanity the women of england refused to receive into their houses the sugar raised by slaves seventy thousand families thus refused the use of sugar in testimony of their abhorrence of the manner in which it was produced 
at that time women were unwearied in going from house to house distributing books and tracts upon the subject and presenting it clearly and forcibly to thousands of families who would otherwise have disregarded it the women all over england were associated in corresponding circles for prayer and labor petitions to the government were prepared and signed by women of every station in all parts of the kingdom women of america we do not know with what thrilling earnestness the hopes and the eyes of the world are fastened upon our country and how intense is the desire that we should take a stand for universal liberty when i was in england although i distinctly stated that the raising of money was no part of my object there it was actually forced upon me by those who could not resist the impulse to do something for this great cause nor did it come from the well-to-do alone but hundreds of most affecting letters were received from poor working men and women who enclosed small sums in postage stamps to be devoted to freeing slaves nor is this deep feeling confined to england alone i found it in france switzerland and germany why do foreign lands regard us with this intensity of interest is it not because the whole world looks hopefully toward america as a nation especially raised by god to advance the cause of human liberty and religion there has been a universal expectation that the next step taken by america would surely be one that should have a tendency to right this great wrong those who are struggling for civil and religious liberty in europe speak this word slavery in sad whispers as one names a fault of a revered friend they can scarce believe the advertisements in american papers of slave sales of men women and children traded like cattle scarcely can they trust their eyes when they read the laws of the slave states and the decisions of their courts the advocates of despotism hold these things up to them and say quote, see what comes of republican liberty End quote. hitherto the answer has been america is more than half free and she certainly will in time repudiate slavery altogether but what can they say now if just as the great struggle for human rights is commencing throughout europe america opens all her territories to the most unmitigated despotism while all the nations of europe are thus moved on the subject of american slavery shall we alone remain unmoved shall we the wives mothers and sisters of america remain content with inaction in such a crisis as this the first duty of every american woman at this time is to thoroughly understand the subject for herself and to feel that she is bound to use her influence for the right then they can obtain signatures to petitions to our national legislature they can spread information upon this vital topic throughout their neighborhoods they can employ lecturers to lay the subject before the people they can circulate the speeches of their members of congress that bear upon the subject and in many other ways they can secure to all a full understanding of the present position of our country above all it seems to be necessary and desirable that we should make this subject a matter of earnest prayer a conflict is now begun between the forces of liberty and despotism throughout the whole world we who are christians and believe in the sure word of prophecy know that fearful convulsions and overturnings are predicted before the coming of him who is to rule the earth in righteousness how important then in this crisis that all who believe in prayer should retreat beneath the shadow of the almighty it is a melancholy but unavoidable result of such great encounters of principles that they tend to degenerate into sectional and personal bitterness it is this liability that forms one of the most solemn and affecting features of the crisis now presented we are on the eve of a conflict which will try men's souls and strain to the utmost the bonds of brotherly union that binds this nation together let us then pray that in the agitation of this question between the north and the south the war of principle may not become a mere sectional conflict degenerating into the encounter of physical force let us raise our hearts to him who has the power to restrain the wrath of men that he will avert the consequences that our sins as a nation so justly deserve there are many noble minds in the south 
who do not participate in the machinations of their political leaders and whose sense of honor and justice is outraged by this proposition equally with our own while then we seek to sustain the cause of freedom unwaveringly let us also hold it to be our office as true women to moderate the acrimony of political contest remembering that the slaveholder and the slave are alike our brethren whom the law of god commands us to love as ourselves for the sake then of our dear children for the sake of our common country for the sake of outraged and struggling liberty throughout the world let every woman of america now do her duty End quote. At the same time, Mrs. Stowe found herself engaged in an active correspondence with William Lloyd Garrison, much of which appeared in the columns of his paper, The Liberator. Late in 1853, she writes to him, quote, In regard to you, your paper, and in some measure your party, I am in an honest embarrassment. I sympathize with you fully in many of your positions. Others I consider erroneous, hurtful to liberty and the progress of humanity. Nevertheless, I believe you and those who support them to be honest and conscientious in your course and opinions. What I fear is that your paper will take from poor Uncle Tom his Bible and give him nothing in its place. End quote. To this, Mr. Garrison answers, quote, I do not understand why the imputation is thrown upon the liberator as tending to rob Uncle Tom of his Bible. I know of no writer in its pages who wishes to deprive him of it, or of any comfort he may derive from it. It is for him to place whatever estimate he can upon it, and for you and me to do the same, but for neither of us to accept any more of it than we sincerely believe to be in accordance with reason, truth, and eternal right. How much of it is true and obligatory, each one can determine only for himself. For on Protestant ground there is no room for papal infallibility. All Christendom professes to believe in the inspiration of the volume, and at the same time, all Christendom is by the ears as to its real teachings. Surely you would not have me disloyal to my conscience. How do you prove that you are not trammeled by educational or traditional notions as to the entire sanctity of the book? Indeed, it seems to me very evident that you are not free in spirit, in view of the apprehension and sorrow you feel because you find your conceptions of the Bible controverted in the Liberator. Else, why such disquietude of mind? Thrice is he armed who hath his quarrel just. End quote. In answer to this, Mrs. Stowe writes, quote, I did not reply to your letter immediately, because I did not wish to speak on so important a subject unadvisedly, or without proper thought and reflection. The greater the interest involved in a truth, the more careful, self-distrustful, and patient should be the inquiry. I would not attack the faith of a heathen without being sure I had a better one to put in its place, because, such as it is, it is better than nothing. I notice in Mr. Parker's sermons a very eloquent passage on the uses and influences of the Bible. He considers it to embody absolute and perfect religion, and that no better mode for securing present and eternal happiness can be found than in the obedience to certain religious precepts therein recorded. He would have it read and circulated, and considers it, as I infer, a Christian duty to send it to the heathen, the slave, etc., I presume you agree with him. These things being supposed about the Bible would certainly make it appear that if any man deems it is his duty to lessen its standing in the eyes of the community, he ought at least to do so in a cautious and reverential spirit, with humility and prayer. My objection to the mode in which these things are handled in the Liberator is that the general tone and spirit seem to me the reverse of this. If your paper circulated only among those of disciplined and cultivated minds, skilled to separate truth from falsehood, knowing where to go for evidence, and how to satisfy the doubts you raise, I should feel less regret. But your name and benevolent labors have given your paper a circulation among the poor and lowly. They have no means of investigating, no habits of reasoning. The Bible, as they at present understand it, is doing them great good, and is a blessing to them and their families. The whole tendency of your mode of proceeding is to lessen their respect and reverence for the Bible without giving them anything in its place. 
i have no fear of discussion as to the final results on the bible my only regrets are for those human beings whose present and immortal interests i think compromised by this manner of discussion discussion of the evidence of the authority the inspiration of the bible and of all theology will come more and more and i rejoice that they will but i think they must come as all successful inquiries into truth must in a calm thoughtful and humble spirit not with bold assertions hasty generalizations or passionate appeals i appreciate your good qualities none the less though you differ with me on this point i believe you to be honest and sincere in mr parker's works i have found much to increase my respect and esteem for him as a man he comes to results it is true to which it would be death and utter despair for me to arrive at did i believe as he does about the bible and jesus i were of all creatures most miserable because i could not love god i could find no god to love i would far rather never have been born as to you my dear friend you must own that my frankness to you is the best expression of my confidence in your honour and nobleness did i not believe that an excellent spirit is in you i would not take the trouble to write all this if in any points in this note i appear to have misapprehended or done you injustice i hope you will candidly let me know where and how truly your friend h b stowe in addition to these letters the following extracts from a subsequent letter to mr garrison are given to show in what respect their fields of labor differed and to present an idea of what mrs stowe was doing for the cause of freedom besides writing against slavery andover massachusetts february eighteenth eighteen fifty four dear friend i see and sincerely rejoice in the result of your lecture in new york i am increasingly anxious that all who hate slavery be united if not in form at least in fact a unity in difference our field lies in the church and as yet i differ from you as to what may be done and hoped there brother edward beecher has written a sermon that goes to the very root of the decline of moral feeling in the church as soon as it can be got ready for the press i shall have it printed and shall send a copy to every minister in the country our lectures have been somewhat embarrassed by the pressure of new business brought upon us by the urgency of the kansas nebraska question since we began however brother edward has devoted his whole time to visiting consultation and efforts the result of which will shortly be given to the public we are trying to secure a universal arousing of the pulpit dr bacon's letter is noble you must think so it has been sent to every member of congress dr kirk's sermon is in advance and his congregation warmly seconded it now my good friend be willing to see that the church is better than you have thought it be not unwilling to see some good symptoms and hope that even those who see not at all at first will gain as they go on i am acting on the conviction that you will love the cause better than self if anything can be done now advantageously by the aid of money let me know god has given me some power in this way though i am too feeble to do much otherwise yours for the cause h b stowe although the demand was very great upon mrs stowe for magazine and newspaper articles many of which she managed to write in eighteen fifty four through fifty five she had in her mind at this time a new book which should be in many respects the complement of uncle tom's cabin in preparing her key to the latter work she had collected much new material in eighteen fifty five therefore and during the spring of eighteen fifty six she found time to weave these hitherto unused facts into the story of dread in her preface to the english edition of this book she writes quote, the author's object in this book is to show the general effect of slavery on society the various social disadvantages which it brings even to the most favored advocates the shiftlessness and misery and backward tendency of all the economical arrangements of slave states the retrograding of good families into poverty the deterioration of land the worst demoralization of all classes from the aristocratic tyrannical planter to the oppressed and poor white which is the result of the introduction of slave labor 
it is also an object to display the corruption of christianity which arises from the same source a corruption that has gradually lowered the standard of the church north and south and been productive of more infidelity than the work of all the encyclopedists put together End quote. The story of dread was suggested by the famous Negro insurrection led by Nat Turner in eastern Virginia in 1831. In this affair, one of the principal participators was named Dread. An interesting incident connected with the writing of Dread is vividly remembered by Mrs. Stowe's daughters. One sultry summer night there arose a terrific thunderstorm, with continuous flashes of lightning and incessant rumbling and muttering of thunder, every now and then breaking out into sharp, crashing reports, followed by torrents of rain. The two young girls, trembling with fear, groped their way downstairs to their mother's room, and on entering found her lying quietly in bed, awake, and calmly watching the storm from the windows, the shades being up she expressed no surprise on seeing them but said that she had not been herself in the least frightened though intensely interested in watching the storm Quote, i have been writing a description of a thunderstorm for my book and i am watching to see if i need to correct it in any particular End quote. our readers will be interested to know that she had so well described a storm from memory that even this vivid object lesson brought with it no new suggestions this scene is to be found in the twenty-fourth chapter of Dread, Life in the Swamps. Quote, the day had been sultry, and it was now an hour or two past midnight, when a thunderstorm which had long been gathering and muttering in the distant sky began to develop its forces. A low, shivering sigh crept through the woods and swayed in weird whistlings the tops of the pines, and sharp arrows of lightning came glittering down among the branches as if sent from the bow of some warlike angel. An army of heavy clouds swept in a moment across the moon, then came a broad, dazzling, blinding sheet of flame. End quote. What particularly impressed Mrs. Stowe's daughters at the time was their mother's perfect calmness and the minute study of the storm. She was on the alert to detect anything which might lead her to correct her description. Of this new story, Charles Sumner wrote from the Senate chamber. My dear Mrs. Stowe, I am rejoiced to learn from your excellent sister here that you are occupied with another tale exposing slavery. I feel that it will act directly upon pending questions and help us in our struggle for Kansas and also to overthrow the slave oligarchy in the coming presidential election. We need your help at once in our struggle. Ever sincerely yours, Charles Sumner. Having finished this second great story of slavery, in the early summer of 1856, Mrs. Stowe decided to visit Europe again in search of a much-needed rest. She also found it necessary to do so in order to secure the English right to her book, which she had failed to do on Uncle Tom's cabin. Just before sailing, she received the following touching letter from her lifelong friend, Georgiana May. It is the last one of a series that extended without interruption over a period of thirty years, and as such has been carefully cherished. Quote, Ocean House, Groton Point, July 26, 1856. Dear Hattie, very likely it is too late for me to come with my modest knock to your study door and ask to be taken in for a moment, but I do so want to bless you before you go, and I have not been well enough to write until today. It seems just as if I could not let you go till I have seen once more your face in the flesh, for great uncertainties hang over my future. One thing, however, is certain, whichever of us two gets first to the farther shore of the great ocean, between us and the unseen, will be pretty sure to be at hand to welcome the other. It is not poetry, but solemn verity between us, that we shall meet again. But there is nothing morbid or morbific going into these few lines. I have made old Tiff's acquaintance. He is a verity. will stand up with Uncle Tom and Topsy, pieces of negro property you will be guilty of holding after you are dead very likely your children may be selling them hattie i rejoice over this completed work another work for god and your generation i am glad that you have come out of it alive that you have pleasure in prospect that you walk at liberty and have done with fits of languishing 
perhaps some day i shall be set free but the prospect does not look promising except as i have full faith that the good man above is looking on and will bring it around all right still heart and flesh both fail me he will be the strength of my heart and i never seem to doubt my portion forever if i never speak to you again this is the farewell utterance yours truly georgiana mrs stowe was accompanied on this second trip by her husband her two eldest daughters her son henry and her sister mary mrs perkins it was a pleasant summer voyage and was safely accomplished without special incident End of chapter 17 Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana Chapter 12, Part 1 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe Compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Dread, 1856. Part 1. Second Visit to England. A Glimpse at the Queen. The Duke of Argyle and Inverary. Early Correspondence with Lady Byron. Dunrobin Castle and its Inmates. A Visit to Stoke Park. Lord Dufferin. Charles Kingsley at Home. Paris Revisited, Madame Mall's Receptions. After reaching England about the middle of August, 1856, Mrs. Stowe and her husband spent some days in London completing arrangements to have an English edition of Dread published by Samson Lowe and Company. Professor Stowe's duties in America being very pressing, he had intended returning at once, but was detained for a short time, as will be seen in the following letter written by him from Glasgow, August 29th, to a friend in America. Dear friend, I finished my business in London on Wednesday, and intended to return by the Liverpool steamer of tomorrow, but find that every berth on that line is engaged until the 3rd of October. We therefore came here yesterday, and I shall take passage in the steamer New York from this port next Tuesday. We have received a special invitation to visit Inverary Castle, the seat of the Duke of Argyle, and yesterday we had just the very pleasantest little interview with the Queen that ever was. None of the formal drawing-room breathless receptions, but just an accidental done-on-purpose meeting at a railway station while on our way to Scotland. The Queen seemed really delighted to see my wife, and remarkably glad to see me for her sake. She pointed us out to Prince Albert, who made two most gracious bows to my wife, and two to me, while the four royal children stared their big blue eyes almost out, looking at the little authoress of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Colonel Gray handed the Queen, with my wife's compliments, a copy of the new book, Dread. She took one volume herself and handed the other to Prince Albert, and they were soon both very busy reading. She is a real nice little body, with exceedingly pleasant, kindly manners. I expect to be in Natick the last week in September. God bless you all. C. E. Stowe after her husband's departure for the united states mrs stowe with her son henry her two eldest daughters and her sister mary mrs perkins accepted the duke of argyle's invitation to visit the highlands of this visit we catch a pleasant glimpse from a letter written to professor stowe during its continuance which is as follows inverary castle september sixth eighteen fifty six my dear husband we have been now a week in this delicious place, enjoying the finest skies and scenery, the utmost of kind hospitality. From Loch Goyle we took the coach for Inverary, a beautiful drive of about two hours. We had seats on the outside, and the driver, John, like some of the white mountain guides, was full of song and story and local tradition. He spoke Scotch and Gaelic, recited ballads, and sung songs with great gusto. Mary and the girls stopped in a little inn at St. Catherine's, on the shores of Loch Fine, while Henry and I took steamboat for Inverary, where we found the Duchess waiting in a carriage for us with Lady Emma Campbell. 
the common routine of the day here is as follows we rise about half past eight about half past nine we all meet in the dining hall where the servants are standing in a line down one side and a row of chairs for guests and visitors occupies the other the duchess with her nine children a perfectly beautiful little flock sit together the duke reads the bible and a prayer and pronounces the benediction after that breakfast is served a very hearty informal cheerful meal and after that come walks or drives or fishing parties till lunch time and then more drives or anything else everybody in short doing what he likes till half past seven which is the dinner hour after that we have coffee and tea in the evening the first morning the duke took me to see his mine of nickel silver we had a long and beautiful drive and talked about everything in literature religion morals and the temperance movement about which last he is in some state of doubt and uncertainty not inclining i think to have it pressed yet though feeling there is need of doing something if dread has as good a sale in america as it is likely to have in england we shall do well there is such a demand that they had to placard a shop window in glasgow with quote, to prevent disappointment dread not to be had till etc everybody is after it and the prospect is of an enormous sale god to whom i prayed night and day while i was writing the book has heard me and given us of worldly goods more than i asked i feel therefore a desire to walk softly and inquire for what has he so trusted us every day i am more charmed with the duke and duchess they are simple-hearted frank natural full of feeling of piety and good sense they certainly are apart from any considerations of rank or position most interesting and noble people the duke laughed heartily at many things i told him of our andover theological tactics of your preaching etc but i think he is a sincere earnest christian our american politics form a daily topic of interest the late movements in congress are discussed with great warmth and every morning the papers are watched for new details i must stop now as it is late and we are to leave here early to-morrow morning we are going to staffa iona the pass of glencoe and finally through the caledonian canal up to dunrobin castle where a large party of all sorts of interesting people are gathered around the duchess of sutherland affectionately yours harriet from dunrobin castle one of his daughters writes to professor stowe quote, we spent five most delightful days at Inverary, and were so sorry you could not be there with us. From there we went to Oban, and spent several days sightseeing, finally reaching Inverness by way of the Caledonian Canal. Here, to our surprise, we found our rooms at the hotel all prepared for us. The next morning we left by post for Dunrobin, which is fifty-nine miles from Inverness at the borders of the duke's estate we found a delightfully comfortable carriage awaiting us and before we had gone much farther the postilion announced that the duchess was coming to meet us sure enough as we looked up the road we saw a fine cavalcade approaching it consisted of a splendid coach and four in which sat the duchess with liveried postilions and a number of outriders one of whom rode in front to clear the way the duchess seemed perfectly delighted to see mamma and taking her into her own carriage dashed off towards the castle we following on behind at dunrobin mrs stowe found awaiting her the following note from her friend lady byron london september tenth eighteen fifty six your book dear mrs stowe is of the little leaven kind and must prove a great moral force perhaps not manifestly so much as secretly and yet i can hardly conceive so much power without immediate and sensible effects only there will be a strong disposition to resist on the part of all the hollow-hearted professors of religion whose heathenisms you so unsparingly expose they have a class feeling like others to the young and to those who do not reflect much on what is offered to their belief you will do great good by showing how spiritual food is adulterated the bread from heaven is in the same case as baker's bread 
i feel that one perusal is not enough it is a mine to use your own simile if there is truth in what i heard lord byron say that works of fiction lived only by the amount of truth which they contained your story is sure of long life i know now more than before how to value communion with you with kind regards to your family yours affectionately a t noel byron from this pleasant abiding place mrs stowe writes to her husband don robin castle september fifteenth eighteen fifty six my dear husband everything here is like a fairy story the place is beautiful it is the most perfect combination of architectural and poetic romance with home comfort the people too are charming we have here mr la boucherie a cabinet minister and lady mary his wife i like him very much and her too kingsley's brother a very entertaining man and to-morrow lord ellesmere is expected i wish you could be here for i am sure you would like it life is so quiet and sincere and friendly that you would feel more as if you had come at the hearts of these people than in london the sutherland estate looks like a garden we stopped at the town of frayen four miles before we reached sutherlandshire where a crowd of well-to-do nice-looking people gathered around the carriage and as we drove off gave three cheers this was better than i expected and looks well for their opinion of my views dread is selling over here wonderfully lowe says with all the means at his command he has not been able to meet the demand he sold fifty thousand in two weeks and probably will sell as many more i am showered with letters private and printed in which the only difficulty is to know what the writers would be at i see evidently happiness and prosperity all through the line of this estate i see the duke giving his thought and time and spending the whole income of this estate in improvements upon it i see the duke and duchess evidently beloved wherever they move i see them most amiable most christian most considerate to everybody the writers of the letters admit the goodness of the duke but denounce the system and beg me to observe its effects for myself i do observe that compared to any other part of the highlands sutherland is a garden i observe well-clothed people thriving lands healthy children fine schoolhouses and all that henry was invited to the tenants dinner where he excited much amusement by pledging every toast in fair water as he has done invariably on all occasions since he has been here the duchess last night showed me her copy of dread in which she has marked what most struck or pleased her i begged it and am going to send it to you she said to me this morning at breakfast the queen says that she began dread the very minute she got it and is deeply interested in it she bought a copy of lowell's poems and begged me to mark the best ones for her so if you see him tell him that we have been reading him together she is taking her all in all one of the noblest appointed women i ever saw real old genuine english such as one reads of in history full of nobility courage tenderness and zeal it does me good to hear her read prayers daily as she does in the midst of her servants and guests with a manner full of grand and noble feeling thursday morning september twenty fifth we were obliged to get up at half past five the morning we left dunrobin an effort when one doesn't go to bed till one o'clock we found breakfast laid for us in the library and before we had quite finished the duchess came in our starting off was quite an imposing sight first came the duke's landau in which were mary the duke and myself then a carriage in which were eliza and hattie and finally the carriage which we had hired with henry our baggage and mr jackson the duke's secretary the gardener sent a fresh bouquet for each of us and there was such a leave-taking as if we were old and dear friends we did really love them and had no doubt of their love for us the duke rode with us as far as dornac where he showed us the cathedral beneath which his ancestors are buried and where is a statue of his father similar to one the tenants have erected on top of the highest hill in the neighbourhood we also saw the prison which had but two inmates and the old castle 
here the duke took leave of us and taking our own carriage we crossed the ferry and continued on our way after a very bad night's rest at inverness in consequence of the towns being so full of people attending some highland games that we could have no places at the hotel and after a weary ride in the rain we came into aberdeen friday morning to-morrow we go on to edinburgh where i hope to meet a letter from you the last i heard from lowe he had sold sixty thousand of dread and it was still selling well i have not yet heard from america how it goes the critics scold and whiffle and dispute about it but on the whole it is a success so the times says with much coughing hemming and standing first on one foot and then on the other if the times were sure we should beat in the next election dread would go up in the scale but as long as there is uncertainty it has first one line of praise and then one of blame End quote. henry stowe returned to america in october to enter dartmouth college while the rest of the party pursued their way southward as will be seen by the following letters city of new york october tenth eighteen fifty six dear husband henry will tell you all about our journey and at present i have but little time for details i received your first letter with great joy relief and gratitude first to god for restoring your health and strength and then to you for so good long and refreshing a letter henry i hope comes home with a serious determination to do well and be a comfort seldom has a young man seen what he has in this journey or made more valuable friends since we left aberdeen from which place my last was mailed we have visited edinburgh with abounding delight thence yesterday to newcastle last night attended service in durham cathedral and after that came to york whence we send henry to liverpool i send you letters etc by him one hundred thousand copies of dread sold in four weeks after that who cares what critics say its success in england has been complete so far as sale is concerned it is very bitterly attacked both from a literary and a religious point of view the record is down upon it with a cartload of solemnity the athenium with waspish spite the edinburgh goes out of its way to say that the author knows nothing of the society she describes and yet it goes everywhere is read everywhere and mr lowe says that he puts the hundred and twenty-fifth thousand to press confidently the fact that so many good judges like it better than uncle tom is success enough in my journal to henry which you may look for next week you will learn how i have been very near the queen and formed acquaintance with divers of her lords and ladies and heard all she has said about dread how she prefers it to uncle tom how she inquired for you and other matters till then i am as ever your affectionate wife h b stowe after leaving york mrs stowe and her party spent a day or two at carleton rectory on the edge of sherwood forest in which they enjoyed a most delightful picnic from there they were to travel to london by way of warwick and oxford and of this journey mrs stowe writes as follows to her son henry Quote, the next morning we were induced to send our things to london being assured by mr g that he would dispatch them immediately with some things of his own that were going and that they should certainly await us upon our arrival in one respect it was well for us that we thus rid ourselves of the trouble of looking after them for i never saw such blind confusing arrangements as these english railroads have when we were set down at the place where we were to change for warwick we were informed that probably the train had gone at any rate it could only be found on the other side of the station you might naturally think we had nothing to do but walk across to the other side no indeed we had to ascend a flight of stairs go through a sort of tubular bridge and down another pair of stairs when we got there the guard said the train was just about to start and yet the ticket office was closed we tried the door in vain you must hurry said the guard how can we said i when we can't get tickets he went and thumped and at last roused the dormant intelligence inside we got our tickets ran for dear life got in and then waited ten minutes 
arriving at warwick we had a very charming time and after seeing all there was to see we took cars for oxford the next day we tried to see oxford you can have no idea of it call it a college it is a city of colleges a mountain of museums colleges halls courts parks chapels lecture rooms out of twenty-four colleges we saw only three we saw enough however to show us that to explore the colleges of oxford would take a week then we came away and about eleven o'clock at night found ourselves in london it was dripping and raining here for all the world just as it did when we left but we found a cosy little parlour papered with cheerful crimson paper lighted by a coal fire a neat little supper laid out and the mrs lowe waiting for us wasn't it nice we are expecting our baggage to-night called at samson lowe's store to-day and found it full everywhere of red dreads End quote upon reaching london mrs stowe found the following note from lady byron awaiting her oxford house october fifteenth eighteen fifty six dear mrs stowe the newspapers represent you as returning to london but i cannot wait for the chance slender i fear of seeing you there for i wish to consult you on a point admitting but of little delay feeling that the sufferers in kansas have a claim not only to sympathy but to the expression of it i wish to send them a donation it is however necessary to know what is the best application of money and what the safest channel presuming that you will approve the object i ask you to tell me perhaps you would undertake the transmission of my fifty pounds my present residence two miles beyond richmond is opposite i have watched for instructions of your course with warm interest the sale of your book will go on increasing it is beginning to be understood believe me with kind regards to your daughters your faithful and affectionate a t noel byron to this note the following answer was promptly returned grove terrace kentish town october sixteenth eighteen fifty six dear lady byron how glad i was to see your handwriting once more how more than glad i should be to see you i do long to see you i have so much to say so much to ask and need to be refreshed with a sense of congenial and sympathetic soul thank you my dear friend for your sympathy with our poor sufferers in kansas may god bless you for it by doing this you will step to my side perhaps you may share something of that abuse which they who know not what they do heap upon all who so feel for the right i assure you dear friend i am not insensible to the fiery darts which thus fly around me direct as usual to my publishers and believe me as ever with all my heart affectionately yours h b stowe end of chapter twelve part one Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 12, Part 2 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12, Dread, 1856, Part 2. Having dispatched this note, Mrs. Stowe wrote to her husband concerning their surroundings and plans as follows. Friday, 16th. Confusion in the camp. No baggage come. Nobody knows why. Running to stations, inquiries, messages, and no baggage. Meanwhile, we have not even a clean collar, nothing but very soiled traveling dresses, while Lady Mary de Boucherie writes that her carriage will wait for us at Slaw Station this afternoon, and we must be off at two. What's to be done? Luckily, I did not carry all my dresses to Dunrobin, so I, of all the party, have a dress that can be worn. We go out and buy collars and handkerchiefs, and two o'clock beholds us at the station house stoke park i arrived here alone the baggage not having yet been heard from mr g being found in london confessed that he delayed sending it by the proper train in short mr g is what is called an easy man and one whose easiness makes everybody else uneasy so because he was easy and thought it no great matter and things would turn out well enough without any great care 
we have had all this discomfort i arrived alone at the slaw station and found lady mary's carriage waiting away we drove through the beautiful park full of deer who were so tame as to stand and look at us as we passed the house is in the italian style with a dome on top and wide terraces with stone balustrades around it lady mary met me at the door and seemed quite concerned to learn of our ill fortune we went through a splendid suite of rooms to a drawing-room where a little tea-table was standing after tea lady mary showed me my room it had that delightful home-like air of repose and comfort that succeeds so well in giving to rooms here there was a cheerful fire burning an armchair drawn up beside it a sofa on the other side with a neatly arranged sofa table on which were writing materials one of the little girls had put a pot of pretty greenhouse moss in a silver basket on this table and my toilet cushion was made with a place in the center to hold a little vase of flowers here lady mary left me to rest before dressing for dinner i sat down in an easy chair before the fire and formed hospitable resolutions as to how i would try to make rooms always look home-like and pleasant to tired guests then came the maid to know if i wanted hot water if i wanted anything and by and by it was time for dinner going down into the parlor i met mr la Boucher, and we all went in to dinner it was not quite as large a party as at dunrobin but much in the same way no company but several ladies who were all family connections the following morning lord dufferin and lord alfred paget two gentlemen of the queen's household rode over from windsor to lunch with us they brought news of the goings-on there do you remember one night the duchess of s read us a letter from lady dufferin describing the exploits of her son who went yachting with prince napoleon up by spitzbergen and when prince napoleon and all the rest gave up and went back still persevered and discovered a new island well this was the same man a thin slender person not at all the man you would fancy as a mr greatheart lively cheery and conversational lord alfred is also very pleasant lady mary prevailed on lord dufferin to stay and drive with us after lunch and we went over to clifton the duchess's villa of which we saw the photograph at dunrobin for grace and beauty some of the rooms in this place exceed any i have yet seen in england when we came back my first thought was whether aunt mary and the girls had come just as we were all going up to dress for dinner they appeared meanwhile the queen had sent over from windsor for lady mary and her husband to dine with her that evening and such invitations are understood as commands so although they themselves had invited four or five people to dinner they had to go and leave us to entertain ourselves lady mary was dressed very prettily in a flounced white silk dress with a pattern of roses woven round the bottom of each flounce and looked very elegant mr Labouchere wore breeches with knee and shoe buckles sparkling with diamonds they got home soon after we had left the drawing-room as the queen always retires at eleven no late hours for her the next day lady mary told me that the queen had talked to her all about dread and how she preferred it to uncle tom's cabin how interested she was in nina how provoked when she died and how she was angry that something dreadful did not happen to tom gordon she inquired for papa and the rest of the family all of whom she seemed to be well informed about the next morning we had lord dufferin again to breakfast he is one of the most entertaining young men i have seen in england full of real thought and noble feeling and has a wide range of reading he has read all our american literature and was very flattering in his remarks on hawthorne poe and longfellow i find j r lowell less known however than he deserves to be lord dufferin says that his mother wrote him some verses on his coming of age and that he built a tower for them and inscribed them on a brass plate i recommend the example to you henry make yourself the tower and your memory the brass plate this morning came also to call lady augusta bruce lord elgin's daughter one of the duchess of kent's ladies-in-waiting a very excellent sensible girl who is a strong anti-slavery body after lunch we drove over to eton and went in to see the provost's house 
after this as we were passing by windsor the coachman suddenly stopped and said the queen is coming my lady we stood still and the royal cortege passed i only saw the queen who bowed graciously lady mary stayed at our car door till it left the station and handed in a beautiful bouquet as we parted this is one of the loveliest visits i have made after filling a number of other pleasant engagements in england among which was a visit in the family of charles kingsley mrs stowe and her party crossed the channel and settled down for some months in paris for the express purpose of studying french from the French capital, she writes to her husband in Andover as follows. Paris, November 7th, 1856. My dear husband, on the 28th, when your last was written, I was at Charles Kingsley's. It seemed odd enough to Mary and me to find ourselves, long after dark, alone in a hack, driving towards the house of a man whom we never had seen, nor his wife either. My heart fluttered as, after rumbling a long way through the dark, we turned into a yard. We knocked at a door and were met in the hall by a man who stammers a little in his speech, and whose inquiry, is this Mrs. Stowe, was our first positive introduction. Ushered into a large, pleasant parlor, lighted by a coal fire, which flickered on comfortable chairs, lounges, pictures, statuettes, and bookcases, we took a good view of him. He is tall, slender, with blue eyes, brown hair, and a hale, well-browned face, and somewhat loose-jointed withal. His wife is a real Spanish beauty. How we did talk and go on for three days. I guess he is tired. I'm sure we were. He is a nervous, excitable being, and talks with head, shoulders, arms, and hands, while his hesitance makes it the harder. Of his theology I will say more some other time. He also has been through the great distress, the conflict of ages, but has come out at a different end from Edward, and stands with John Foster, though with more positiveness than he. He laughed a good deal at many stories I told him of father, and seemed delighted to hear about him. But he is, what I did not expect, a zealous churchman, insists that the Church of England is the finest and broadest platform a man can stand on, and that the thirty-nine articles are the only ones he could subscribe to. I told him you thought them the best summary of doctrine you knew, which pleased him greatly. Well, I got your letter tonight in Paris, at number 19, Rue de Cliché, where you may as well direct your future letters. We reached Paris about eleven o'clock last night, and took a carriage for seventeen Rue de Clichy, but when we got there no ringing or pounding could rouse anybody. Finally, in despair, we remembered a card that had been handed into the cars by some hotel runner, and finding it was of an English and French hotel, we drove there and secured very comfortable accommodations. We did not get to bed until after two o'clock. The next morning I sent a messenger to find Madame Borion, and discovered that we had mistaken the number, and should have gone to number 19, which was the next door. So we took a carriage, and soon found ourselves established there, where we have a nice parlor and two bedrooms. There are twenty-one in the family, mostly Americans, like ourselves, come to learn to speak French. One of them is a tall, handsome young English lady, Miss Durand, who is a sculptress studying with Baron de Troquetti. She took me to his studio, and he immediately remarked that she ought to get me to sit. I said I would, only my French lessons. Oh, said he, smiling, we will give you French lessons while you sit. So I go tomorrow morning. As usual, my horrid pictures do me a service, and people seem relieved when they see me. They think me even handsome in a manner. Kingsley, in his relief, expressed as much to his wife, and as beauty has never been one of my strong points, I am open to flattery upon it. We had a most agreeable call from Arthur Helps before we left London. He, Kingsley, and all the good people are full of the deepest anxiety for our American affairs. They really do feel very deeply, seeing the peril so much plainer than we do in America. Sunday night. I fear I have delayed your letter too long. The fact is that of the ten days I have been here, I have been laid up three with severe neuralgia, viz. toothache in the backbone, and since then have sat all day to be modeled for my bust. 
we spent the other evening with baron de triquetti the sculptor he has an english wife and a charming daughter about the age of our girls life in paris is altogether more simple and natural than in england they give you a plate of cake and a cup of tea in the most informal social way the tea-kettle sings at the fire and the son and daughter busy themselves gaily together making and handing tea when the tea was over monsieur de triquetti showed us a manuscript copy of the gospels written by his mother to console herself in a season of great ill health and which he had illustrated all along with exquisite pen drawings resembling the most perfect line engravings i cannot describe the beauty grace delicacy and fullness of devotional feeling in these people he is one of the loveliest men i ever saw we have already three evenings in the week in which we can visit and meet friends if we choose namely at madame Mall's, madame lanzille's and madame belloc's all these salons are informal social gatherings with no fuss of refreshments no nonsense of any kind just the cheeriest heartiest kindest little receptions you ever saw a kiss to dear little charlie if he could see all the things that i see every day in the tuileries and champs elysees he would go wild all paris is a general whirligig out of doors but indoors people seem steady quiet and sober as anybody november thirtieth this is sunday evening and a sunday in paris always puts me in mind of your story about somebody who said bless you they make such a noise that the devil couldn't meditate all the extra work and odd jobs of life are put into sunday your washerwoman comes sunday with her innocent good-humoured face and would be infinitely at a loss to know why she shouldn't your bonnet cloak shoes and everything are sent home sunday morning and all the way to church there is such pirouetting and whirligigging along the boulevards as almost takes one's breath away Today we went to the oratoire to hear monsieur grand pierre i could not understand much my french ear is not quick enough to follow i could only perceive that the subject was la charite and that the speaker was fluent graceful and earnest and the audience serious and attentive last night we were at baron de triquetis again with a party invited to celebrate the birthday of their eldest daughter blanche a lovely girl of nineteen there were some good ladies there who had come eighty leagues to meet me and who were so delighted with my miserable french that it was quite encouraging i believe i am getting over the sandbar at last the conversation is beginning to come easy to me there were three french gentlemen who had just been reading dread in english and who were as excited and full of it as could be and i talked with them to a degree that astonished myself there is a review of dread in the revue des deux mondes which has long extracts from the book and is written in a very appreciative and favourable spirit generally speaking french critics seem to have a finer appreciation of my subtle shades of meaning than english i am curious to hear what professor park has to say about it there has been another review in la presse equally favourable all seem to see the truth about american slavery much plainer than people can who are in it if american ministers and christians could see through their sophistical spider-webs with what wonder pity and contempt they would regard their own vacillating condition we visit once a week at madame mole's where we meet all sorts of agreeable people lady elgin doesn't go into society now having been struck with paralysis but sits at home and receives her friends as usual this notion of sitting always in the open air is one of her peculiarities i must say life in paris is arranged more sensibly than with us visiting involves no trouble in the feeding line people don't go to eat a cup of tea and a plate of biscuit is all just enough to break up the stiffness it is wonderful that the people here do not seem to have got over uncle tom a bit the impression seems fresh as if just published how often have they said that book has revived the gospel among the poor of france it has done more than all the books we have published put together it has gone among the les ouvriers among the poor of faubourg saint antoine and nobody knows how many have been led to christ by it is not this blessed my dear husband is it not worth all the suffering of writing it 
i went the other evening to monsieur grand pierre's where there were three rooms full of people all as eager and loving as ever we met in england or scotland oh if christians in boston could only see the earnestness of feeling with which christians here regard slavery and their surprise and horror at the lukewarmness to say the least of our american church about eleven o'clock we all joined in singing a hymn and then monsieur grand pierre made an address in which i was named in the most affectionate and cordial manner then followed a beautiful prayer for our country for america on which hang so many hopes of protestantism one and all they came up and there was a great shaking of hands and much effusion under date of december twenty eighth mrs perkins writes quote, on sunday we went with mr and mrs jacob abbott to the hotel des invalides and i think i was never more interested and affected three or four thousand old and disabled soldiers have here a beautiful and comfortable home we went to the morning service the church is very large and the colors taken in battle are hung on the walls some of them are so old as to be moth-eaten the service is performed as near as possible in imitation of the service before a battle the drum beats the call to assemble and the common soldiers march up and station themselves in the center of the church under the commander all the services are regulated by the beat of the drum only one priest officiates and soldiers are stationed around to protect him the music is from a brass band and is very magnificent in the afternoon i went to vespers in the madeleine where the music was exquisite they have two fine organs at opposite ends of the church the adeste fidelis was sung by a single voice accompanied by the organ and after every verse it was taken up by male voices and the other organ and repeated the effect was wonderfully fine i have always found in our small churches at home that the organ was too powerful and pained my head but in these large cathedrals the effect is different the volume of sound rolls over full but soft and i feel as though it must come from another sphere in the evening mr and mrs bunsen called he is the son of chevalier bunsen and she a niece of elizabeth fry very intelligent and agreeable people end quote. under date of january twenty fifth mrs stowe writes from paris quote, here's a story for charlie the boys in the faubourg saint antoine are the children of ouvriers and every day their mothers give them two sous to buy a dinner when they heard i was coming to the school of their own accord they subscribed half their dinner money to give to me for the poor slaves this five franc piece i have now i have bought it of the cause for five dollars and am going to make a hole in it and hang it round charlie's neck as a medal i have just completed arrangements for leaving the girls at a protestant boarding school while i go to rome we expect to start the first of february and my direction will be east bartholomew one o eight via margarita end of chapter twelve part two read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 13 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son, Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. Old Scenes Revisited, 1856. En route to Rome. Trials of travel. A midnight arrival and an inhospitable reception. Glories of the Eternal City naples and vesuvius venice holy week in rome return to england letter from harriet martineau on dread a word from mr prescott on dread farewell to lady byron after leaving paris mrs stowe and her sister mrs perkins travelled leisurely through the south of france toward italy stopping at amiens lyon and marseilles at this place they took steamer for genoa leghorn and civita vecchia during their last night on shipboard they met with an accident of which and their subsequent trials in reaching rome mrs stowe writes as follows quote, 
about eleven o'clock as i had just tranquilly laid down in my berth i was roused by a grating crash accompanied by a shock that shook the whole ship and followed by the sound of a general rush on deck trampling scuffling and cries i rushed to the door and saw all the gentlemen hurrying on their clothes and getting confusedly toward the stairway i went back to mary and we put on our things in silence and as soon as we could got into the upper salon it was an hour before we could learn anything certainly except that we had run into another vessel the fate of the arctic came to us both but we did not mention it to each other indeed a quieter more silent company you would not often see had i had any confidence in the administration of the boat it would have been better but as i had not i sat in momentary uncertainty had we then known as we have since the fate of a boat recently sunk in the mediterranean by a similar carelessness it would have increased our fears by a singular chance an officer whose wife and children were lost on board that boat was on board ours and happened to be on the forward part of the boat when the accident occurred the captain and mate were both below there was nobody looking out and had not this officer himself called out to stop the boat we should have struck her with such force as to have sunk us as it was we turned aside and the shock came on a paddle wheel which was broken by it for when after two hours delay we tried to start and had gone a little way there was another crash and the paddle wheel fell down you may be sure we did little sleeping that night it was an inexpressible desolation to think that we might never again see those we loved no one knows how much one thinks and how rapidly in such hours in the naples boat that was sunk a short time ago the women perished in a dreadful way the shock threw the chimney directly across the egress from below so that they could not get on deck and they were all drowned in the cabin we went limping along with one broken limb till the next day about eleven when we reached civita vicia where there were two hours more of delay about passports then we that is mary and i and a dr edison from philadelphia and his son alfred took a carriage to rome but they gave us a miserable thing that looked as if it had been made soon after the deluge about eight o'clock at night on a lonely stretch of road the wheel came off we got out, and our postilions stood silently regarding matters. None of us could speak Italian, they could not speak French, but the driver at last conveyed the idea that for five francs he could get a man to come and mend the wheel. The five francs were promised, and he untacked a horse and rode off. Mary and I walked up and down the dark, desolate road, occasionally reminding each other that we were on classic ground, and laughing at the oddity of our lonely starlight promenade. After a while our driver came back, tag, rag, and bobtail at his heels. I don't think I can do greater justice to Italian costumes than by this respectable form of words." then there was another consultation they put a bit of rotten timber under to pry the carriage up fortunately it did not break as we all expected it would till after the wheel was on then a new train of thought was suggested how was it to be kept on evidently they had not thought far in that direction for they had brought neither hammer nor nail nor tool of any kind and therefore they looked first at the wheel and then at each other and then at us the doctor now produced a little gimlet with the help of which the broken fragments of the former linchpin were pushed out and the way was cleared for a new one then they began knocking a fence to pieces to get out nails but none could be found to fit at last another ambassador was sent back for nails while we were thus waiting the diligence in which many of our ship's company were jogging on to rome came up they had plenty of room inside and one of the party seeing our distress tried hard to make the driver stop but he doggedly persisted in going on and declared if anybody got down to help us he would leave him behind an interesting little episode here occurred it was raining and mary and i proposed as the wheel was now on to take our seats we had no sooner done so than the horses were taken with a sudden fit of animation and ran off with us in the most vivacious manner tag rag and company shouting in the rear some heaps of stone a little in advance presented an interesting prospect by way of a terminus 
however the horses were lucidly captured before the wheel was off again and our ambassador being now returned we were set right and again proceeded i must not forget to remark that at every post where we changed horses and drivers we had a pitched battle with the driver for more money than we had been told was the regular rate and the carriage was surrounded with a perfect mob of ragged shock-headed black-eyed people whose words all ended in you know and who raved and ranted at us till finally we paid them much more than we ought to get rid of them at the gates of rome the official after looking at our passports coolly told the doctor that if he had a mind to pay him five francs he could go in without further disturbance but if not he would keep the baggage till morning this form of statement had the recommendation of such precision and neatness of expression that we paid him forthwith and into rome we dashed at two o'clock in the morning of the ninth of february eighteen fifty seven in a drizzling rain we drove to the Hotel d'Angleterre, it was full, and ditto to four or five others, and in the last effort our refractory wheel came off again, and we all got out into the street. About a dozen lean, ragged corbies, who are called porters, and who are always lying in wait for travellers, pounced upon us. They took down our baggage in a twinkling, and putting it all into the street, surrounded it, and chattered over it while m and i stood in the rain and received first lessons in italian how we did try to say something but we couldn't talk anything but in inno as aforesaid the doctor finally found a man who could speak a word or two of french and leaving mary alfred and me to keep watch over our pile of trunks he went off with him to apply for lodgings i have heard many flowery accounts of first impressions of rome i must say ours was somewhat sombre a young man came by and addressed us in english how cheering we almost flew upon him we begged him at least to lend us his italian to call another carriage and he did so a carriage which was passing was luckily secured and mary and i with all our store of boxes and little parcels were placed in it out of the rain at least here we sat while the doctor from time to time returned from his wanderings to tell us he could find no place can it be said i that we are to be obliged to spend a night in the streets what made it seem more odd was the knowledge that could we only find them we had friends enough in rome who would be glad to entertain us we began to speculate on lodgings who knows what we may get entrapped into alfred suggested stories he had read of beds placed on trap doors of teasters which screwed down on people and smothered them and so when at last the doctor announced lodgings found we followed in rather an uncertain frame of mind we alighted at a dirty stone passage smelling of cats and onions damp cold and earthy we went up stone stairways and at last were ushered into two very decent chambers where we might lay our heads the corbys all followed us black-haired black-browed ragged and clamorous as ever they insisted that we should pay a pretty little sum of twenty francs or four dollars for bringing our trunks about twenty steps the doctor modestly but firmly declined to be thus imposed upon and then ensued a general chatteration one and all fell into attitudes and the innos and isimos rolled freely for pity's sake get them off we said so we made a truce for ten francs but still they clamoured forced their way even into our bedroom and we were only repulsed by a loud and combined volley of no no no's which we all set up at once upon which they retreated our hostess was a little french woman and that reassured us i examined the room and seeing no trace of treacherous teasters or trap-doors resolved to avail myself without fear of the invitation of a very clean white bed where i slept till morning without dreaming the next day we sent our cards to mr bartholomew and before we had finished breakfast he was on the spot we then learned that he had been watching the diligence office for over a week and that he had the pleasant set of apartments we are now occupying all ready and waiting for us march first my dear husband every day is opening to me a new world of wonders here in italy 
i have been to the catacombs where i was shown many memorials of the primitive christians and to-day we are going to the vatican the weather is sunny and beautiful beyond measure and flowers are springing in the fields on every side oh my dear how i do long to have you here to enjoy what you are so much better fitted to appreciate than i this wonderful combination of the past and the present of what has been and what is think of strolling leisurely through the forum of seeing the very stones that were laid in the time of the republic of rambling over the ruined palace of the caesars of walking under the arch of titus of seeing the dying gladiator and whole ranges of rooms filled with wonders of art all in one morning all this i did on saturday and only wanted you you know so much more and could appreciate so much better at the palace of the caesars where the very dust is a melange of exquisite marvels i saw for the first time an acanthus growing and picked my first leaf our little menage moves on prosperously the doctor takes excellent care of us and we of him one sees everybody here at rome john bright mrs hemmins son mrs gaskell etc etc over five thousand english travellers are said to be here jacob abbott and his wife are coming rome is a new world rome is an astonishment papal rome is an enchantress old as she is she is like ninon and close the young fall in love with her you will hear next from us at naples affectionately yours h b s from rome the travellers went to naples and after visiting pompeii and herculaneum made the ascent of vesuvius a graphic account of which is contained in a letter written at this time by mrs stowe to her daughters in paris after describing the preparations and the start she says quote, gradually the ascent became steeper and steeper till at length it was all our horses could do to pull us up the treatment of horses in naples is a thing that takes away much from the pleasure and comfort of such travellers as have the least feeling for animals the people seem absolutely to have no consideration for them you often see vehicles drawn by one horse carrying fourteen or fifteen great stout men and women this is the worst as the streets are paved with flat stones which are exceedingly slippery on going uphill the drivers invariably race their horses urging them on with a constant storm of blows as the ascent of the mountain became steeper the horses panted and trembled in a way that made us feel that we could not sit in the carriage yet the guide and driver never made the slightest motion to leave the box at last three of us got out and walked and invited our guide to do the same yet with all this relief the last part of the ascent was terrible and the rascally fellows actually forced the horses to it by beating them with long poles on the back of their legs no englishman or american would ever allow a horse to be treated so the hermitage is a small cabin where one can buy a little wine or any other refreshment one may need there is a species of wine made of the grapes of vesuvius called lacrima christi that has a great reputation here was a miscellaneous collection of beggars ragged boys men playing guitars bawling donkeys drivers and people wanting to sell sticks or minerals the former to assist in the ascent and the latter as specimens of the place in the midst of the commotion we were placed on our donkeys and the serious pensive brutes moved away at last we reached the top of the mountain and i gladly sprang on firm land the whole top of the mountain was covered with wavering wreaths of smoke from the shadows of which emerged two english gentlemen who congratulated us on our safe arrival and assured us that we were fortunate in our day as the mountain was very active we could hear a hollow roaring sound like the burning of a great furnace but saw nothing is this all i said oh no wait till the guide comes up with the rest of the party and soon one after another came up and we then followed the guide up the cloudy rocky path the noise of the fire constantly becoming nearer finally we stood on the verge of a vast circular pit about forty feet deep the floor of which is of black ropy waves of congealed lava 
the sides are sulphur cliffs stained in every brilliant shade from lightest yellow to deepest orange and brown in the midst of the lava floor rises a black cone the chimney of the great furnace this was burning and flaming like the furnace of a glass-house and every few moments throwing up showers of cinders and melted lava which fell with a rattling sound on the black floor of the pit one small bit of the lava came over and fell at our feet and a gentleman lighted his cigar on it all around where we stood the smoke was issuing from every chance rent and fissure of the rock and the neapolitans who crowded round us were every moment soliciting us to let them cook us an egg in one of these rifts and overcome by persuasion i did so and found it very nicely boiled or rather steamed though the shell tasted of globbers salt and sulphur the whole place recalled to my mind so vividly milton's description of the infernal regions that i could not but believe that he had drawn the imagery from this source milton as we all know was some time in italy and although i do not recollect any account of his visiting vesuvius i cannot think how he should have shaped his language so coincidentally to the phenomena if he had not on the way down the mountain our ladies astonished the natives by making an express stipulation that our donkeys were not to be beaten why they could not conjecture the idea of any feeling of compassion for an animal is so foreign to a neapolitan's thoughts that they supposed it must be some want of courage on our part when once in a while the old habit so prevailed that the boy felt that he must strike the donkey and when i forbade him he would say courage signora courage time would fail me to tell the whole of our adventures in southern italy we left it with regret and i will tell you some time by word of mouth what else we saw we went by water from naples to leghorn and were gloriously seasick all of us from leghorn we went to florence where we abode two weeks nearly two days ago we left florence and started for venice stopping one day and two nights in route at bologna here we saw the great university now used as a library the walls of which are literally covered with the emblazoned names and coats of arms of distinguished men who were educated there venice the great trouble of travelling in europe or indeed of travelling anywhere is that you can never catch romance no sooner are you in any place than being there seems the most natural matter-of-fact occurrence in the world nothing looks foreign or strange to you you take your tea and your dinner eat drink and sleep as aforetime and scarcely realize where you are or what you are seeing but venice is an exception to this state of things it is all romance from beginning to end and never ceases to seem strange and picturesque it was a rainy evening when our cars rumbled over the long railroad bridge across the lagoon that leads to the station nothing but flat dreary swamps and then the wide expanse of sea on either side the cars stopped and the train being a long one left us a little out of the station we got out in a driving rain in company with flocks of austrian soldiers with whom the third-class cars were filled we went through a long passage and emerged into a room where all nations seemed commingling italians germans french austrians orientals all in wet weather trim soon however the news was brought that our baggage was looked at and our gondolas ready the first plunge under the low black hood of a gondola especially of a rainy night has something funereal in it four of us sat cowering together and looked out of the rain dropped little windows at the sides at the scene gondolas of all sizes were gliding up and down with their sharp fishy-looking prows of steel pushing their way silently among each other while gondoliers shouted and jabbered and made as much confusion in their way as terrestrial hackmen on dry land soon however trunks and carpet-bags being adjusted we pushed off and went gliding away up the grand canal with a motion so calm that we could scarce discern it except by the moving of objects on shore venice la belle appeared to as much disadvantage as a beautiful woman bedraggled in a thunderstorm lake como we stayed in venice five days and during that time saw all the sights that could enter the head of a valet de place to afflict us with 
it is an affliction however for which there is no remedy because you want to see the things and would be very sorry if you went home without having done so from venice we went to milan to see the cathedral and leonardo da vinci's last supper the former is superb and of the latter i am convinced from the little that remains of it that it was the greatest picture the world ever saw we shall run back to rome for holy week and then to paris rome from lake como we came back here for holy week and now it is over what do you think of it certainly no thoughtful or sensitive person no person impressible either through the senses or the religious feelings can fail to feel it deeply in the first place the mere fact of the different nations of the earth moving so many of them with one accord and so old and venerable a city to celebrate the death and resurrection of jesus is something in itself affecting whatever dispute there may be about the other commemorative feasts of christendom the time of this epoch is fixed unerringly by the jews passover that great and solemn feast therefore stands as an historical monument to mark the date of the most important and thrilling events which this world ever witnessed when one sees the city filling with strangers pilgrims arriving on foot the very shops decorating themselves in expectancy every church arranging its services the prices even of temporal matters raised by the crowd and its demands he naturally thinks wherefore why is all this and he must be very careless indeed if it does not bring to mind in a more real way than before that at this very time so many years ago christ and his apostles were living actors in the scenes thus celebrated to-day as the spring was now well advanced it was deemed advisable to bring this pleasant journey to a close and for mrs stowe at least it was imperative that she return to america therefore leaving rome with many regrets and lingering backward glances the two sisters hurried to paris where they found their brother-in-law mr john hooker awaiting them under date of may third mrs stowe writes from paris to her husband quote, here i am once more safe in paris after a fatiguing journey i found the girls well and greatly improved in their studies as to bringing them home with me now i have come to the conclusion that it would not be expedient a few months more of study here will do them a world of good i have therefore arranged that they shall come in november in the arago with a party of friends who are going at that time john hooker is here so mary is going with him and some others for a few weeks into switzerland i have some business affairs to settle in england and shall sail from liverpool in the europa on the sixth of june i am so homesick to-day and i long with a great longing to be with you once more i am impatient to go and yet dread the voyage still to reach you i must commit myself once more to the ocean of which at times i have a nervous horror as to the arms of my father the sea is his and he made it it is a rude noisy old servant but it is always obedient to his will and cannot carry me beyond his power and love wherever or to whatever it bears me End quote having established her daughters in a protestant boarding school in paris mrs stowe proceeded to london while there she received the following letter from harriet martineau ambleside june first dear mrs stowe i have been at my wit's end to learn how to reach you as your note bore no direction but london arnold scroppers and others could give no light and the newspapers tell only where you had been so i commit this to your publishers trusting that it will find you somewhere and in time perhaps bring you here can't you come you are aware that we shall never meet if you don't come soon i see no strangers at all but i hope to have breath and strength enough for a little talk with you if you could come you could have perfect freedom at the times when i am laid up and we could seize my capability seasons for a talk the weather and scenery are unusually splendid just now did i see you in a white frock and black silk apron when i was in ohio in eighteen thirty five your sister i knew well and i have a clear recollection of your father i believe and hope you were the young lady in the black silk apron do you know i rather dreaded reading your book 
sick people are weak and one of my chief weaknesses is dislike of novels except some old ones which i almost know by heart i knew that with you i should be safe from the cobweb spinning of our modern subjective novelists and the jaunty vulgarity of our funny philosophers the dickens sort who have tired us out but i dreaded the alternative the too strong interest but oh the delight i have had in dread the genius carries all before it and drowns everything in glorious pleasure so marked a word of genius claims exemption from every sort of comparison but as you ask for my opinion of the book you may like to know that i think it far superior to uncle tom i have no doubt that a multitude of people will say it is a falling off because they made up their minds that any new book of yours must be inferior to that and because it is so rare a thing for a prodigious fame to be sustained by a second book but in my own mind i am entirely convinced that the second book is by far the best such faults as you have are in the artistic department and there is less defect in dread than in uncle tom and the whole material and treatment seem to me richer and more substantial i have had critiques of dread from the two very wisest people i know perfectly unlike each other the critics i mean and they delight me by thinking exactly like each other and like me they distinctly prefer it to uncle tom to say the plain truth it seems to me so splendid a work of genius that nothing that i can say can give you an idea of the intensity of admiration with which i read it it seemed to me as i told my nieces that our english fiction writers had better shut up altogether and have done with it for one will have no patience with any but didactic writing after yours my nieces and you may have heard that maria my nurse is very very clever are thoroughly possessed with the book and maria says she feels as if a fresh department of human life had been opened since this day week i feel the freshness no less while from my travels i can be even more assured of the truthfulness of your wonderful representation i see no limit to the good it may do by suddenly splitting open southern life for everybody to look into it is precisely the thing that is most wanted just as uncle tom was wanted three years since to show what negro slavery in your republic was like it is plantation life particularly in the present case that i mean as for your exposure to the weakness and helplessness of the churches i deeply honor you for the courage with which you have made that exposure but i don't suppose that any amendment is to be looked for in that direction you have unburdened your own soul in the matter and if they had been corrigible you would have helped a good many more but i don't expect that result the southern railing at you will be something unequalled i suppose i hear that three of us have the honor of being abused from day to day already as most portentous and shocking women you mrs chapman and myself as the traveller of twenty years ago not only newspapers but pamphlets of such denunciation are circulated i am told i am afraid now i and even mrs chapman must lose our fame and all the railings will be engrossed by you my little function is to keep english people tolerably right by means of a london daily paper while the danger of misinformation and misreading from the times continues i cannot conceive how such a paper as the times can fail to be better informed than it is at times it seems as if its new york correspondent was making game of it the able and excellent editor of the daily news gives me complete liberty on american subjects and mrs chapman's and other friends constant supply of information enables me to use this liberty for making the cause better understood i hope i shall hear that you are coming it is like a great impertinence my having written so freely about your book but you asked my opinion that is all i can say thank you so much for sending the book to me if you come you will write our names in it and this will make it a valuable legacy to a niece or nephew believe me gratefully and affectionately yours harriet martineau in london mrs stowe also received the following letter from prescott the historian which after long wandering had finally rested quietly at her english publishers awaiting her coming pepperell october fourth eighteen fifty six quote, my dear mrs stowe i am much obliged to you for the copy of dread which mr phillips put into my hands it has furnished us our evening's amusement since we have been in the country where we spend the brilliant month of october 
the african race are much indebted to you for showing up the good sides of their characters their cheerfulness and especially their powers of humor which are admirably set off by their peculiar patios in the same manner as the expression of the scottish sentiment is by the peculiar scottish dialect people differ but i was most struck among your characters with uncle tiff and nina the former a variation of good old uncle tom though conceived in a merrier vein that belonged to that sedate personage the difference of their tempers in this respect being well suited to the difference of the circumstances in which they were placed but nina to my mind is the true hero of the book which i should have named after her instead of dread she is indeed a charming conception full of what is called character and what is masculine in her nature is toned down by such a delightful sweetness and kindness of disposition as makes her perfectly fascinating i cannot forgive you for smothering her so prematurely no dramatis persona could afford the loss of such a character but i will not bore you with criticism of which you have had quite enough i must thank you however for giving tom gordon a gutta percha cane to perform his flagellations with i congratulate you on the brilliant success of the work unexampled even in this age of authorship and as mr phillips informs me greater even in the old country than in ours i am glad you are likely to settle the question and show that a yankee writer can get a copyright in england little thanks to our own government which compels him to go there in order to get it with sincere regard believe me dear mrs stowe very truly yours william h prescott from liverpool on the eve of her departure for america mrs stowe wrote to her daughters in paris quote, i spent the day before leaving london with lady byron she is lovelier than ever and inquired kindly about you both i left london to go to manchester and reaching there found the rev mr gaskell waiting to welcome me in the station mrs gaskell seems lovely at home where besides being a writer she proves herself to be a first-class housekeeper and performs all the duties of a minister's wife after spending a delightful day with her i came here to the beautiful dingle which is more enchanting than ever i am staying with mrs edward cropper lord denman's daughter i want you to tell aunt mary that mr ruskin lives with his father at a place called denmark hill camberwell he has told me that the gallery of turner pictures there is open for me or my friends at any time of the day or night both young and old mr ruskin are fine fellows sociable and hearty and will cordially welcome any of my friends who desire to look at their pictures i write in haste as i must be aboard the ship to-morrow at eight o'clock so good-bye my dear girls from your ever affectionate mother End quote her last letter written before sailing was to lady byron and serves to show how warm an intimacy had sprung up between them it was as follows quote, june fifth eighteen fifty seven dear friend i left you with a strange sort of yearning throbbing feeling you make me feel quite as i did years ago a sort of girlishness quite odd for me i have felt a strange longing to send you something don't smile when you see what it turns out to be i have a weakness for your pretty pariah things it is one of my own home peculiarities to have strong passions for pretty teacups and other little matters for my own quiet meals when as often happens i am too unwell to join the family so i send you a cup made of primroses a funny little pitcher quite large enough for cream and a little vase for violets and primroses which will be lovely together and when you use it think of me and that i love you more than i can say i often think how strange it is that i should know you you who were a sort of legend in my early days that i should love you is only a natural result you seem to me to stand on the confines of that land where the poor formalities which separate hearts here pass like mist before the sun and therefore it is that i feel the language of love must not startle you as strange or unfamiliar you are so nearly there in spirit that i fear with every adieu it may be the last yet did you pass within the veil i should not feel you lost 
i have got past the time when i feel that my heavenly friends are lost by going there i feel them nearer rather than farther off so good-bye dear dear friend and if you see morning and our father's house before i do carry my love to those that wait for me and if i pass first you will find me there and we shall love each other for ever ever yours h b stowe End quote. A homeward voyage proved a prosperous one, and it was followed by a joyous welcome to the cabin in Andover. The world seemed very bright, and amid all her happiness came no intimation of the terrible blow about to descend upon the head of the devoted mother. End of chapter 13 Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana Chapter 14, Part 1 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, The Minister's Wooing, 1857 through 1859. Part 1 Death of Mrs. Stowe's Oldest Son, Letter to the Duchess of Sutherland, letter to her daughters in paris letter to her sister catherine visit to brunswick and oars island writes the minister's wooing and the pearl of oars island mr whittier's comments mr lowell on the minister's wooing letter to mrs stowe from mr lowell john ruskin on the minister's wooing a year of sadness letter to lady byron letter to her daughter departure for europe immediately after mrs stowe's return from england in june 1857 a crushing sorrow came upon her in the death of her eldest son henry ellis who was drowned while bathing in the connecticut river at hanover new hampshire where he was pursuing his studies as a member of the freshman class in dartmouth college this melancholy event took place the ninth of july eighteen fifty seven and the third of august mrs stowe wrote to the duchess of sutherland dear friend before this reaches you you will have perhaps learned from other sources of the sad blow which has fallen upon us our darling our good beautiful boy snatched away in the moment of health and happiness alas could i know that when i parted from my henry on english shores that i should never see him more i returned to my home and amid the jubilee of meeting the rest was fain to be satisfied with only a letter from him saying that his college examinations were coming on and he must defer seeing me a week or two till they were over i thought then of taking his younger brother and going up to visit him but the health of the latter seeming unfavorably affected by the seacoast air I turned back with him to a water-cure establishment. Before I had been two weeks absent, a fatal telegram hurried me home, and when I arrived there it was to find the house filled with his weeping classmates who had just come bringing his remains. There he lay, so calm, so placid, so peaceful, that I could not believe that he would not smile upon me, and that my voice which always had such power over him, could not recall him. There had always been such a peculiar union, such a tenderness between us. I had had such power always to call up answering feelings to my own, that it seemed impossible that he could be silent and unmoved at my grief. But yet, dear friend, I am sensible that in this last sad scene, I had an alleviation that was not granted to you. I recollect in the mournful letter you wrote me about that time, you said that you mourned that you had never told your own dear one how much you loved him. That sentence touched me at the time. I laid it to heart, and from that time lost no occasion of expressing to my children those feelings that we too often defer to express to our dearest friends till it is forever too late. 
he did fully know how i loved him and some of the last loving words he spoke were of me the very day that he was taken from us and when he was just rising from the table of his boarding-house to go whence he never returned some one noticed the seal ring which you may remember to have seen on his finger and said how beautiful that ring is yes he said and best of all it was my mother's gift to me that ring taken from the lifeless hand a few hours later was sent to me singularly enough it is broken right across the name from a fall a little time previous it is a great comfort to me dear friend that i took henry with me to dunrobin i hesitated about keeping him so long from his studies but still i thought a mind so observing and appreciative might learn from such a tour more than through books and so it was he returned from england full of high resolves and manly purposes i may not be what the world calls a christian he wrote but i will live such a life as a christian ought to live such a life as every true man ought to live henceforth he became remarkable for a strict order and energy and a vigilant temperance and care of his bodily health docility and deference to his parents and teachers and perseverance in every duty well from the hard battle of this life he is excused and the will is taken for the deed and whatever comes his heart will not be pierced as mine is but i am glad that i can connect him with all my choicest remembrances of the old world dunrobin will always be dearer to me now and i have felt towards you and the duke a turning of spirit because i remember how kindly you always looked on and spoke to him i knew then it was the angel of your lost one that stirred your hearts with tenderness when you looked on another so near his age the plaid that the duke gave him and which he valued as one of the chief of his boyish treasures will hang in his room for still we have a room that we call his you will understand you will feel this sorrow with us as few can my poor husband is much prostrated i need not say more you know what this must be to a father's heart but still i repeat what i said when i saw you last our dead are ministering angels they teach us to love they fill us with tenderness for all that can suffer these weary hours when sorrow makes us for the time blind and deaf and dumb have their promise these hours come in answer to our prayers for nearness to god it is always our treasure that the lightning strikes i have poured out my heart to you because you can understand while i was visiting in hanover where henry died a poor deaf old slave woman who has still five children in bondage came to comfort me bear up dear soul she said you must bear it for the lord loves ye she said further sunday is a heavy day to me cause i can't work and can't hear preaching and can't read so i can't keep my mind off my poor children some on em the blessed master got and they safe but oh they are five that i don't know where they are what are our mother sorrows to this i shall try to search out and redeem these children though from the ill success of efforts already made i fear it will be hopeless every sorrow i have every lesson on the sacredness of family love makes me the more determined to resist to the last this dreadful evil that makes so many mothers so much deeper mourners than i ever can be affectionately yours h b stowe about this same time she writes to her daughters in paris quote, can anybody tell what sorrows are locked up with our best affections or what pain may be associated with every pleasure as i walk the house the pictures he used to love the presents i brought him and the photographs i meant to show him all pierce my heart 
i have had a dreadful faintness of sorrow come over me at times i have felt so crushed so bleeding so helpless that i could only call on my saviour with groanings that could not be uttered your papa justly said every child that dies is for the time being an only one yes his individuality no time no change can ever replace two days after the funeral your father and i went to hanover we saw henry's friends and his room which was just as it was the day he left it there is not another such room in the college as his said one of his classmates with tears i could not help loving the dear boys as they would come and look sadly in and tell us one thing and another that they remembered of him he was always talking of his home and his sisters said one the very day he died he was so happy because i had returned and he was expecting soon to go home and meet me he died with that dear thought in his heart there was a beautiful lane leading down through the charming glen to the river it had been for years the bathing place of the students and into the pure clear water he plunged little dreaming that he was never to come out alive in the evening we went down to see the boating club of which he was a member he was so happy in this boating club they had a beautiful boat called the una and a uniform and he enjoyed it so much this evening all the different crews were out but henry's had their flag furled and tied with black crepe i felt such love to the dear boys all of them because they loved henry that it did not pain me as it otherwise would they were glad to see us there and i was glad that we could be there yet right above where their boats were gliding in the evening light lay the bend in the river clear still beautiful fringed with overhanging pines from whence one boy went upward to heaven to heaven if earnest manly purpose if sincere deliberate strife with besetting sin is accepted of god as i firmly believe it is our dear boy was but a beginner in the right way had he lived we had hoped to see all wrong gradually fall from his soul as the worn-out calyx drops from the perfected flower but christ has taken him into his own teaching Quote, and one view of jesus as he is will strike all sin forever dead End quote. since i wrote you last we have had anniversary meetings and with all the usual bustle and care our house full of company tuesday we received a beautiful portrait of our dear henry life-size and as perfect almost as life it has just that half roguish half loving expression with which he would look at me sometimes when i would come and brush back his hair and look into his eyes every time i go in or out of the room it seems to give so bright a smile that i almost think that a spirit dwells within it when i am so heavy so weary and go about as if i were wearing an arrow that had pierced my heart i sometimes look up and this smile seems to say mother patience i was happy in our father's house are many mansions sometimes i think that i am like a gardener who has planted the seed of some rare exotic he watches as the two little points of green leaf first spring above the soil he shifts it from soil to soil from pot to pot he watches it waters it saves it through thousands of mischiefs and accidents he counts every leaf and marks the strengthening of the stem till at last the blossom bud was fully formed what curiosity what eagerness what expectation what longing now to see the mystery unfold in the new flower just as the calyx begins to divide and a faint streak of color becomes visible lo in one night the owner of the greenhouse sends and takes it away he does not consult me he gives me no warning he silently takes it and i look but it is no more what then do i suppose he has destroyed the flower far from it i know that he has taken it to his own garden what henry might have been i could guess better than any one 
what henry is is known to jesus only shortly after this time mrs stowe wrote to her sister catherine quote, if ever i was conscious of an attack of the devil trying to separate me from the love of christ it was for some days after the terrible news came i was in a state of great physical weakness most agonizing and unable to control my thoughts distressing doubts as to henry's spiritual state were rudely thrust upon my soul it was as if a voice had said to me you trusted in god did you you believed that he loved you you had perfect confidence that he would never take your child till the work of grace was mature now he has hurried him into eternity without a moment's warning without preparation and where is he I saw at last that these thoughts were irrational, and contradicted the calm, settled belief of my better moments, and that they were dishonorable to God, and that it was my duty to resist them, and to assume and steadily maintain that Jesus in love had taken my dear one to his bosom. Since then the enemy has left me in peace. It is our duty to assume that a thing which would be in its very nature unkind, ungenerous, and unfair, has not been done. What should we think of the crime of that human being who should take a young mind from circumstances where it was progressing in virtue, and throw it recklessly into corrupting and depraving society, particularly if it were the child of one who had trusted and confided in him for years? no no such slander as this shall the devil ever fix in my mind against my lord and my god he who made me capable of such an absorbing unselfish devotion for my children so that i would sacrifice my eternal salvation for them he certainly did not make me capable of more love more disinterestedness than he has himself he invented mother's hearts and he certainly has the pattern in his own and my poor, weak rushlight of love is enough to show me that some things can and some things cannot be done. Mr. Stowe said in his sermon last Sunday that the mysteries of God's ways with us must be swallowed up by the greater mystery of the love of Christ, even as Aaron's rod swallowed up the rods of the magicians. Papa and Mama are here, and we have been reading over the autobiography and correspondence. It is glorious beautiful but more of this anon your affectionate sister hattie andover august twenty fourth eighteen fifty seven dear children since anniversary papa and i have been living at home grandpa and grandma beecher are here also and we have had much comfort in their society tonight the last sad duty is before us the body is to be removed from the receiving tomb in the old south churchyard and laid in the graveyard near by pearson has been at work for a week on a lot that is to be thenceforth ours our just inheritance consecrated by his grave how little he thought wandering there as he often has with us that his mortal form would so soon be resting there yet that was written for him as it was certain then as now, and the hour and place of our death is equally certain, though we know it not. It seems selfish that I should yearn to lie down by his side. But I never knew how much I loved him till now. The one lost piece of silver seems more than all the rest, the one lost sheep dearer than all the fold, and I so long for one word, one look one last embrace and over september first eighteen fifty seven my darling children i must not allow a week to pass without sending a line to you our home never looked lovelier i never saw andover look so beautiful the trees so green the foliage so rich papa and i are just starting to spend a week in brunswick for i am so miserable so weak the least exertion fatigues me, and much of my time I feel a heavy languor, indifferent to everything. I know nothing is so likely to bring me up as the air of the seaside. I have set many flowers around Henry's grave, which are blossoming, pansies, white immortelle, 
white petunia and verbenas papa walks there every day often twice or three times the lot has been rolled and planted with fine grass which is already up and looks green and soft as velvet and the little birds gather about it to-night as i sat there the sky was so beautiful all rosy with the silver moon looking out of it papa said with a deep sigh i am submissive but not reconciled brunswick september sixth eighteen fifty seven my dear girls papa and i have been here for four or five days past we both of us felt so unwell that we thought we would try the sea air and the dear old scenes of brunswick everything here is just as we left it we are staying with mrs upham whose house is as wide cool and hospitable as ever the trees in the yard have grown finely and mrs upham has cultivated flowers so successfully that the house is all surrounded by them everything about the town is the same even to miss giddings old shop which is as disorderly as ever presenting the same medley of tracts sewing silk darning cotton and unimaginable old bonnets which existed there of yore she has been heard to complain that she can't find things as easily as once day before yesterday papa charlie and i went down to harpswell about seven o'clock in the morning the old spruces and firs look lovely as ever and i was delighted as i always used to be with every step of the way old getchell's mill stands as forlorn as ever in its sandy wastes and moor brook creeps on glassy and clear beyond arriving at harpswell a glorious hot day with scarce a breeze to ruffle the water papa and charlie went to fish for cunners who soon proved too cunning for them for they ate every morsel of bait off the hooks so that out of twenty bites they only secured two or three what they did get were fried for our dinner reinforced with a fine clam chowder the evening was one of the most glorious i ever saw a calm sea and round full moon mrs upham and i sat out on the rocks between the mainland and the island until ten o'clock i never did see a more perfect and glorious scene and to add to it there was a splendid northern light dancing like spirits in the sky had it not been for a terrible attack of mosquitoes in our sleeping rooms that kept us up and fighting all night we should have called it a perfect success we went into the sea to bathe twice once the day we came and about eight o'clock in the morning before we went back besides this we have been to middle bay where charlie standing where you all stood before him actually caught a flounder with his own hand whereat he screamed loud enough to scare all the folks on eagle island we have also been to Maquot. We have visited the old pond, and if I mistake not, the relics of your old raft yet float there. At all events, one or two fragments of a raft are there, caught among rushes. I do not realize that one of the busiest and happiest of the train who once played there shall play there no more. Quote, he shall return to his house no more, neither shall his place know him any more. End quote. I think I have felt the healing touch of Jesus of Nazareth on the deep wound in my heart, for I have golden hours of calm when I say, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So sure am I that the most generous love has ordered all, that I can now take pleasure to give this little proof of my unquestioning confidence in resigning one of my dearest comforts to him. I feel very near the spirit land, and the words, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me, are very sweet. Oh, if God would give to you, my dear children, a view of the infinite beauty of eternal love. If he would unite us in himself, then even on earth all tears might be wiped away. Papa has preached twice today, and is preaching again tonight. He told me to be sure to write and send you his love. I hope his health is getting better. Mrs. Upham sends you her best love and hopes you will make her a visit sometime. Goodbye, my darlings. Come soon to your affectionate mother. H.B.S. 
the winter of eighteen fifty seven was passed quietly and uneventfully at andover in november mrs stowe contributed to the atlantic monthly a touching little allegory the morning veil in december eighteen fifty eight the first chapter of the minister's wooing appeared in the same magazine simultaneously with this story was written the pearl of oars island published first as a serial in the independent she dictated a large part of the minister's wooing under a great pressure of mental excitement and it was a relief to her to turn to the quiet story of the coast of maine which she loved so well in february eighteen seventy four mrs stowe received the following words from mr whittier which are very interesting in this connection Quote, when i am in the mood for thinking deeply i read the minister's wooing but the pearl of oars island is my favorite it is the most charming new england idol ever written end of chapter fourteen part one read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 14, Part 2 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, The Minister's Wooing, 1857 through 1859, Part 2. The minister's wooing was received with universal commendation from the first, and called forth the following appreciative words from the pen of Mr. James Russell Lowell. Quote, it has always seemed to us that the anti-slavery element in the two former novels by Mrs. Stowe stood in the way of a full appreciation of her remarkable genius, at least in her own country it was so easy to account for the unexampled popularity of uncle tom by attributing it to a cheap sympathy with sentimental philanthropy as people began to recover from the first enchantment they began also to resent it and to complain that a dose of that insane garrison root which takes the reason prisoner had been palmed upon them without their knowing it and that their ordinary water gruel of fiction thinned with sentiment and thickened with moral had been hocused with the bewildering hashish of abolition we had the advantage of reading that truly extraordinary book for the first time in paris long after the whirl of excitement produced by its publication had subsided in the seclusion of distance and with a judgment unbiased by those political sympathies which it is impossible perhaps unwise to avoid at home we felt then and we believe now that the secret of mrs stowe's power lay in the same genius by which the great successes in creative literature have always been achieved the genius that instinctively goes right to the organic elements of human nature whether under a white skin or a black and which disregards as trivial the conventional and facetious notions which make so large a part both of our thinking and feeling works of imagination written with an aim to the immediate impression are commonly ephemeral like miss martineau's tales and eliot's corn law rhymes but the creative faculty of mrs stowe like that of cervantes in don quixote and of fielding in joseph andrews overpowered the narrow specialty of her design and expanded a local and temporary theme with the cosmopolitan of genius it is a proverb that there is a great deal of human nature in men but it is equally and sadly true that there is amazingly little of it in books fielding is the only english novelist who deals with life in its broadest sense thackeray his disciple and congener and dickens the congener of smollett do not so much treat of life as of the strata of society the one studying nature from the club-room window the other from the reporter's box in the police court it may be that the general obliteration of distinctions of rank in this country which is generally considered a detriment to the novelist will in the end turn to his advantage by compelling him to depend for his effects on the contrasts and collisions of innate character rather than on those shallower traits superinduced by particular social arrangements or by hereditary associations 
shakespeare drew ideal and fielding natural men and women thackeray draws either gentlemen or snobs and dickens either unnatural men or the oddities natural only in the lowest grades of a highly artificial system of society the first two knew human nature of the two latter one knows what is called the world and the other the streets of london is it possible that the very social democracy which here robs the novelist of so much romance so much costume so much antithesis of caste so much in short that is purely external will give him the set-off in making it easier for him to get at that element of universal humanity which neither of the two extremes of an aristocratic system nor the salient and picturesque points of contrast between the two can alone lay open to him we hope to see this problem solved by mrs stowe that kind of romantic interest which scott evolved from the relations of lord and vassal of thief and clansman from the social moray to the moral contrast of roundhead and cavalier of far descended pauper and nouveau riche which cooper found in the clash of savagery with civilization and the shaggy virtue bred on the borderland between the two indian by habit white by tradition mrs stowe seems in her former novels to have sought in a form of society alien to her sympathies and too remote for exact study or for the acquirement of that local truth which is the slow result of unconscious observation there can be no stronger proof of the greatness of her genius of her possessing that conceptive faculty which belongs to the higher order of imagination than the avidity with which uncle tom was read at the south it settled the point that this book was true to human nature even if not minutely so to plantation life if capable of so great a triumph where success must so largely depend on the sympathetic insight of her mere creative power have we not a right to expect something far more in keeping with the requirements of art now that her wonderful eye is to be the mirror of familiar scenes and of a society in which she was bred of which she has seen so many varieties and that too in the country where it is most naive and original it is a great satisfaction to us that in the minister's wooing she has chosen her time and laid her scene amid new england habits and traditions there is no other writer who is so capable of perpetuating for us in a work of art a style of thought and manners which railways and newspapers will soon render as paleozoic as the mastodon or the megalosaurians thus far the story has full justified our hopes the leading characters are all fresh and individual creations mrs kate scudder the notable yankee housewife mary in whom cupid is to try conclusions with calvin james marvin the adventurous boy of the coast in whose heart the wild religion of nature swells till the straight swathings of puritanism are burst dr hopkins the conscientious minister come upon a time when the social prestige of the clergy is waning in whose independence will test the voluntary system of ministerial support simeon brown the man of theological dialectics to whom the utmost perfection of creed is shown to be not inconsistent with the most contradictory imperfection of life all these are characters new to literature and the scene is laid just far enough away in point of time to give proper tone and perspective we think we find in the story so far as it has proceeded the promise of an interest as unhackneyed as it will be intense there is room for the play of all the passions and interests that make up the great tragic comedy of life while all the scenery and accessories will be those which familiarity has made dear to us we are a little afraid of colonel burr to be sure it is so hard to make a historical personage fulfil the conditions demanded by the novel of everyday life he is almost sure either to fall below our traditional conception of him or to rise above the natural and easy level of character into the vague or the melodramatic moreover we do not want a novel of society from mrs stowe she is quite too good to be wasted in that way and her tread is much more firm on the turf of the dooryard or the pasture and the sanded floor of the farmhouse than on the velvet of the salon 
we have no notion how she is to develop her plot but we think we foresee chances for her best power in the struggle which seems foreshadowed between mary's conscientious admiration of the doctor and her half-conscious passion for james before she discovers that one of these conflicting feelings means simply moral liking and approval and the other that she is a woman and that she loves and is not the value of dogmatic theology as a rule of life to be thoroughly tested for the doctor by his slave-trading parishioners is he not to learn the bitter difference between intellectual acceptance of a creed and that true partaking of the sacrament of love and faith and sorrow that makes christ the very life-blood of our being and doing and has not james marvin also his lesson to be taught we foresee him drawn gradually back by mary from his recoil against puritan formalism to a perception of how every creed is pliant and plastic to a beautiful nature and how much charm there may be in an hereditary faith even if it have become almost conventional in the materials of character already present in the story there is scope for mrs stowe's humor pathos clear moral sense and quick eye for the scenery of life we do not believe that there is any one who by birth breeding and natural capacity has had the opportunity to know new england so well as she or who has the peculiar genius so to profit by the knowledge already there have been scenes in the minister's wooing that in their lowness of tone and quiet truth contrast as charmingly with the humid vagueness of the modern school of novel writers as the vicar of wakefield itself and we are greatly mistaken if it do not prove to be the most characteristic of mrs stowe's works and therefore that on which her fame will chiefly rest with posterity End quote the minister's wooing was not completed as a serial till december eighteen fifty nine long before its completion mrs stowe received letters from many interested readers who were as much concerned for the future of her spiritual children as george eliot would call them as if they had been flesh and blood the following letter from mr lowell is given as the most valuable received by mrs stowe at this time cambridge february fourth eighteen fifty nine my dear mrs stowe i certainly did mean to write you about your story but only to cry bravissimo with the rest of the world i intended no kind of criticism deeming it wholly out of place and in the nature of a wet blanket so long as a story is unfinished when i got the first number in mississippi i said to mr phillips that i thought it would be the best thing you had done and what followed has only confirmed my first judgment from long habit and from the tendency of my studies i cannot help looking at things purely from an aesthetic point of view and what i valued in uncle tom was the genius and not the moral that is saying a good deal for i never use the word genius at haphazard and always perhaps too sparingly i am going to be as frank as i ought to be with one whom i value so highly what especially charmed me in the new story was that you had taken your stand on new england ground you are one of the few persons lucky enough to be born with eyes in your head that is with something behind the eyes which makes them of value to most people the seeing apparatus is as useless as the great telescope at the observatory is to me something to stare through with no intelligent result nothing could be better than the conception of your plot so far as i divine it and the painting in of your figures as for theology it is as much a part of daily life in new england as in scotland and all i should have to say about it is this let it crop out where it naturally comes to the surface only don't dig down to it a moral aim is a fine thing but in making a story an artist is a traitor who does not sacrifice everything to art remember the lesson that christ gave us twice over first he preferred the useless mary to the dishwashing martha and next when that exemplary moralist and friend of humanity judas objected to the sinful waste of the magdalene's ointment the great teacher would rather it should be wasted in an act of simple beauty than utilized for the benefit of the poor cleopatra was an artist when she dissolved her biggest pearl to captivate her antony public may i a critic by profession say the whole truth to a woman of genius 
yes and never be forgiven i shall try and try to be forgiven too in the first place pay no regard to the advice of anybody in the second place pay a great deal to mine a kilkenny caddish style of advice not at all my advice is to follow your own instincts to stick to nature and to avoid what people commonly call the ideal for that and beauty and pathos and success all lie in the simply natural we all preach it from wordsworth down and we all from wordsworth down don't practice it don't i feel it every day in this weary editorial mill of mine that there are ten thousand people who can write ideal things for one who can see and feel and reproduce nature and character ten thousand did i say nay ten million what made shakespeare so great nothing but eyes and faith in them the same is true of thackeray i see nowhere more often than in authors the truth that men love their opposites dickens insists on being tragic and makes shipwreck i always thought forgive me that the hebrew parts of dread were a mistake do not think me impertinent i am only honestly anxious that what i consider a very remarkable genius should have faith in itself let your moral take care of itself and remember that an author's writing desk is something infinitely higher than a pulpit what i call care of itself is shown in that noble passage in the february number about the ladder up to heaven that is grand preaching and in the right way i am sure that the minister's wooing is going to be the best of your products hitherto and i am sure of it because you show so thoroughly a mastery of your material so true a perception of realities without which the ideality is impossible as for orthodoxy be at ease whatever is well done the world finds orthodox at last in spite of all the fakir journals whose only notion of orthodoxy seems to be the power of standing in one position till you lose all the use of your limbs if with your heart and brain you are not orthodox in heaven's name who is if you mean calvinistic no woman could ever be such for calvinism is logic and no woman worth the name could ever live by syllogisms woman charms a higher faculty in us than reason god be praised and nothing has delighted me more in your new story than the happy instinct with which you develop this incapacity of the lover's logic in your female characters go on just as you have begun and make it appear in as many ways as you like that whatever creed may be true it is not true and never will be that man can be saved by machinery i can speak with some chance of being right for i confess a strong sympathy with many parts of calvinistic theology and for one thing believe in hell with all my might and in the goodness of god for all that i have not said anything what could i say one might almost as well advise a mother about the child she still bears under her heart and say give it these and those qualities as an author about a work yet in the brain only this will i say and that i am honestly delighted with the minister's wooing that reading it has been one of my few editorial pleasures that no one appreciates your genius more highly than i or hopes more fervently that you will let yourself go without regard to this that or t'other don't read any criticisms on your story believe that you know better than any of us and be sure that everybody likes it that i know there is not and never was anybody so competent to write a true new england poem as yourself and have no doubt that you are doing it the native sod sends up the best inspiration to the brain and you are as sure of immortality as we all are of dying if you only go on with entire faith in yourself faithfully and admiringly yours j r lowell after the book was published in england mr ruskin wrote to mrs stowe Quote, well i have read the book now and i think nothing can be nobler than the noble parts of it mary's great speech to colonel burr for instance nothing wiser than the wise parts of it the author's parenthetical and under breath remarks nothing more delightful than the delightful parts all that virginie says and does nothing more edged than the edged parts candace's sayings and doings to wit 
but i do not like the plan of the whole because the simplicity of the minister seems to diminish the probability of mary's reverence for him i cannot fancy even so good a girl who would not have laughed at him nor can i fancy a man of real intellect reaching such a period of life without understanding his own feelings better or penetrating those of another more quickly then i am provoked at nothing happening to mrs scudder whom i think as entirely unendurable a creature as ever defied poetical justice at the end of a novel meant to irritate people and finally i think you are too disdainful of what ordinary readers seek in a novel under the name of interest that gradually developing wonder expectation and curiosity which makes people who have no self-command sit up till three in the morning to get to the crisis and people who have self-command lay the book down with a resolute sigh and think of it all the next day through till the time comes for taking it up again still i know well that in many respects it was impossible for you to treat this story merely as a work of literary art there must have been many facts which you could not dwell upon and which no one may judge by common rules it is also true as you say once or twice in the course of the book that we have not among us here the peculiar religious earnestness you have mainly to describe we have little earnest formalism and our formalists are for the most part hollow feeble uninteresting mere stumbling blocks we have the simeon brown species indeed and among readers even of this kind the book may do some good and more among the weaker truer people whom it will shake like mattresses making the dust fly and perhaps with it some of the sticks and quill ends which often make that kind of person an objectionable mattress i write too lightly of the book far too lightly but your letter made me gay and i have been light-hearted ever since only i kept this after beginning it because i was ashamed to send it without a line to mrs browning as well i do not understand why you should apprehend or rather anticipate without apprehension any absurd criticism on it it is sure to be a popular book not as uncle tom was for that owed part of its popularity to its dramatic effect the flight on the ice etc which i did not like but as a true picture of human life is always popular nor i should think would any critics venture at all to harp at it the candace and virginie bits appear to me as far as i have yet seen the best i am very glad there is this nice french lady in it the french are at least appreciated in general of all nations by other nations my father says the book is worth its weight in gold and he knows good work End quote when we turn from these criticisms and commendations to the inner history of this period we find that the work was done in deep sadness of heart and the undertone of pathos which forms the dark background of the brightest and most humorous parts of the minister's wooing was the unconscious revelation of one of sorrowful spirit who weary of life would have been glad to lie down with her arms quote, round the wayside cross and sleep away into a brighter scene End quote. just before beginning the writing of the minister's wooing she sent the following letter to lady byron quote, andover june third eighteen fifty eight my dear friend i did long to hear from you at a time when few knew how to speak because i knew that you did know everything that sorrow can teach and whose whole life has been a crucifixion a long ordeal but i believe that the lamb who stands forever in the midst of the throne as it had been slain has everywhere his followers those who are sent into the world as he was to suffer for the redemption of others and like him they must look to the joy set before them of redeeming others i often think that god called you to this beautiful and terrible ministry when he suffered you to link your destiny with one so strangely gifted so fearfully tempted and that the reward which is to meet you when you enter within the veil where you must soon pass will be to see the angel once chained and defiled within him set free from sin and glorified and so know that to you it has been given by your life and love and faith to accomplish this glorious change i think very much on the subject on which you conversed with me once the future state of retribution 
it is evident to me that the spirit of christianity has produced in the human spirit a tenderness of love which wholly revolts from the old doctrine on the subject and i observe the more christ-like any one becomes the more impossible it seems for him to accept it and yet on the contrary it was christ who said fear him that is able to destroy soul and body in hell and the most appalling language on this subject is that of christ himself certain ideas once prevalent certainly must be thrown off an endless infliction for past sins was once the doctrine that we now generally reject the doctrine as now taught is that of an eternal persistence in evil necessitating eternal punishment since evil induces misery by an eternal nature of things and this i fear is inferable from the analogies of nature and confirmed by the whole implication of the bible is there any way of disposing of the current of assertion and the still deeper undercurrent of implication on this subject without one which loosens all faith in revelation and throws us on pure naturalism but of one thing i am sure probation does not end with this life and the number of the redeemed may therefore be infinitely greater than the world's history leads us to suppose End quote. The views expressed in this letter certainly throw light on many passages in the minister's wooing. The following letter, written to her daughter Georgiana, is introduced as revealing the spirit of which much of the minister's wooing was written. Quote, February 12, 1859. My dear Georgie, why haven't I written? Because, dear Georgie, I am like the dry, dead, leafless tree, and have only cold, dead, slumbering buds of hope on the end of stiff, hard, frozen twigs of thought, but no leaves, no blossoms, nothing to send to a little girl who doesn't know what to do with herself any more than a kitten. I am cold, weary, dead everything is a burden to me i let my plants die by inches before my eyes i do not water them and i dread everything i do and i wish it was not to be done and so when i get a letter from my little girl i smile and say dear little puss i will answer it and i sit hour after hour with folded hands looking at the inkstand and dreading to begin the fact is pussy mamma is tired life to you is gay and joyous but to mamma it has been a battle in which the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and she would be glad like the woman in the saint bernard to lie down with her arms around the wayside cross and sleep away into a brighter scene henry's fair sweet face looks down upon me now and then from out a cloud and i feel again all the bitterness of the eternal no which says i must never never in this life see that face lean on that arm hear that voice not that my faith in god in the least fails and that i do not believe that all this is for good i do and though not happy i am blessed weak weary as i am i rest on jesus in the innermost depths of my soul and am quite sure that there is coming an inconceivable hour of beauty and glory where i shall regain jesus and he will give me back my beloved one whom he is educating in a far higher sphere than i proposed so do not mistake me only know that mamma is sitting weary by the wayside feeling weak and worn but in no sense discouraged your affectionate mother h b s so is it ever when with bold step we press our way into the holy place where genius hath wrought we find it to be a place of sorrows art has its gethsemane and its calvary as well as religion our best love books and sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought the summer of eighteen fifty nine found mrs stowe again on her way to europe this time accompanied by all her children except the youngest end of chapter fourteen read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana
Chapter Fifteen of the Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen: The Third Trip to Europe, eighteen fifty nine. Third visit to Europe: Lady Byron on the minister's wooing, some foreign people and things as they appeared to Professor Stowe, a winter in Italy things unseen and unrevealed speculations concerning spiritualism john ruskin mrs browning the return to america letters to dr holmes mrs stowe's third and last trip to europe was undertaken in the summer of eighteen fifty nine in writing to lady byron in may of that year she says quote, i am at present writing something that interests me greatly and may interest you as an attempt to portray the heart and life of new england its religion theology and manners samson lowe and son are issuing it in numbers and i should be glad to know how they strike you it is to publish this work complete that i intend to visit england this summer the story thus referred to was the minister's wooing and lady byron's answer to the above which is appended leaves no room for doubt as to her appreciation of it she writes london may thirty first eighteen fifty nine dear friend i have found particularly as to myself that if i did not answer from the first impulse all had evaporated your letter came by the niagara which brought fanny kemble to learn the loss of her best friend that miss fitzhugh whom you saw at my house i have an intense interest in your new novel more power in these few numbers than in any of your former writings relatively at least to my own mind more power than in adam bed which is the book of the season and well deserves a high place whether mrs scudder will rival mrs poyser we shall see it would amuse you to hear my granddaughter and myself attempting to foresee the future of the love story being quite persuaded for the moment that james is at sea and the minister about to ruin himself we think that she will labor to be in love with the self-devoting man under her mother's influence and from that hyperconscientiousness so common with good girls but we don't wish her to succeed then what is to become of her older lover he time will show i have just missed dale owen with whom i wished to have conversed about the spiritualism harris is lecturing here on religion i do not hear him praised people are looking for helps to believe everywhere but in life in music in architecture in antiquity in ceremony and upon all is written thou shalt not believe at least if this be faith happier the unbeliever i am willing to see through that materialism but if i am to rest there i would rend the veil june first the day of the packet's sailing i shall hope to be visited by you here the best flowers sent me have been placed in your little vases giving life as it were to the remembrance of you though not to pass away like them ever yours a t noel byron the entire family with the exception of the youngest son was abroad at this time the two eldest daughters were in paris having previously sailed from havre in march in company with their cousin miss beecher on their arrival in paris they went directly to the house of their old friend madame borion and soon afterwards entered a protestant school the rest of the family including mrs stowe her husband and the youngest daughter sailed for liverpool early in august at about the same time fred stowe in the company of his friend samuel scoville took passage for the same port in a sailing vessel a comprehensive outline of the earlier portion of this foreign tour is given in the following letter written by professor stowe to the sole member of the family remaining in america castle chillon switzerland september first eighteen fifty nine dear little charlie we are all here except fred and all well we have had a most interesting journey of which i must give a brief account we sailed from new york in the steamer asia on the third of august eighteen fifty nine a very hot day and for ten days it was the hottest weather i ever knew at sea 
we had a splendid ship's company mostly foreigners italians spaniards with a sprinkling of scotch and irish we passed one big iceberg in the night close to and as the iceberg wouldn't turn out for us we turned out for the iceberg and were very glad to come off so this was the night of the ninth of august and after that we had cooler weather and on the morning of the thirteenth the wind blew like all possessed and so continued till afternoon sunday morning the fourteenth we got safe into liverpool landed and went to the adelphi hotel mamma and georgie were only a little sick on the way over and that was the morning of the thirteenth as it was court time the high sheriff of lancashire sir robert gerald a fine stout old grey-haired john bull came thundering up to the hotel at noon in his grand coach with six beautiful horses with outriders and two trumpeters and twelve men with javelins for a guard all dressed in the gayest manner and rushing along like time in the primer the trumpeters toot -to toot tooting like a house afire and how i wished my little charlie had been there to see it monday we wanted to go and see the court so we went over to st george's hall a most magnificent structure that beats the boston state house all hollow and sir robert gerald himself met us and said he would get us a good place so he took us away around the narrow crooked passage and opened a little door where we saw nothing but a great crimson curtain which he told us to put aside and go straight on and where do you think we all found ourselves right on the platform with the judges in their big wigs and long robes and facing the whole crowded court it was enough to frighten a body into fits but we took it quietly as we could and your mamma looked as meek as moses in her little battered straw hat and gray cloak seeming to say i didn't come here on purpose that same night we arrived in london and tuesday august sixteenth riding over the city we called at stratford house and inquired if the duchess of sutherland was there a servant came out and said the duchess was in and would be very glad to see us so your mamma georgie and i went walking up the magnificent staircase in the entrance hall and the great noble brilliant duchess came sailing down the stairs to meet us in her white morning dress for it was only four o'clock in the afternoon and she was not yet dressed for dinner took your mamma into her great bosom and folded her up till the little yankee woman looked like a small gray kitten half covered in a snowbank and kissed and kissed her and then she took up little georgie and kissed her and then she shook my hand and didn't kiss me next day we went to the duchess's villa near windsor castle and had a grand time riding around the park sailing on the thames and eating the very best dinner that was ever set on a table we stayed in london till the twenty fifth of august and then went to paris and found h and e and h b all well and happy and on the thirtieth of august we all went to geneva together and to-day the first of september we all took a sail up the beautiful lake leman here in the midst of the alps close by the old castle of chalon about which lord byron has written a poem in a day or two we shall go to Chamonix, and then georgie and i will go back to paris and london and so home at the appointed time until then i remain as ever your loving father c e stowe mrs stowe accompanied her husband and daughter to england where after travelling and visiting for two weeks she bade them good-bye and returned to her daughters in switzerland from lausanne she writes under date of october ninth my dear husband here we are at lausanne in the hotel gibbon occupying the very parlor that the ruskins had when we were here before the day i left you i progressed prosperously in paris reached there about one o'clock at night could get no carriage and finally had to turn in at a little hotel close by the station where i slept till morning i could not but think what if anything should happen to me there nobody knew me or where i was but the bed was clean the room respectable so i locked my door and slept then took a carriage in the morning and found madame bourdon at breakfast i write to-night that you may get a letter from me at the earliest possible date after your return instead of coming to geneva in one day i stopped over one night at macon got to geneva the next day about four o'clock and to lausanne at eight 
coming upstairs and opening the door i found the whole party seated with their books and embroidery about a centre table and looking as homelike and cosy as possible you may imagine the greetings the kissing laughing and good times generally End quote. From Lausanne, the merry party traveled toward Florence by easy stages, stopping at Lake Como, Milan, Verona, Venice, Genoa, and Leghorn. At Florence, where they arrived early in November, they met Fred Stowe and his friend Samuel Scoville, and here they were also joined by their Brooklyn friends, the Howards. Thus it was a large and thoroughly congenial party that settled down in the old Italian city to spend the winter. From here, Mrs. Stowe wrote weekly letters to her husband in Andover, and among them are the following, that not only throw light upon their mode of life, but illustrate a marked tendency of her mind. Florence, Christmas Day, 1859 My dear husband, I wish you all a Merry Christmas, hoping to spend the next one with you. For us, we are expecting to spend this evening with quite a circle of American friends. With Scoville and Fred came L. Bacon, son of Dr. Bacon, a Mr. Porter, who is to study theology at Andover, and is now making a tour of Europe, Mr. Clark, formerly minister at Cornwall, Mr. Jenkins of Lowell, Mr. and Mrs. Howard, John and Annie Howard, who came in most unexpectedly upon us last night, so we shall have quite a new england party and shall sing milius's christmas hymn in great force hope you will all do the same in the old stone cabin our parlor is all trimmed with laurel and myrtle looking like a great bower and our mantel and table are redolent with bouquets of orange blossoms and pinks january sixteenth eighteen sixty my dear husband your letter received to-day has raised quite a weight from my mind for it shows that at last you have received all mine and that thus the chain of communication between us is unbroken what you said about your spiritual experiences in feeling the presence of dear henry with you and above all the vibration of that mysterious guitar was very pleasant to me since i have been in florence i have been distressed by inexpressible yearnings after him such sighings and outreachings with a sense of utter darkness and separation not only from him but from all spiritual communion with my god but i have become acquainted with a friend through whom i receive consoling impressions of these things a mrs e of boston a very pious accomplished and interesting woman who has had a history much like yours in relation to spiritual manifestations without doubt she is what the spiritualists would regard as a very powerful medium but being a very earnest christian and afraid of getting led astray she has kept carefully aloof from all circles and things of that nature she came and opened her mind to me in the first place to ask my advice as to what she had better do relating experiences very similar to many of yours my advice was substantially to try the spirits whether they were of god to keep close to the bible and prayer and then accept whatever came but i have found that when i am with her i receive very strong impressions from the spiritual world so that i feel often sustained and comforted as if i had been near to my henry and other departed friends this has been at times so strong as greatly to soothe and support me i told her your experiences in which she was greatly interested she said it was so rare to hear of christian and reliable people with such peculiarities i cannot however think that henry strikes the guitar that must be eliza her spirit has ever seemed to cling to that mode of manifestation and if you would keep it in your sleeping-room no doubt you would hear from it oftener i have been reading lately a curious work from an old german in paris who has been making experiments in spirit writing he purports to describe a series of meetings held in the presence of fifty witnesses whose names he gives in which writing has come on paper without the apparition of hands or any pen or pencil from various historical people he seems a devout believer in inspiration and the book is curious for its mixture of all the phenomena pagan and christian going over hindu chinese greek and italian literature for examples and then bringing similar ones from the bible 
one thing i am convinced of that spiritualism is a reaction from the intense materialism of the present age luther when he recognized a personal devil was much nearer right we ought to enter fully at least into the spiritualism of the bible circles and spiritual jugglery i regard as the lying signs and wonders with all deceivableness and unrighteousness but there is a real scriptural spiritualism which has fallen into disuse and must be revived and there are doubtless people who from some constitutional formation can more readily receive the impressions of the surrounding spiritual world such were upon apostles prophets and workers of miracles sunday evening today i went down to sit with mrs e in her quiet parlor we read in revelation together and talked of the saints and spirits of the just made perfect till it seems as it always does when with her as if henry were close to me then a curious thing happened she had a little florentine guitar which hangs in her parlor quite out of reach she and i were talking and her sister a very matter-of-fact practical body who attends to temporals for her was arranging a little lunch for us when suddenly the bass string of the guitar was struck loudly and distinctly who struck that guitar said the sister we both looked up and saw that no body or thing was on that side of the room after the sister had gone out mrs e said now that is strange i asked last night that if any spirit was present with us after you came to-day that it would try to touch that guitar a little while after her husband came in and as we were talking we were all stopped by a peculiar sound as if somebody had drawn a hand across all the strings at once we marvelled and i remembered the guitar at home what think you have you had any more manifestations any truths from the spirit world End quote about the end of february the pleasant florentine circle broke up and mrs stowe and her party journeyed to rome where they remained until the middle of april we next find them in naples starting on a six days trip to castellamare sorrento salerno paestum and amalfi then up vesuvius and to the blue grotto of capri and afterwards back to rome by diligence leaving rome on may ninth they travelled leisurely toward paris which they reached on the twenty seventh from there mrs stowe wrote to her husband on may twenty eighth since my last letter a great change has taken place in our plans in consequence of which our passage for america is engaged by the europa which sails the sixteenth of june so if all goes well we are due in boston four weeks from this date i long for home for my husband and children for my room my yard and gardens for the beautiful trees of andover we will make a very happy home and our children will help us affectionately yours hattie this extended and pleasant tour was ended with an equally pleasant homeward voyage for on the europa were found nathaniel hawthorne and james t fields who proved most delightful travelling companions while mrs stowe fully enjoyed her foreign experiences she was so thoroughly american in every fibre of her being that she was always thankful to return to her own land and people she could not therefore in any degree reciprocate the views of mr ruskin on this subject as expressed in the following letter received soon after her return to andover geneva june eighteenth eighteen sixty dear mrs stowe it takes a great deal when i am at geneva to make me wish myself anywhere else and of all places else in london nevertheless i very heartily wish at this moment that i were looking out on the northwood hills and were expecting you and children to breakfast to-morrow i had very serious thoughts when i received your note of running home but i expected that very day an american friend mr s who i thought would miss me more here than you would in london so i stayed what a dreadful thing it is that people should have to go to america again after coming to europe it seems to me an inversion of the order of nature i think america is a sort of united states of probation out of which all wise people being once delivered and having obtained entrance into this better world should never be expected to return sentence immediately ungrammatical particularly when they have been making themselves cruelly pleasant to friends here 
my friend norton whom i met first on this very blue lake water had no business to go back to boston again any more than you i was waiting for s at the railroad station on thursday and thinking of you naturally enough it seemed so short a while since we were there together i managed to get hold of georgie as she was crossing the rails and packed her in opposite my mother and beside me and was thinking myself so clever when you sent that rascally courier for her i never forgave him any of his behavior after his imperativeness on that occasion and so she is getting nice and strong ask her please when you write with my love whether when she stands now behind the great stick one can see much of her on each side so have you been seeing the pope and all his easter performances i congratulate you for i suppose it is something like positively the last appearance on any stage what was the use of thinking about him you should have had your own thoughts about what was to come after him i don't mean that roman catholicism will die out so quickly it will last pretty nearly as long as protestantism which keeps it up but i wonder what is to come next that is the main question just now for everybody so you are coming round to venice after all we shall all have to come to it depend upon it one way or another there never has been anything in any other part of the world like venetian strength well developed i have no heart to write about anything in europe to you now when are you coming back again please send me a line as soon as you get safe over to say you were all wrong but not lost in the atlantic i don't know if you will ever get this letter but i hope you think it worth while to glance again at the denmark hill pictures so i send this to my father who i hope will be able to give it you i really am very sorry at your going you and yours and that is absolute fact i shall not enjoy my swiss journey at all so much as i might it was a shame of you not to give me warning before i could have stopped at paris so easily for you all good be with you remember me devotedly to the young ladies and believe me ever affectionately yours j ruskin in rome mrs stowe had formed a warm friendship with the brownings with whom she afterwards maintained a correspondence the following letter from mrs browning was written a year after their first meeting rome one twenty six via felice fourteen march eighteen sixty one my dear mrs stowe let me say one word first your letter which would have given me pleasure if i had been in the midst of pleasures came to me when little beside could have pleased dear friend let me say it i had had a great blow and loss in england and you wrote things in that letter which seemed meant for me meant to do me good and which did me good the first good any letter or any talk did me and it struck me as strange as more than a coincidence that your first word since we parted in rome last spring should come to me in rome and bear so directly on an experience which you did not know of i thank you so much the earnest stanzas i sent to england for one who wanted them even more than i i don't know how people can keep up their prejudices against spiritualism with tears in their eyes how they are not at least thrown on the wish it might be true and the investigation of the phenomena by that abrupt shutting in their faces of the door of death which shuts them out from the sight of their beloved my tendency is to beat up against it like a crying child not that this emotional impulse is the best for turning the key and obtaining safe conclusions no i did not write before because i always do shrink from touching my own griefs one feels at first so sore that nothing but stillness is born it is only after when one is better that one can express oneself at all this is so with me at least though perhaps it ought not to be so with a poet if you saw my de profundis you must understand that it was written nearly twenty years ago and referred to what went before mr howard's affliction made me think of ms in reference to a sermon of dr beecher's in the independent and i pulled it out of a secret place and sent it to america not thinking that the publication would fall in so nearly with a new grief of mine as to lead to misconceptions in fact the poem would have to be an exaggeration in that case and unsuitable in other respects it refers to the greatest affliction of my life the only time when i felt despair written a year after or more forgive all these reticences my husband calls me peculiar in some things peculiarly lush perhaps 
i can't articulate some names or speak of certain afflictions no not to him not after all these years it's a sort of dumbness of the soul blessed are those who can speak i say but don't you see from this how i must want spiritualism above most persons now let me be ashamed of this egotism together with the rest of the weakness obtruded on you here when i should rather have congratulated you my dear friend on the great crisis you are passing through in america if the north is found noble enough to stand fast on the moral question whatever the loss or diminution of territory god and just men will see you greater and more glorious as a nation i had much anxiety for you after the seward and adams speeches but the danger seems averted by that fine madness of the south which seems judicial the tariff movement we should regret deeply and do some of us only i am told it was wanted in order to persuade those who were less accessible to moral judgment it's eking out the holy water with ditch water if the devil flees before it even so let us be content how you must feel you who have done so much to set this accursed slavery in the glare of the world convicting it of hideousness they should raise a statue to you in america and elsewhere meanwhile i am reading you in the independent sent to me from mr tilton with the greatest interest your new novel the pearl of oars island opens beautifully do write to me and tell me of yourself and the subjects which interest us both it seems to me that our roman affairs may linger a little while the papacy bleeds slowly to death in its finances on account of this violent clerical opposition in france otherwise we were prepared for the fall of the house any morning prince napoleon's speech represents with whatever slight discrepancy the inner mind of the emperor it occupied seventeen columns of the moniteur and was magnificent victor emmanuel wrote to thank him for it in the name of italy and even the english papers praised it as masterly exposition of the policy of france it is settled that we shall wait for venice we will not be for long hungary is only waiting and even in the ashes of poland there are flickering sparks it is the beginning of the restitution of all things here in rome there are fewer english than usual and more empty houses there is a new story every morning and nobody to cut off the head of the scheherazade yesterday the pope was going to venice directly and the day before fixed the hour for victor emmanuel's coming and the day before that brought a letter from cavour to antonelli about sweeping the streets clean for the feet of the king the poor romans live on these stories while the holy father and the king of naples meet holding one another's hands and cannot speak for sobs the little queen however is a heroine in her way and from her point of view and when she drives about in a common fiacre looking very pretty under her only crown left of golden hair one must feel sorry that she was not born and married nearer to holy ground my husband prays you to remember him and i ask your daughters to remember both of us our boy rides his pony and studies under his abbe and keeps a pair of red cheeks thank god i ought to send you more about the society in rome but i have lived much alone this winter and have little to tell you dr manning and dr de have stay away not bearing perhaps to see the pope in his agony your ever affectionate friend elizabeth b browning soon after her return to america mrs stowe began a correspondence with dr oliver wendell holmes which opened the way for the warm friendship that has stood the test of years of this correspondence the two following letters written about this time are of attention andover september ninth eighteen sixty dear dr holmes i have had an impulse upon me for a long time to write you a line of recognition and sympathy in response to those that reached me monthly in your late story in the atlantic elsie venner i know not what others may think of it since i have seen nobody since my return but to me it is of deeper and broader interest than anything you have done yet and i feel an intense curiosity concerning that underworld of thought from which like bubbles your incidents and remarks often seem to burst up 
the foundations of moral responsibility the interlacing laws of nature and spirit and their relations to us here and hereafter are topics which i ponder more and more and on which only one medically educated can write well i think a course of medical study ought to be required of all ministers how i should like to talk with you upon the strange list of topics suggested in the schoolmaster's letter they are bound to agitate the public mind more and more and it is of the chiefest importance to learn if we can to think soundly and wisely of them nobody can be a sound theologian who has not had his mind drawn to think with reverential fear on these topics allow me to hint that the monthly numbers are not long enough get us along a little faster you must work this well out elaborate and give us all the particulars old sophie is a jewel give us more of her i have seen her could you ever come out and spend a day with us the professor and i would so like to have a talk on some of these matters with you very truly yours h b stowe andover february eighteenth eighteen sixty one dear doctor i was quite indignant to hear yesterday of the very unjust and stupid attack upon you in the blank mr stowe has written to them a remonstrance which i hope they will allow to appear as he wrote it and over his name he was well acquainted with your father and feels the impropriety of the thing but my dear friend in being shocked surprised or displeased personally with such things we must consider other people's natures a man or woman may wound us to the quick without knowing it or meaning to do so simply through the difference of fibre as cowper hath somewhere happily said oh why are farmers made so coarse or clergy made so fine a kick that scarce might move a horse might kill a sound divine when once people get ticketed and it is known that one is a hammer another a saw and so on if we happen to get a taste of their quality we cannot help being hurt to be sure but we shall not take it ill of them there be pious well-intended beetles wedges hammers saws and all other kinds of implements good except where they come in the way of our fingers and from a beetle you can have only a beetle's gospel i have suffered in my day from this sort of handling which is worse for us women who must never answer and once when i wrote to lady byron feeling just as you do about some very stupid and unkind things that had invaded my personality she answered me quote, words do not kill my dear or i should have been dead long ago End quote there is much true religion and kindness in the world after all and as a general thing he who has struck a nerve would be very sorry for it if he only knew what he had done i would say nothing if i were you there is eternal virtue in silence i must express my pleasure with the closing chapters of elsie they are nobly and beautifully done and quite come up to what i wanted to complete my idea of her character i am quite satisfied with it now it is an artistic creation original and beautiful believe me to be your true friend h b stowe end of chapter fifteen read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter Sixteen, Part One of the Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: The Civil War, eighteen sixty through eighteen sixty five. The outbreak of civil war. Mrs. Stowe's son enlists. Thanksgiving Day in Washington. The Proclamation of Emancipation, Rejoicings in Boston, Fred Stowe at Gettysburg, Leaving Andover and Settling in Hartford, A Reply to the Women of England, Letters from John Bright, Archbishop Waddeley, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Immediately after Mrs. Stowe's return from Europe, it became only too evident that the nation was rapidly and inevitably drifting into all the horrors of civil war. To use her own words, quote, 
it was god's will that this nation the north as well as the south should deeply and terribly suffer for the sin of consenting to and encouraging the great oppressions of the south that the ill-gotten wealth which had arisen from striking hands with oppression and robbery should be paid back in the taxes of war that the blood of the poor slave that had cried so many years from the ground in vain should be answered by the blood of the sons of the best hearthstones through all the free states that the slave mothers whose tears nobody regarded should have with them a great company of weepers north and south rachels weeping for their children and refusing to be comforted that the free states who refused to listen when they were told of lingering starvation cold privation and barbarous cruelty as perpetuated on the slave should have lingering starvation cold hunger and cruelty doing its work among their own sons at the hands of these slave masters with whose sins our nation had connived mrs stowe spoke from personal experience having seen her own son go forth in the ranks of those who first responded to the president's call for volunteers he was one of the first to place his name on the muster roll of company a of the first massachusetts volunteers while his regiment was still at the camp in cambridge mrs stowe was called to brooklyn on important business from which place she writes to her husband under the date june eleventh eighteen sixty one Quote, yesterday noon henry ward beecher came in saying that the commonwealth with the first massachusetts regiment on board had just sailed by immediately i was of course eager to get to jersey city to see fred sister eunice said that she would go with me and in a few minutes she hattie sam scoville and i were in a carriage driving toward the fulton ferry upon reaching jersey city we found that the boys were dining in the depot an immense building with many tracks and platforms it has a great cast-iron gallery just under the roof apparently placed there with the prophetic instinct of these times there was a crowd of people pressing against the grated doors which were locked but through which we could see the soldiers it was with great difficulty that we were at last permitted to go inside and that object seemed to be greatly aided by a bit of printed satin that some man gave mr scoville when we were in a vast array of gray caps and blue overcoats was presented the boys were eating drinking smoking talking singing and laughing company a was reported to be here there and everywhere at last s spied fred in the distance and went leaping across the tracks towards him immediately afterwards a blue overcoated figure bristling with knapsack and haversack and looking like an assortment of packages came rushing towards us fred was overjoyed you may be sure and my first impulse was to wipe his face with my handkerchief before i kissed him he was in high spirits in spite of the weight of blue overcoat knapsack etc etc that he would formerly have declared intolerable for half an hour i gave him my handkerchief and eunice gave him hers with the sheer motherly instinct that is so strong within her and then we filled his haversack with oranges we stayed with fred about two hours during which time the gallery was filled with people cheering and waving their handkerchiefs every now and then the band played in spiriting airs in which the soldiers joined with hearty voices while some of the companies sang others were drilled and all seemed to be having a general jollification the meal that had been provided was plentiful and consisted of coffee lemonade sandwiches etc on our way out we were introduced to the rev mr cudworth chaplain of the regiment he is a fine-looking man with black eyes and hair set off by a white havelock he wore a sword and fred touching it asked is this for use or ornament sir let me see you in danger answered the chaplain and you'll find out i said to him i supposed he had had many and one confided to his kind offices but i could not forbear adding one more to the number he answered you may rest assured mrs stowe i will do all in my power we parted from fred at the door he said he felt lonesome enough saturday evening on the common in boston where everybody was taking leave of somebody and he seemed to be the only one without a friend but that this interview made up for it all i also saw young henry like fred he is mysteriously changed and wears an expression of gravity and care 
so our boys come to manhood in a day now i am watching anxiously for the evening paper to tell me that the regiment has reached washington in safety End quote. in november eighteen sixty two mrs stowe was invited to visit washington to be present at a great thanksgiving dinner provided for the thousands of fugitive slaves who had flocked into the city she accepted the invitation the more gladly because her son's regiment was encamped near the city and she should once more see him he was now lieutenant stowe having honestly won his promotion by bravery on more than one hard-fought field she writes of this visit quote, imagine a quiet little parlor with a bright coal fire and the gaslight burning above the centre table about which hattie fred and i are seated fred is as happy as happy can be to be with mother and sister once more all day yesterday we spent in getting him first we had to procure a permit to go to camp then we went to the fort where the colonel is and then to another where the brigadier general is stationed i was so afraid that they would not let him come to us and was never happier than when at last he sprang into the carriage free to go with us for forty-eight hours oh he exclaimed in a sort of rapture this pays for a year and a half of fighting and hard work we tried hard to get the five o'clock train out to laurel where jay's regiment is stationed as we wanted to spend sunday all together but could not catch it and so had to content ourselves with what we could have i have managed to secure a room for fred next to ours and feel as though i had my boy at home once more he is looking very well has grown in thickness and is as loving and affectionate as a boy can be i have just been writing a pathetic appeal to the brigadier-general to let him stay with us a week i have also written to general buckingham in regard to changing him from the infantry in which there seems to be no prospect of anything but garrison duty to the cavalry which is full of constant activity general b called on us last evening he seemed to think the prospect before us was at best of a long war he was the officer deputed to carry the order to general mcclellan relieving him of command of the army he carried it to him in his tent about twelve o'clock at night burnside was there mcclellan said it was very unexpected but immediately turned over the command i said i thought he ought to have expected it after having so disregarded the president's order general b smiled and said he supposed mcclellan had done that so often before that he had no idea any notice would be taken of it this time now as i am very tired i must close and remain as always lovingly yours hattie during the darkest and most bitter period of the civil war mrs stowe penned the following letter to the duchess of argyle andover july thirty first eighteen sixty three my dear friend your lovely generous letter was a real comfort to me and reminded me that a year and alas a whole year had passed since i wrote to your dear mother of whom i think so often as one of god's noblest creatures and one whom it comforts me to think is still in our world so many good and noble have passed away whose friendship was such a pride such a comfort to me your noble father lady byron mrs browning their spirits are as perfect as ever passed to the world of light i grieve about your dear mother's eyes i have thought about you all many a sad long quiet hour as i have lain on my bed and looked at the pictures on my wall one in particular of the moment before the crucifixion which is the first thing i look at when i wake in the morning i think how suffering is and must be the portion of noble spirits and no lot so brilliant that must not first or last dip into the shadow of that eclipse prince albert too the ideal knight the prince arthur of our times the good wise the steady head and heart we that is our world we anglo-saxons need so much and the queen yes i have thought of and prayed for her too but could a woman hope to have always such a heart and yet ever be weaned from earth all this and heaven too under my picture i have inscribed quote, for as much as christ also hath suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves with the same mind End quote. this year has been one long sigh one smothered sob to me 
and i thank god that we have as yet one or two generous friends in england who understand and feel for our cause the utter failure of christian anti-slavery england of those instincts of a right heart which always can see where the cause of liberty lies has been as bitter a grief to me as was the similar prostration of all our american religious people in the day of the fugitive slave law exeter hall is a humbug a pious humbug like the rest lord shaftesbury well let him go he is a tory and has after all the instincts of his class but i saw your duke's speech to his tenants that was grand if he can see these things they are to be seen and why can't exeter hall see them it is simply the want of the honest heart why do the horrible barbarities of southern soldiers cause no comment why is the sympathy of the british parliament reserved for the poor women of new orleans deprived of their elegant amusement of throwing vitriol into soldiers faces and practising indecencies inconceivable in any other state of society why is all expression of sympathy on the southern side there is a class of women in new orleans whom butler protects from horrible barbarites that up to his day have been practised on them by these so-called new orleans ladies but british sympathy has ceased to notice them you see i am bitter i am you wonder at my brother he is a man and feels a thousand times more than i can and deeper than all he has ever expressed the spirit of these things you must not wonder therefore remember it is the moment when every nerve is vital it is our agony we tread the wine-press alone and they whose cheap rhetoric has been for years pushing us into it now desert en masse i thank my god i always loved and trusted most those who do now stand true your family your duke yourself your noble mother i have lost lady byron her great heart, her eloquent letters would have been such a joy to me. And Mrs. Browning, oh, such a heroic woman. None of her poems can express what she was, so grand, so comprehending, so strong, with such inspired insight. She stood by Italy through its crisis. Her heart was with all good through the world. Your prophecy that we shall come out better, truer, stronger will i am confident be true and it was worthy of yourself and your good lineage slavery will be sent out by this agony we are only in the throes and ravings of the exorcism the roots of the cancer have gone everywhere but they must die will already the confiscation bill is its natural destruction lincoln has been too slow he should have done it sooner and with an impulse but come it must come it will your mother will live to see slavery abolished unless england forms an alliance to hold it up england is the great reliance of the slave power to-day and next to england the faltering weakness of the north which palters and dare not fire the great broadside for fear of hitting friends these things must be done and sudden sharp remedies are mercy just now we are in a dark hour but whether god be with us or not i know he is with the slave and with his redemption will come the solution of our question i have long known what and who we had to deal with in this for when i wrote uncle tom's cabin i had letters addressed to me showing a state of society perfectly inconceivable that they violate graves make drinking cups of skulls that ladies wear cameos cut from bones and treasure scalps is no surprise to me if i had written what i knew of the obscenity brutality and cruelty of that society down there society would have cast out the books and it is for their interest the interest of the whole race in the south that we should succeed i wish them no ill feel no bitterness they have had a dahomian education which makes them savage we don't expect any more of them but if slavery is destroyed one generation of education and liberty will efface these stains they will come to themselves these states and be glad it is over i am using up my paper to little purpose please give my best love to your dear mother i am going to write to her 
if i only could have written the things i have often thought i am going to put on her bracelet with the other dates that of the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia remember me to the duke and to your dear children my husband desires his best regards my daughters also i am lovingly ever yours h b stowe later in the year we again hear from her son in the army and this time the news comes in a chaplain's letter from the terrible field of gettysburg he writes gettysburg pennsylvania saturday july eleventh nine thirty p m mrs h b stowe dear madam among the thousands of wounded and dying men on this war-scarred field i have just met with your son captain stowe if you have not already heard from him it may cheer your heart to know that he is in the hands of good kind friends he was struck by a fragment of a shell which entered his right ear he is quiet and cheerful longs to see some members of his family and is above all anxious that they should hear from him as soon as possible i assured him i would write at once and though i am wearied by a week's labor here among scenes of terrible suffering i know that to a mother's anxious heart even a hasty scrawl about her boy will be more than welcome may god bless and sustain you in this troubled time yours with sincere sympathy j m crowell the wound in the head was not fatal and after weary months of intense suffering it imperfectly healed but the cruel iron had too nearly touched the brain of the young officer and never again was he what he had been soon after the war his mother bought a plantation in florida largely in the hope that the out-of-door life connected with its management might be beneficial to her afflicted son he remained on it for several years and then being possessed with the idea that a long sea voyage would do him more good than anything else sailed from new york to san francisco around the horn that he reached the latter city in safety is known but that is all no word from him or concerning him has ever reached the loving hearts that have waited so anxiously for it and of his ultimate fate nothing is known meantime the year eighteen sixty three was proving eventful in many other ways to mrs stowe in the first place the long and pleasant andover connection of professor stowe was about to be severed and the family were to remove to hartford connecticut they were to occupy a house that mrs stowe was building on the bank of park river it was erected in a grove of oaks that had in her girlhood been one of mrs stowe's favorite resorts here with her friend georgiana may she had passed many happy hours and had often declared that if she were ever able to build a house it should stand in that very place here then it was built in eighteen sixty three and as the location was at that time beyond the city limits it formed with its extensive beautiful groves a particularly charming place of residence beautiful as it was however it was occupied by the family for only a few years the needs of the growing city caused factories to spring up in the neighborhood and to escape their encroachments the stoves in eighteen seventy three bought and moved into the house on forest street that has ever since been their northern home thus the only house mrs stowe ever planned and built for herself has been appropriated to the use of factory lands and is now a tenement occupied by several families another important event of eighteen sixty three was the publishing of that charming story of italy agnes of sorrento which had been begun nearly four years before this story suggested itself to mrs stowe while she was abroad during the winter of eighteen fifty nine through sixty the origin of the story is as follows one evening at a hotel in florence it was proposed that the various members of a party should write short stories and read them for the amusement of the company mrs stowe took part in the literary contest and the result was the first rough sketch of agnes of sorrento from this beginning was afterwards elaborated agnes of sorrento with a dedication to annie howard who was one of the party not the least important event of the year to mrs stowe and the world at large through her instrumentality was the publication in the atlantic monthly of her reply to the address of the women of england the reply is substantially as follows january eighteen sixty three a reply to the affectionate and christian address of many thousands of women of great britain and ireland to their sisters the women of the united states of america 
signed by anna maria bedford duchess of bedford olivia cecilia cowley countess cowley constance grosvenor countess grosvenor harriet sutherland duchess of sutherland elizabeth argyle duchess of argyle elizabeth fortescue countess fortescue emily shaftesbury countess of shaftesbury mary ruthven baroness ruthven m a millman wife of dean of st paul r buxton daughter of sir thomas fowell buxton carolina amelia owen wife of professor owen mrs charles wyndham c a hatherton baroness hatherton elizabeth ducey countess dowager of ducey cecilia park wife of baron park mary ann chally wife of the lord mayor of london e gordon duchess dowager of gordon anna m l melville daughter of earl of leven and melville georgiana embrington lady embrington a hill viscountess hill mrs gobat wife of bishop gobat of jerusalem e palmerston viscountess palmerston and others sisters more than eight years ago you sent to us in america a document with the above heading it is as follows quote, a common origin a common faith and we sincerely believe a common cause urge us at the present moment to address you on the subject of that system of negro slavery which still prevails so extensively and even under kindly disposed masters with such frightful results in many of the vast regions of the western world we will not dwell on the ordinary topics on the progress of civilization on the advance of freedom everywhere on the rights and requirements of the nineteenth century but we appeal to you very seriously to reflect and to ask counsel of god how far such a state of things is in accordance with his holy word the inalienable rights of immortal souls and the pure and merciful spirit of the christian religion we do not shut our eyes to the difficulties nay the dangers that might beset the immediate abolition of that long-established system we see and admit the necessity of preparation for so great an event but in speaking of indispensable preliminaries we cannot be silent on those laws of your country which in direct contravention of god's own law instituted in the time of man's innocency deny in effect to the slave the sanctity of marriage with all its joys rights and obligations which separate at the will of the master the wife from the husband and the children from the parents nor can we be silent on that awful system which either by statute or by custom interdicts to any race of men or any portion of the human family education in the truths of the gospel and the ordinances of christianity a remedy applied to these two evils alone would commence the amelioration of their sad condition we appeal to you then as sisters as wives and as mothers to raise your voices to your fellow citizens and your prayers to god for the removal of this affliction and disgrace from the christian world we do not say these things in a spirit of self-complacency as though our nation were free from the guilt it perceives in others we acknowledge with grief and shame our heavy share in this great sin we acknowledge that our forefathers introduced nay compelled the adoption of slavery in those mighty colonies we humbly confess it before almighty god and it is because we so deeply feel and unfeignedly avow our own complicity that we now venture to implore your aid to wipe away our common crime and our common dishonor End quote. End of chapter sixteen part one Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 16, Part 2 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16, The Civil War, 1860 through 1865 part two 
this address splendidly illuminated on vellum was sent to our shores at the head of twenty-six folio volumes containing considerably more than half a million of signatures of british women it was forwarded to me with a letter from a british nobleman now occupying one of the highest official positions in england with a request on behalf of these ladies that it should be in any possible way presented to the attention of my countrywomen this memorial as it now stands in its solid oaken case with its heavy folios each bearing on its back the imprint of the american eagle forms a most unique library a singular monument of an international expression of a moral idea no right-thinking person can find aught to be objected against the substance or form of this memorial it is temperate just and kindly and on the high ground of christian equality where it places itself may be regarded as a perfectly proper expression of sentiment as between blood relations and equals in two different nations the signatures to this appeal are not the least remarkable part of it for beginning at the very steps of the throne they go down to the names of women in the very humblest conditions in life and represent all that great britain possesses not only of highest and wisest but of plain homely common sense and good feeling names of wives of cabinet ministers appear on the same page with the names of wives of humble laborers names of duchesses and countesses of wives of generals ambassadors savants and men of letters mingled with names traced with trembling characters by hands evidently unused to hold the pen and stiffened by lowly toil nay so deep and expensive was the feeling that british subjects in foreign lands had their representation among the signatures are those of foreign residents from paris to jerusalem autographs so diverse and collected from sources so various have seldom been found in juxtaposition they remain at this day a silent witness of a most singular tide of feeling which at that time swept over the british community and made for itself an expression even at the risk of offending the sensibilities of an equal and powerful nation no reply to that address in any such tangible and monumental form has ever been possible it was impossible to canvass our vast territories with the zealous and indefatigable industry with which england was canvassed for signatures in america those possessed of the spirit which led to this efficient action had no leisure for it all their time and energies were already absorbed in direct efforts to remove the great evil concerning which the minds of their english sisters had been newly aroused and their only answer was the silent continuance of these efforts from the slave-holding states however as was to be expected came a flood of indignant recrimination and rebuke no one act perhaps ever produced more fanatic irritation or called out more unsparing abuse it came with the whole united weight of the british aristocracy and commonality on the most diseased and sensitive part of our national life and it stimulated that fierce excitement which was working before and has worked since till it has broken out into open war the time has come however when such an astonishing page has been turned in the anti-slavery history of america that the women of our country feeling that the great anti-slavery work to which their english sisters exhorted them is almost done may properly and naturally feel moved to reply to their appeal and lay before them the history of what has occurred since the receipt of their affectionate and christian address your address reached us just as a great moral conflict was coming to its intensest point the agitation kept up by the anti-slavery portion of america by england and by the general sentiment of humanity in europe had made the situation of the slaveholding aristocracy intolerable as one of them at the time expressed it they felt themselves under the ban of the civilized world two courses only were open to them to abandon slave institutions the sources of their wealth and political power or to assert them with such an overwhelming national force as to compel the respect and assent of mankind they chose the latter 
to this end they determined to seize on and control all the resources of the federal government and to spread their institutions through the new states and territories until the balance of power should fall into their hands and they should be able to force slavery into all the free states a leading southern senator boasted that he would yet call the roll of his slaves on bunker hill and for a while the political successes of the slave power were such as to suggest to new england that this was no impossible event they repealed the missouri compromise which had hitherto stood like the chinese wall between the northwest territories and the eruptions of slaveholding barbarians then came the struggle between freedom and slavery in the new territory the battle for kansas and nebraska fought with fire and sword and blood where a race of men of whom john brown was the immortal type acted over again the courage the perseverance and the military religious ardor of the old covenanters of scotland and like them redeemed the ark of liberty at the price of their own blood and blood dearer than their own the time of the presidential canvasses which elected mr lincoln was the crisis of this great battle the conflict had become narrowed down to the one point of the extension of slave territory if the slaveholders could get states enough they could control and rule if they were outnumbered by free states their institutions by the very law of their nature would die of suffocation therefore fugitive slave law district of columbia interstate slave trade and what not were all thrown out of sight for a grand rally on this vital point a president was elected pledged to opposition to this one thing alone a man known to be in favor of the fugitive slave law and other so-called compromises of the constitution but honest and faithful in his determination on this one subject that this was indeed the vital point was shown by the result the moment lincoln's election was ascertained the slaveholders resolved to destroy the union they could no longer control they met and organized a confederacy which they openly declared to be the first republic founded on the right and determination of the white man to enslave the black man and spreading their banners declared themselves to the christian world of the nineteenth century as a nation organized with the full purpose and intent of perpetuating slavery but in the course of the struggle that followed it became important for the new confederation to secure the assistance of foreign powers and infinite pains were then taken to blind and bewilder the mind of england as to the real issues of the conflict in america it has been often and earnestly asserted that slavery had nothing to do with this conflict that it was a mere struggle for power that the only object was to restore the union as it was with all its abuses it is to be admitted that expressions have proceeded from the national administration which naturally gave rise to misapprehension and therefore we beg to speak to you on this subject more fully at first the declaration of the confederate states themselves is proof enough that whatever may be declared on the other side the maintenance of slavery is regarded by them as the vital object of their movement we ask your attention under this head to the declaration of their vice president stevens in that remarkable speech delivered on the twenty first of march eighteen sixty one at savannah georgia wherein he declares the object and purpose of the new confederacy it is one of the most extraordinary papers which our century has produced i quote from the verbatim report in the savannah republican of the address as delivered in the athenaeum of that city on which occasion says the newspapers from which i copy quote, mr stevens took his seat amid a burst of enthusiasm and applause such as the athenaeum has never had displayed within its walls within the recollection of the oldest inhabitant End quote last not least the new constitution has put at rest for ever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution african slavery as it exists among us the proper status quo of the negro in our form of civilization this was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution jefferson in his forecast had anticipated this as the quote, rock upon which the old union would split end quote he was right what was a conjecture with him is now a realized fact 
but whether he fully comprehended the great truth upon which that rock stood and stands may be doubted the prevailing ideas entertained by him and most of the leading statesmen at the time of the formation of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the african was in violation of the laws of nature that it was wrong in principle socially morally and politically in the meantime during the past year the republican administration with all the unwanted care of organizing an army and navy and conducting military operations on an immense scale have proceeded to demonstrate the feasibility of overthrowing slavery by purely constitutional measures to this end they have instituted a series of movements which have made this year more fruitful in anti-slavery triumphs than any other since the emancipation of the british west indies the district of columbia as belonging strictly to the national government and to no separate state has furnished a fruitful subject of remonstrance from british christians with america we have abolished slavery there and thus wiped out the only blot of territorial responsibility on our escutcheon by another act equally grand in principle and far more important in its results slavery is forever excluded from the territories of the united states by another act america has consummated the long-delayed treaty with great britain for the suppression of the slave trade in ports whence slave vessels formerly sailed with the connivance of the port officers the administration has placed men who stand up to their duty and for the first time in our history the slave trader is convicted and hung as a pirate this abominable secret traffic has been wholly demolished by the energy of the federal government lastly and more significant still the united states government has in its highest official capacity taken distinct anti-slavery ground and presented to the country a plan of peaceable emancipation with suitable compensation this noble-spirited and generous offer has been urged on the slaveholding states by the chief executive with earnestness and sincerity but this is but half the story of the anti-slavery triumphs of this year we have shown you what has been done for freedom by the simple use of the ordinary constitutional forces of the union we are now to show you what has been done to the same end by the constitutional war power of the nation by this power it has been this year decreed that every slave of a rebel who reaches the lines of our army becomes a free man that all slaves found deserted by their masters become free men that every slave employed in any service for the united states thereby obtains his liberty and that every slave employed against the united states in any capacity obtains his liberty and lest the army should contain officers disposed to remand slaves to their masters the power of judging and delivering up slaves is denied to army officers and all such acts are made penal by this act the fugitive slave law is for all present purposes practically repealed with this understanding and provision wherever our armies march they carry liberty with them for be it remembered that our army is almost entirely a volunteer one and that the most zealous and ardent volunteers are those who have been for years fighting with tongue and pen the abolition battle so marked is the character of our soldiers in this respect that they are now familiarly designated in the official military dispatches of the confederate states as the abolitionists conceive the results when an army so empowered by national law marches through a slave territory one regiment alone has to our certain knowledge liberated two thousand slaves during the past year and this regiment is but one out of hundreds lastly the great decisive measure of the war has appeared the president's proclamation of emancipation this also has been much misunderstood and misrepresented in england it has been said to mean virtually this be loyal and you shall keep your slaves rebel and they shall be free but let us remember what we have just seen of the purpose and meaning of the union to which the rebellious states are invited back it is to a union which has abolished slavery in the district of columbia and interdicted slavery in the territories which vigorously represses the slave trade and hangs the convicted slaver as a pirate 
which necessitates emancipation by denying expansion to slavery and facilitates it by the offer of compensation any slaveholding states which should return to such a union might fairly be supposed to return with the purpose of peaceable emancipation the president's proclamation simply means this come in and emancipate peaceably with compensation stay out and i emancipate nor will i protect you from the consequences will our sisters in england feel no heartbeat at that event is it not one of the predicted voices of the latter day saying under the whole heavens quote, it is done the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ End quote. and now sisters of england in this solemn expectant hour let us speak to you of one thing which fills our hearts with pain and solicitude it is an unaccountable fact and one which we entreat you seriously to ponder that the party which has brought the cause of freedom thus far on its way during the past eventful year has found little or no support in england sadder than this the party which makes slavery the chief cornerstone of its edifice finds in england its strongest defenders the voices that have spoken for us who contend for liberty have been few and scattering god forbid that we should forget those few noble voices so sadly exceptional in the general outcry against us they are alas too few to be easily forgotten false statements have blinded the minds of your community and turned the most generous sentiments of the british heart against us the north are fighting for supremacy and the south for independence has been the voice independence for what to do what to prove the doctrine that all men are not equal to establish the doctrine that the white man enslaved the negro in the beginning of our struggle the voices that reached us across the water said if we were only sure you were fighting for the abolition of slavery we should not dare to say whither our sympathy for your cause might not carry us such as we heard were the words of the honored and religious nobleman who drafted this very letter which you signed and sent us and to which we are now replying when these words reached us we said quote, we can wait our friends in england will soon see whither this conflict is tending end quote. a year and a half have passed step after step have been taken for liberty chain after chain has fallen till the march of our armies is choked and clogged by the glad flocking of emancipated slaves the day of final emancipation is set the border states begin to move in voluntary consent universal freedom from all dawns like the sun in the distant horizon and still no voice from england no voice yes we have heard on the high seas the voice of a war steamer built for a man stealing confederacy with english gold in an english dockyard going out of an english harbor manned by english sailors with the full knowledge of english government officers in defiance of the queen's proclamation of neutrality so far has english sympathy overflowed we have heard of other steamers ironclad designed to furnish to the slavery defending confederacy their only lack a navy for the high seas we have heard that the british evangelical alliance refuses to express sympathy with the liberating party when requested to do so by the french evangelical alliance we find in english religious newspapers all those sad decrees in the downward sliding scale of defending and apologizing for slaveholders and slaveholding with which we have so many years contended in our own country we find the president's proclamation of emancipation spoken of in those papers only as an incitement to servile insurrection nay more we find in your papers from thoughtful men the admission of the rapid decline of anti-slavery sentiments in england this very day the writer of this has been present at a solemn religious festival in the national capital given at the home of a portion of those fugitive slaves who have fled to our lines for protection who under the shadow of our flag find sympathy and succor the national day of thanksgiving was there kept by over a thousand redeemed slaves and for whom christian charity had spread an ample repast 
our sisters we wish you could have witnessed the scene we wish you could have heard the prayer of a blind old negro called among his fellows john the baptist when in touching broken english he poured forth his thanksgivings we wish you could have heard the sound of that strange rhythmical chant which is now forbidden to be sung on southern plantations the psalm of this modern exodus which combines the barbaric fire of the marseillais with the religious fervor of the old hebrew prophet oh go down moses way down into egypt's land tell king pharaoh to let my people go stand away there stand away there and let my people go as we were leaving an aged woman came and lifted her hands in blessing blessed be the lord that brought me to see this first happy day of my life blessed be the lord in all england is there no amen we have been shocked and saddened by the question asked in an association of congregational ministers in england the very blood relations of the liberty-loving puritans why does not the north let the south go what give up the point of emancipation for these four million slaves turn our backs on them and leave them to their fate what leave our white brothers to run a career of oppression and robbery that as sure as there is a god that ruleth in the armies of heaven will bring down a day of wrath and doom remember that wishing success to this slavery establishing effort is only wishing to the sons and daughters of the south all the curses that god has written against oppression mark our words if we succeed the children of these very men who are now fighting us will rise up to call us blessed just as surely as there is a god who governs in the world so surely all the laws of national prosperity follow in the train of equity and if we succeed we shall have delivered the children's children of our misguided brethren from the wages of sin which is always and everywhere death and now sisters of england think it not strange if we bring back the words of your letter not in bitterness but in deepest sadness and lay them down at your door we say to you sisters you have spoken well we have heard you we have heeded we have striven in the cause even unto death we have sealed our devotion by desolate hearth and darkened homestead by the blood of our sons husbands and brothers in many of our dwellings the very light of our lives has gone out and yet we accept the lifelong darkness as our own part in this great and awful expiation by which the bonds of wickedness shall be loosed and abiding peace established on the foundation of righteousness sisters what have you done and what do you mean to do we appeal to you as sisters as wives and as mothers to raise your voices to your fellow citizens and your prayers to god for the removal of this affliction and disgrace from the christian world in behalf of many thousands of american women harriet beecher stowe washington november twenty seventh eighteen sixty two the publication of this reply elicited the following interesting letter from john bright Rochdale, March ninth, eighteen sixty three. Dear Mrs. Stowe, I received your kind note with real pleasure and felt it very good of you to send me a copy of the Atlantic Monthly with your noble letter to the women of England. I read every word of it with an intense interest, and I am quite sure that its effect upon opinion here has been marked and beneficial it has covered some with shame and it has compelled many to think and it has stimulated not a few to act before this reaches you you will have seen what large and earnest meetings have been held in all our towns in favor of abolition and the north no town has a building large enough to contain those who come to listen to applaud and to vote in favor of freedom and the union the effect of this is evident on our newspapers and on the tone of parliament where now nobody says a word in favor of recognition or mediation or any such thing the need and duty of england is admitted to be a strict neutrality but the feeling of the millions of her people is one of friendliness to the united states and its government 
it would cause universal rejoicing among all but a limited circle of aristocracy and commercially rich and corrupt to hear that the northern forces had taken vicksburg on the great river and charleston on the atlantic and that the neck of the conspiracy was utterly broken i hope your people may have strength and virtue to win the great cause entrusted to them but it is fearful to contemplate the amount of the depravity in the north engendered by the long power of slavery new england is far ahead of the states as a whole too instructed and too moral but still i will hope that she will bear the nation through this appalling danger i well remember the evening at rome and our conversation you lamented the election of buchanan you judged him with a more unfriendly but a more correct eye than mine he turned out more incapable and less honest than i hoped for and i think i was right in saying that your party was not then sufficiently consolidated to enable it to maintain its policy in the execution even had fremo been elected as it is now six years later the north but falteringly supports the policy of the government though impelled by the force of events which then you did not dream of president lincoln has lived half his troubled reign in the coming half i hope he may see land surely slavery will be so broken up that nothing can restore and renew it and slavery once fairly gone i know not how all your states can long be kept asunder believe me very sincerely yours john bright it also called forth from archbishop wadley the following letter palace dublin january eighteen sixty three dear madam in acknowledging your letter and pamphlet i take the opportunity of laying before you what i collect to be the prevailing sentiments here on american affairs of course there is a great variety of opinion as may be expected in a country like ours some few sympathies with the northerners and some few with the southerners but far the greater portion sympathize with neither completely but lament that each party should be making so much greater an expenditure of life and property than can be compensated for by any advantage they can dream of obtaining those who are the least favorable to the northerns are not so from any approbation of slavery but from not understanding that the war is waged in the cause of abolition it was waged they say ostensibly for the restoration of the union and in attestation of this they refer to the proclamation which announced the confiscation of slaves that were the property of secessionists while those who adhered to the federal cause should be exempt from such confiscation which they say did not savor much of zeal for abolition and if the other object the restoration of the union could be accomplished which they all regard as hopeless they do not understand how it will tend to the abolition of slavery on the contrary if say they the separation had been allowed to take place peaceably the northerns might as we do have proclaimed freedom to every slave who set foot on their territory which would have been a great check to slavery and especially to any cruel treatment of slaves many who have a great dislike to slavery yet hold that the southerners had at least as much right to secede as the americans had originally the revolt from great britain and there are many who think that considering the dreadful distress we have suffered from the cotton famine we have shown great forbearance in withstanding the temptation of recognizing the southern states and to break the blockade then again there are some who are provoked by the incessant railing at england and threats of an invasion of canada which are poured forth in some of the american papers there are many also who consider that the present state of things cannot continue much longer if the confederates continue to hold their own as they have done hitherto and that a people who shall have maintained their independence for two or three years will be recognized by the principal european powers such appears to have been the procedure of the european powers in all similar cases such as the revolt of the anglo-american and spanish-american colonies of the haitians and the belgians in these and other cases the rule practically adopted seems to have been to recognize the revolters not at once but after a reasonable time had been allowed to see whether they could maintain their independence and this without being understood to have produced any decision either way as to the justice of the cause 
moreover there are many who say that the negroes and people of color are far from being kindly or justly treated in the northern states an emancipated slave at any rate has not received good training for earning his bread by the wages of labor and if in addition to this and his being treated as an outcast he is excluded as it is said from many employments by the refusal of white laborers to work along with him he will have gained little by taking refuge in the northern states i have now laid before you the views which i conceive to be the most prevalent among us and for which I am not myself responsible. For the safe and effectual emancipation of slaves, I myself consider that there is no plan so good as the gradual one which was long ago suggested by Bishop Hines. What he recommended was an ad valorem tax upon slaves, the value to be fixed by the owner, with an option to government to purchase at that price thus the slaves would be a burden to the master and those the most so who should be the most valuable as being the most intelligent and steady and therefore the best qualified for freedom and it would be his interest to train his slaves to be free laborers and to emancipate them one by one as speedily as he could with safety i fear however that the time has gone by for trying this experiment in america with best wishes for the new year, believe me, your faithful Reverend Waddily. Among the many letters written from this side of the Atlantic regarding the reply, one was from Nathaniel Hawthorne, in which he says, quote, I read with great pleasure your article in the last Atlantic. If anything could make John Bull blush, I should think it might be that. But he is a hardened and villainous hypocrite i always felt that he cared nothing for or against slavery except as it gave him a vantage ground on which to parade his own virtue and sneer at our iniquity with best regards from mrs hawthorne and myself to yourself and family sincerely yours nathaniel hawthorne end of chapter sixteen read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 17, Part 1 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17, Florida, 1865 through 1869, Part 1. Letter to Duchess of Argyle. Mrs. Stowe desires to have a home at the South florida the best field for doing good she buys a place at mandarin a charming winter residence palmetto leaves easter sunday at mandarin correspondence with dr holmes poganok people receptions in new orleans and tallahassee last winter at mandarin in 1866, the terrible conflict between the North and South having ended, Mrs. Stowe wrote the following letter to the Duchess of Argyle. Hartford, February 19th, 1866. My dear friend, your letter was a real spring of comfort to me, bringing refreshingly the pleasant library at Inverary and the lovely days I spent there. I am grieved at what you say of your dear mother's health i showed your letter to mrs perkins and we both agreed in saying that we should like for a time to fill the place of maid to her as doubtless you all feel too i should so love to be with her to read to her to talk to her and oh there is so much that would cheer and comfort a noble heart like hers that we could talk about oh my friend when i think of what has been done these last few years and of what is now doing i am lost in amazement I have, just by way of realizing it to myself, been reading Uncle Tom's Cabin again, and when I read that book, 
scarred and seared and burned into with the memories of an anguish and horror that can never be forgotten and think it is all over now all past and that now the questions debated are simply of more or less time before granting legal suffrage to those who so lately were held only as articles of merchandise when this comes over me i think no private or individual sorrow can ever make me wholly without comfort if my faith in god's presence and real living power in the affairs of men ever grows dim this makes it impossible to doubt i have just had a sweet and lovely christian letter from garrison whose beautiful composure and thankfulness in his hour of victory are as remarkable as his wonderful courage in the day of moral battle his note ends with the words and who but god is to be glorified garrison's attitude is far more exalted than that of wendell phillips he acknowledges the great deed done he suspends his liberator with words of devout thanksgiving and devotes himself unobtrusively to the work yet to be accomplished for the freedmen while phillips seems resolved to ignore the mighty work that has been done because of the inevitable shortcomings and imperfections that beset it still we have a congress of splendid men men of stalwart principle and determination we have a president andrew johnson honestly seeking to do right and if he fails in knowing just what right is it is because he is a man born and reared in a slave state and acted on by many influences which we cannot rightly estimate unless we were in his place my brother henry has talked with him earnestly and confidentially and has faith in him as an earnest good man seeking to do right henry takes the ground that it is unwise and impolitic to endeavor to force negro suffrage on the south at the point of the bayonet his policy would be to hold over the negro the protection of our freedman's bureau until the great laws of free labor shall begin to draw the master and servant together to endeavor to soothe and conciliate and win to act with us a party composed of the really good men at the south for this reason he has always advocated lenity of measures toward them he wants to get them into a state in which the moral influence of the north can act upon them beneficially and to get such a state of things that there will be a party at the south to protect the negro charles sumner is looking simply at the abstract right of the thing henry looks at actual possibilities we all know that the state of society at the south is such that laws are a very inadequate protection even to white men southern elections always have been scenes of mob violence when only white men voted multitudes of lives have been lost at the polls in this way and if against their will negro suffrage was forced upon them i do not see how any one in their senses can expect anything less than an immediate war of races if negro suffrage were required as a condition of acquiring political position there is no doubt the slave states would grant it grant it nominally because they would know that the grant never could or would become an actual realization and what would then be gained for the negro i am sorry that people cannot differ on such great and perplexing public questions without impugning each other's motives henry has been called a backslider because of the lenity of his counsels but i cannot but think it is the spirit of christ that influences him garrison has been in the same way spoken of as a deserter because he says that a work that is done shall be called done and because he would not keep up an anti-slavery society when slavery is abolished and i think our president is much injured by the abuse that is heaped on him and the selfish and unworthy motives that are ascribed to him by those who seem determined to allow to nobody an honest unselfish difference in judgment from their own harry has often spoken of you and your duke as pleasant memories in a scene of almost superhuman labor and excitement he often said to me when this is all over when we have won the victory then i will write to the duchess but when it was over and the flag raised again at sumter his arm was smitten down with the news of our president's death we all appreciate your noble and true sympathy through the dark hour of our national trial you and yours are almost the only friends we now have left in england you cannot know what it was unless you could imagine your own country to be in danger of death extinction of nationality 
that dear friend is an experience which shows us what we are and what we can feel i am glad to hear that we may hope to see your son in this country i fear so many pleasant calls will beset his path that we cannot hope for a moment but it would give us all the greatest pleasure to see him here our dull prosy commonplace though good old hartford could offer few attractions compared with boston or new york and yet i hope he will not leave us out altogether if he comes among us god bless him you are very happy indeed in being permitted to keep all your dear ones and see them growing up i want to ask a favor do you have as we do carte de visite if you have and could send me one of yourself and the duke and of lady edith and your eldest son i should be so very glad to see how you are looking now and the dear mother too i should so like to see how she looks it seems almost like a dream to look back to those pleasant days i am glad to see you still keep some memories of our goings-on georgie's marriage is a very happy one to us they live in stockbridge the loveliest part of massachusetts and her husband is a most devoted pastor and gives all his time and property to the great work which he has embraced purely for the love of it my other daughters are with me and my son captain stowe who has come with weakened health through our struggle suffering constantly from the effects of a wound in his head received at gettysburg which makes his returning to his studies a hard struggle my husband is in better health since he resigned his professorship and desires his most sincere regards to yourself and the duke and his profound veneration to your mother sister mary also desires to be remembered to you as do also my daughters please tell me a little in your next of lady edith she must be very lovely now i am with sincerest affection ever yours h b stowe soon after the close of the war mrs stowe conceived the idea of making for herself and her family a winter home in the south where she might escape the rigors of northern winters and where her afflicted son frederick might enjoy an out-of-door life throughout the year she was also most anxious to do her share towards educating and leading to a higher life those colored people whom she had helped so largely to set free and who were still in a state of profound ignorance imposed by slavery in writing of her hopes and plans to her brother charles beecher in eighteen eighty six she says quote, my plan of going to florida as it lies in my mind is not in any sense a mere worldly enterprise i have for many years had a longing to be more immediately doing christ's work on earth my heart is with those poor people whose cause in words i have tried to plead and who now ignorant and docile are just in that formative stage in which whoever seizes has them corrupt politicians are already beginning to speculate on them as possible capital for their schemes and to fill their poor heads with all sorts of vagaries florida is the state into which they have more than anywhere else been pouring emigration is positively and decidedly setting that way but as yet it is mere worldly emigration with the hope of making money nothing more the episcopal church is however undertaking under direction of the future bishop of florida a wide embracing scheme of christian activity for the whole state in this work i desire to be associated and my plan is to locate at some salient point on the st john's river where i can form the nucleus of a christian neighborhood whose influence shall be felt far beyond its own limits during this year mrs stowe partially carried her plan into execution by hiring an old plantation called laurel grove on the west side of the st john's river near the present village of orange park here she established her son frederick as a cotton planter and here he remained for two years this location did not however prove entirely satisfactory nor did the raising of cotton prove to be under the circumstances a profitable business after visiting florida during the winter of eighteen sixty six sixty seven at which time her attention was drawn to the beauties and superior advantages of mandarin on the east side of the river mrs stowe writes from hartford may twenty ninth eighteen sixty seven to rev charles beecher 
my dear brother we are now thinking seriously of a place in mandarin much more beautiful than any other in the vicinity it has on it five large date palms an olive tree in full bearing besides a fine orange grove which this year will yield about seventy five thousand oranges if we get that then i want you to consider the expediency of buying the one next to it it contains about two hundred acres of land on which is a fine orange grove the fruit from which last year brought in two thousand dollars as sold at the wharf it is right on the river and four steamboats pass it each week on their way to savannah and charleston there is on the place a very comfortable cottage as houses go out there where you do not need to be built as substantially as with us I am now in correspondence with the Bishop of Florida with a view to establishing a line of churches along the St. John's River, and if I settle at Mandarin, it will be one of my stations. Will you consent to enter the Episcopal Church and be our clergyman? You are just the man we want. If my tasks and feelings did not incline me toward the church, I should still choose it as the best system for training immature minds such as those of our Negroes the system was composed with reference to the wants of the laboring class of england at a time when they were as ignorant as our negroes now are i long to be at this work and cannot think of it without my heart burning within me still i leave all with my god to do all that i want to for his poor people affectionately yours h b stowe Mrs. Stowe had for some years before this joined the Episcopal Church for the sake of attending the same communion as her daughters who were Episcopalians. Her brother Charles did not, however, see fit to change his creed, and though he went to Florida, he settled 160 miles west from the St. John's River at Newport, near St. Mark's on the Gulf Coast, and about 20 miles from Tallahassee. Here he lived every winter and several summers for fifteen years, and here he left the impress of his own remarkably sweet and lovely character upon the scattered population of the entire region. Mrs. Stowe, in the meantime, purchased the property with its orange grove and comfortable cottage that she had recommended to him, and thus Mandarin became her winter home. No one who has ever seen it can forget the peaceful beauty of this Florida home and its surroundings. The house, a story and a half cottage of many gables, stands on a bluff overlooking the broad St. John's, which is five miles wide at this point. It nestles in the shade of a grove of superb moss-hung live oaks, around one of which the front piazza is built several fine old orange trees also stand near the cottage scenting the air with the sweet perfume of their blossoms in early spring and offering their golden fruit to whoever may choose to pluck it during the winter months back of the house stretches the well-tended orange grove in which mrs stowe took such genuine pride and pleasure everywhere about the dwelling and within it were flowers and singing birds while the rose garden in front at the foot of the bluff was the admiration of all who saw it here, on the front piazza, beneath the grand oaks, looking out on the calm, sunlit river, Professor Stowe enjoyed that absolute peace and restful quiet for which his scholarly nature had always longed, but which had been forbidden to the greater part of his active life. At almost any hour of the day, the well-known figure, with snow-white patriarchal beard and kindly face, might be seen sitting there, with a basket of books, many of them in dead and nearly forgotten languages, close at hand. An amusing incident of family life was as follows. Some northern visitors seemed to think that the family had no rights which were worthy of a moment's consideration. They would land at the wharf, roam about the place, pick flowers, peer into the house through the windows and doors, and act with that disregard of all the proprieties of life which characterizes ill-bred people when on a journey. The professor had been driven well-nigh distracted by these migratory bipeds. One day, when one of them broke a branch from an orange tree directly before his eyes, and was bearing it off in triumph with all its load of golden fruit, he leaped from his chair and addressed the astonished individual on those fundamental principles of common honesty which he deemed outraged by this act. The address was vigorous and truthful, but of a kind which will not bear repeating. "'Why,' said the horror-stricken culprit, "'I thought that this was Mrs. Stowe's place.' 
you thought it was mrs stowe's place then in a voice of thunder i would have you understand sir that i am the proprietor and protector of mrs stowe and of this place and if you commit any more such shameful depredations i will have you punished as you deserve thus this predatory yankee was taught to realize that there is a god in israel in april eighteen sixty nine mrs stowe was obliged to hurry north in order to visit canada in time to protect her english rights in old town folks which she had just finished about this time she secured a plot of land and made arrangements for the erection on it of a building that should be used as a schoolhouse through the week and as a church on sunday for several years professor stowe preached during the winter in this little schoolhouse and mrs stowe conducted sunday school sewing classes singing classes and various other gatherings for instruction and amusement all of which were well attended and highly appreciated by both the white and colored residents of the neighborhood upon one occasion having just arrived at her mandarin home mrs stowe writes quote, at last after waiting a day and a half in charleston we arrived here at ten o'clock saturday morning just a week from the day we sailed the house looked so pretty and quiet and restful the day was so calm and lovely it seemed as though i had passed away from all trouble and was looking back upon you all from a secure resting place mr stowe is very happy here and is constantly saying how pleasant it is and how glad he is that he is here he is so much improved in health that already he is able to take a considerable walk every day. We are all well, contented, and happy, and we have six birds, two dogs, and a pony. Do write more and oftener. Tell me all the little nothings and nowheres. You can't imagine how they are magnified by the time they have reached into this remote corner. End quote in eighteen seventy two she wrote a series of florida sketches which were published in book form the following year by j r osgood and company under the title of palmetto leaves may nineteenth eighteen seventy three she writes to her brother charles at newport florida Quote, although you have not answered my last letter i cannot leave florida without saying good-bye i send you the palmetto leaves and my parting love if i could have either brought or left my husband i should have come to see you this winter the account of your roses fills me with envy we leave on the san jacinta next saturday and i am making the most of the few charming hours yet left for never did we have so delicious a spring i never knew such altogether perfect weather it is enough to make a saint out of the toughest old calvinist that ever set his face as a flint how do you think new england theology would have fared if our fathers had been landed here instead of on plymouth rock the next you hear of me will be at the north where our address is forest street hartford we have bought a pretty cottage there near to bell and shall spend the summer there End quote. End of chapter seventeen part one read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 17, Part 2 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son, Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17, Florida, 1865-1869, through 1869, Part 2. In a letter written in May of the following year to her son, Charles, at Harvard, Mrs. Stowe says, quote, I can hardly realize that this long, flowery summer, with its procession of blooms and fruit, has been running on at the same time with the snowbanks and sleet storms of the north. But so it is. It is now the first of May. Strawberries and blackberries are over with us. Oranges are in a waning condition, few and far between. Now we are going north to begin another summer, and have roses, strawberries, blackberries, and green peas come again i am glad to hear of your reading the effect produced on you by jonathan edwards is very similar to that produced on me when i took the same mental bath his was a mind whose grasp and intensity you cannot help feeling he was a poet in the intensity of his conceptions and some of his sermons are more terrible than dante's inferno End quote. 
in november eighteen seventy four upon their return to mandarin she writes quote, we have had heavenly weather and we needed it for our house was a cave of spider webs cockroaches dirt and all abominations but less than a week has brought it into beautiful order it now begins to put on that quaint lively pretty air that so fascinates me our weather is as i said heavenly neither hot nor cold cool calm bright serene and so tranquilizing there is something indescribable about the best weather we have down here it does not debilitate me like the soft october air in hartford End quote. during the following february she writes in reply to an invitation to visit a northern watering place late in the season quote, i shall be most happy to come and know of nothing to prevent i have thank goodness no serial story on hand for this summer to hang like an old man of the sea about my neck and i hope to enjoy a little season of being like other folks it is a most lovely day to-day most unfallen eden-like in a letter written later in the same season march twenty eighth eighteen seventy five mrs stowe gives us a pleasant glimpse at their preparations for a proper observance of easter sunday in the little mandarin schoolhouse she says it was the week before easter and we had on our minds the dressing of the church there my two gothic firebirds were to be turned into a pulpit for the occasion i went to jacksonville and got a five-inch moulding for a base and then had one fireboard sawed in two so that there was an arched panel for each end then came a rummage for something for a top and to make a desk of until it suddenly occurred to me that our old black walnut extension table had a set of leaves they were exactly the thing the hole was trimmed with a beading of yellow pine and rubbed and pumice stoned and oiled and i got out my tubes of paint and painted the nail holes with van dyke brown by saturday morning it was a lovely little gothic pulpit and anthony carried it over to the schoolhouse and took away the old desk which i gave him for his meeting-house that afternoon we drove out into the woods and gathered a quantity of superb easter lilies pawpaw sparkleberry great fern leaves and cedar in the evening the girls went over to the meads to practice easter hymns but i sat at home and made a cross eighteen inches long of cedar and white lilies this southern cedar is the most exquisite thing it is so feathery and delicate sunday morning was cool and bright a most perfect easter our little church was full and everybody seemed delighted with the decorations mr stowe preached a sermon to show that christ is going to put everything right at last which is comforting so the day was one of real pleasure and also i trust of real benefit to the poor souls who learn from it that christ is indeed risen for them End quote during this winter the following characteristic letters passed between mrs stowe and her valued friend dr oliver wendell holmes called forth by the sending to the latter of a volume of mrs stowe's latest stories boston january eighth eighteen seventy six my dear mrs stowe i would not write to thank you for your most welcome christmas box a box whose sweets compacted lie before i had read it and every word of it i have been very much taken up with the antics of one kind and another and have only finished it this afternoon the last of the papers was of less comparative value to me than to a great fraction of your immense parish of readers because i am so familiar with every movement of the pilgrims in their own chronicles deacon pitkin's farm is full of those thoroughly truthful touches of new england in which if you are not unrivalled i do not know who your rival may be i wiped the tears from one eye in reading deacon pitkin's farm i wiped the tears and plenty of them from both eyes in reading betty's bright idea it is a most charming and touching story and nobody can read who has not a heart like a pebble without being melted into tenderness how much you have done and are doing to make our new england life wholesome and happy if there is any one who can look back over a literary life which has pictured our old and helped our new civilization it is yourself of course your later books have harder work cut out for them than those of any other writer they have had uncle tom's cabin for a rival 
the brightest torch casts a shadow in the blaze of a light and any transcendent success affords the easiest handle for that class of critics whose method is the one that dogberry held to be odious i think it grows pleasanter to us to be remembered by the friends we have as with each year they grow fewer we have lost Agassi and Sumner from our circle, and I found Motley stricken with threatening illness, which I hope is gradually yielding to treatment, in the profoundest grief at the loss of his wife, another old and dear friend of mine. So you may be assured that I feel most sensibly your kind attention, and send you my heartfelt thanks for remembering me. Always, dear Mrs. Stowe, faithfully yours, O. W. Holmes. To this letter, Mrs. Stowe replied as follows. Mandarin, February 23rd, 1876. Dear doctor, how kind it was of you to write me that very beautiful note. And how I wish you were just where I am, to see the trees laden at the same time with golden oranges and white blossoms. I should so like to cut off a golden cluster, leaves and all, for you well boston seems very far away and dreamy like some previous state of existence as i sit on the veranda and gaze on the receding shores of the st john's which at this point is five miles wide dear doctor how time slips by i remember when sumner seemed to me a young man and now he has gone and wilson has gone and chase whom i knew as a young man in society in cincinnati has gone and stanton has gone and seward has gone and yet how lively the world races on a few air bubbles of praise or lamentation and away sails the great ship of life no matter over whose grave well one cannot but feel it to me also a whole generation of friends has gone from the other side of the water since i was there and broke kindly bread with them the duchess of sutherland the good old duke lansdowne ellesmere lady byron lord and lady amberley charles kingsley the good quaker joseph sturge all are with the shadowy train that has moved on among them were as dear and true friends as i ever had and as pure and noble specimens of human beings as god ever made they are living somewhere in intense vitality i must believe and you dear doctor must not doubt i think about your writings a great deal and one element in them always attracts me it is their pitiful and sympathetic vein the pity for poor struggling human nature in this i feel that you must be very near and dear to him whose name is love you wrote some verses once that have got into the hymn books and have often occurred to me in my most sacred hours as descriptive of the feelings with which i bear the sorrows and carry the cares of life they begin love divine that stooped to share i have not all your books down here and am haunted by gaps in the verses that memory cannot make good but it is that love divine which is my stay and comfort and hope as one friend after another passes beyond sight and hearing please let me have it in your handwriting i remember a remark you once made on spiritualism i cannot recall the words but you spoke of it as modifying the sharp angles of calvinistic belief as a fog does those of a landscape i would like to talk with you some time on spiritualism and show you a collection of very curious facts that i have acquired through mediums not professional mr stowe has just been wading through eight volumes of la mystique by Gorez, professor for forty years past in the university of munich first of physiology and latterly of philosophy he examines the whole cycle of abnormal psychic spiritual facts trances ecstasy clairvoyance witchcraft spiritualism etc etc as shown in the ramish miracles and the history of europe i have long since come to the conclusion that the marvels of spiritualism are natural and not supernatural phenomenon an uncommon working of natural laws i believe that the door between those in the body and those out has never in any age been entirely closed and that occasional perceptions within the veil are a part of the course of nature and therefore not miraculous 
of course such a phase of human experience is very substantial ground for every kind of imposture and superstition and i have no faith whatever in mediums who practice for money in their case i think the law of moses that forbade consulting those who dealt with familiar spirits is a very wise one do write some more dear doctor you are too well off in your place down there on the new land your centennial ballad was a charming little peep now give us a full-fledged story mr stowe sends his best regards and wishes you would read Gorez. it is in french also and he thinks the french translation better than the german yours ever truly h b stowe writing in the autumn of eighteen seventy six to her son charles who was at that time abroad studying at bonn mrs stowe describes a most tempestuous passage between new york and charleston during which she and her husband and daughters suffered so much that they were ready to forswear the sea forever the great waves as they rushed boiling and seething past would peer in at the little bull's-eye window of the stateroom as if eager to swallow up ship and passengers from charleston however they had a most delightful run to their journey's end she writes quote, we had a triumphal entrance into the st john's and a glorious sail up the river arriving at mandarin at four o'clock we found all the neighbors black as well as white on the wharf to receive us there was a great waving of handkerchiefs and flags clapping of hands and cheering as we drew near the house was open and all ready for us and we are delighted to be once more in our beautiful florida home in the following december she writes to her son quote, i am again entangled in writing a serial a thing i never mean to do again but the story begun for a mere christmas brochure grew so under my hands that i thought i might as well fill it out and make a book of it it is the last thing of the kind i ever expect to do in it i condense my recollections of a bygone era that in which i was brought up the ways and manners of which are now as nearly obsolete as the old england of dickens stories is i am so hampered by the necessity of writing this story that i am obliged to give up company and visiting of all kinds and keep my strength for it i hope i may be able to finish it as i greatly desire to do so but i begin to feel that i am not so strong as i used to be your mother is an old woman charlie mine and it is best she should give up writing before people are tired of reading her i would much rather have written another such a book as footsteps of the master but all even the religious papers are gone mad on serials serials they demand and will have and i thought since this generation will listen to nothing but stories why not tell them End quote. the book thus referred to was poganuck people that series of delightful reminiscences of the new england life of nearly a century ago that has proved so fascinating to many thousands of readers it was published in eighteen seventy eight and as mrs stowe foresaw was her last literary undertaking of any length though for several years afterwards she wrote occasional short stories and articles in january eighteen seventy nine she wrote from mandarin to dr holmes quote, dear doctor i wish i could give to you and mrs holmes the exquisite charm of this morning my window is wide open it is a lovely fresh sunny day and a great orange tree hung with golden balls closes the prospect from my window the tree is about thirty feet high and its leaves fairly glisten in the sunshine i sent poganuck people to you and mrs holmes as being among the few who know those old days it is an extremely quiet story for these sensational days when heaven and earth seem to be racked for a thrill but as i get old i do love to think of those quiet simple times when there was not a poor person in the parish and the changing glories of the year were the only spectacle we that is the professor and myself have been reading with much interest motley's memoir that was a man to be proud of a beauty too by your engraving i never had the pleasure of a personal acquaintance i feel with you that we have come into the land of leave-taking hardly a paper but records the death of some of mr stowe's associates 
but the river is not so black as it seems and there are clear days when the opposite shore is plainly visible and now and then we catch a strain of music perhaps even a gesture of recognition they are thinking of us without doubt on the other side my daughters and i have been reading elsie venner again elsie is one of my especial friends poor dear child and all your theology in that book i subscribe to with both hands does not the bible plainly tell us of a time when there shall be no more pain that is to be the end and crown of the messiah's mission when god shall wipe all tears away my face is set that way and yours too i trust and believe mr stowe sends hearty and affectionate remembrance both to you and mrs holmes and i am as ever truly yours h b stowe about this time mrs stowe paid a visit to her brother charles at newport florida and continuing her journey to new orleans was made to feel how little of bitterness towards her was felt by the best class of southerners in both new orleans and tallahassee she was warmly welcomed and tendered public receptions that gave equal pleasure to her and to the throngs of cultivated people who attended them she was also greeted everywhere with intense enthusiasm by the colored people who whenever they knew of her coming thronged the railway stations in order to obtain a glimpse of her whom they venerated above all women the return to her mandarin home each succeeding winter was always a source of intense pleasure to this true lover of nature in its brightest and tenderest moods each recurring season was filled with new delights in december eighteen seventy nine she writes to her son now married and settled as a minister in sacco maine dear children well we have stepped from december to june and this morning is sunny and dewy with a fresh sea breeze giving life to the air i have just been out to cut a great bunch of roses and lilies though the garden has grown into such a jungle that i could hardly get about in it the canas the dwarf bananas the roses are all tangled together so that i could hardly thread my way among them i never in my life saw anything range and run rampant over the ground as canas do the ground is littered with fallen oranges and the place looks shockingly untidy but so beautiful that i am quite willing to forgive its disorder we got here wednesday evening about nine o'clock and found all the neighbors waiting to welcome us on the wharf the meads and cranes and webs and all the rest were there while the black population was in a frenzy of joy your father is quite well the sea had its usual exhilarating effect upon him before we left new york he was quite meek and exhibited such signs of grace and submission that i had great hopes of him he promised to do exactly as i told him and stated that he had entire confidence in my guidance what woman couldn't call such a spirit evidence of being prepared for speedy translation i was almost afraid he could not be long for this world but on the second day at sea his spirits rose and his appetite reasserted itself he declared in loud tones how well he felt and quite resented my efforts to take care of him i reminded him of his gracious vows and promises in the days of his low spirits but to no effect the fact is his self-will has not left him yet and i have now no fear of his immediate translation he is going to preach for us this morning End quote the last winter passed in this well-loved southern home was that of eighteen eighty three through eighty four for the following season professor stowe's health was in too precarious a state to permit him to undertake the long journey from hartford by this time one of mrs stowe's fondest hopes had been realized and largely through her efforts mandarin had been provided with a pretty little episcopal church to which was attached a comfortable rectory and over which was installed a regular clergyman in january eighteen eighty four mrs stowe writes quote, mandarin looks very gay and airy now with its new villas and our new church and rectory our minister is perfect i wish you could know him he wants only physical strength in everything else he is all one could ask it is a bright lovely morning and four orange pickers are busy gathering our fruit our trees on the bluff have done better than any in florida this winter i study nothing but christ's life 
first i read ferrar's account and went over it carefully now i am reading geeky it keeps my mind steady and helps me to bear the languor and pain of which i have more than usual this winter End quote. End of chapter seventeen read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 18, Part 1 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, Old Town Folks, 1869. Professor Stowe, the original of Harry in Old Town Folks. Professor Stowe's letter to George Eliot. Her remarks on the same. Professor Stowe's narrative of his youthful adventures in the world of spirits. Professor Stowe's influence on Mrs. Stowe's literary life. George Eliot on Old Town Folks. This biography would be signally incomplete without some mention of the birth, childhood, early associations, and very peculiar and abnormal psychological experiences of Professor Stowe. Aside from the fact of Dr. Stowe's being Mrs. Stowe's husband, and for this reason entitled to notice in any sketch of her life, however meager, he is the original of the visionary boy in Old Town Folks, and Old Town Fireside Stories embody the experiences of his childhood and youth among the grotesque and original characters of his native town. March 26, 1882, Professor Stowe wrote the following characteristic letter to Mrs. Lewes. Mrs. Lewes, I fully sympathize with you in your disgust with Hume and the professing mediums generally. Hume spent his boyhood in my father's native town among my relatives and acquaintances, and he was a disagreeable, nasty boy but he certainly has qualities which science has not yet explained, and some of his doings are as real as they are strange. My interest in the subject of spiritualism arises from the fact of my own experience more than sixty years ago in my early childhood. I then never thought of questioning the objective reality of all I saw and supposed that everybody else had the same experience. Of what this experience was, you may gain some idea from certain passages in Old Town Folks. The same experiences continue yet, but with serious doubts as to the objectivity of the scenes exhibited. I have noticed that people who have remarkable and minute answers to prayer, such as Stilling, Frank, Lavater, are for the most part of this peculiar temperament. Is it absurd to suppose that some peculiarity in the nervous system, in the connecting link between soul and body, may bring some, more than others, into an almost abnormal contact with the spirit world? For example, Jacob Bohem and Swedenborg? And that, too, without correcting their faults, are making them morally better than others? allow me to say that i have always admired the working of your mind there is about it such a perfect uprightness and uncalculating honesty i think you are a better christian without church or theology than most people are with both though i am and always have been in the main a calvinist of the jonathan edwards school god bless you i have a warm side for mr lewes on account of his goth labors goth has been my admiration for more than forty years in 1830, I got hold of his Faust, and for two gloomy, dreary November days, while riding through the woods of New Hampshire in an old-fashioned stagecoach to enter upon a professorship in Dartmouth College, I was perfectly dissolved by it. Sincerely yours, C. E. Stowe. In a letter to Mrs. Stowe, written June 24, 1872, Mrs. Lewes alludes to Professor Stowe's letter as follows. Pray give my special thanks to the professor for his letter. His handwriting, which does really look like Arabic, a very graceful character, surely, happens to be remarkably legible to me, and I did not hesitate over a single word. Some of the words, as expressions of fellowship, were very precious to me, and I hold it very good of him to write to me that best sort of encouragement. I was much impressed with the fact 
which you have told me that he was the original of the visionary boy in old town folks and it must be deeply interesting to talk with him on his experience perhaps i am inclined under the influence of the facts physiological and psychological which have been gathered of late years to give larger place to the interpretation of vision seeing as subjective than the professor would approve it seems difficult to limit at least to limit with any precision the possibility of confounding sense by impressions derived from inward conditions with those which are directly dependent on external stimulus in fact the division between within and without in this sense seems to become every year a more subtle and bewildering problem End quote. in eighteen thirty four while mr stowe was a professor in lane theological seminary at cincinnati ohio he wrote out a history of his youthful adventures in the spirit world from which the following extracts are taken quote, i have often thought i would communicate to some scientific physician a particular account of a most singular delusion under which i lived from my earliest infancy till the fifteenth or sixteenth year of my age and the effects of which remain very distinctly now that i am past thirty the facts are of such a nature as to be indelibly impressed upon my mind they appear to me to be curious and well worth the attention of the psychologist i regard the occurrences in question as the more remarkable because i cannot discover that i possess either the taste or talent for fiction or poetry i have barely imagination enough to enjoy with a high degree of relish the works of others in this department of literature but have never felt able or disposed to engage in that sort of writing myself on the contrary my style has always been remarkable for its dry matter-of-fact plainness my mind has been distinguished for its quickness and adaptedness to historical and literary investigations for ardor and perseverance in pursuit of the knowledge of facts ein verstandige Richtung, as the germans would say rather than for any other quality and the only talent of a higher kind which i am conscious of possessing is a turn for accurate observation of men and things and a certain broad humor and drollery from the hour of my birth i have been constitutionally feeble as were my parents before me and my nervous system easily excitable with care however i have kept myself in tolerable health and my life has been an industrious one for my parents were poor and i have always been obliged to labor for my livelihood with these preliminary remarks i proceed to the curious details of my psychological history as early as i can remember anything i can remember observing a multitude of animated and active objects which i could see with perfect distinctness moving about me and could sometimes though seldom hear them make a rustling noise or other articulate sounds but i could never touch them they were in all respects independent of the sense of touch and incapable of being obstructed in any way by the intervention of material objects i could see them at any distance and through any intervening object with as much ease and distinctness as if they were in the room with me and directly before my eyes i could see them passing through the floors and the ceilings and the walls of the house from one apartment to another in all directions without a door or a keyhole or crevice being open to admit them i could follow them with my eyes to any distance or directly through or just beneath the surface or up and down in the midst of boards and timbers and bricks or whatever else would stop the motion or intercept the visibleness of all other objects these appearances occasioned neither surprise nor alarm except when they assumed some hideous and frightful form or exhibited some menacing gesture for i became acquainted with them as soon as with any of the objects of sense as to the reality of their existence and the harmlessness of their character i knew no difference between them and any other of the objects which met my eye they were as familiar to me as the forms of my parents and my brother they made up a part of my daily existence and were as really the subjects of my consciousness as the little bench on which i sat in the corner by my mother's knee or the wheels and sticks and strings with which i amused myself upon the floor i indeed recognized a striking difference between them and the things which i could feel and handle but to me this difference was no more a matter of surprise than that which i observed between my mother and the black woman who so often came to work for her 
are between my infant brother and the little spotted dog brutus of which i was so fond there was no time or place or circumstance in which they did not occasionally make their appearance solitude and silence however were more favourable to their appearance than company and conversation they were more pleased with candlelight than the daylight they were most numerous distinct and active when i was alone and in the dark especially when my mother had laid me in bed and returned to her own room with the candle at such times i always expected the company of my aerial visitors and counted upon them to amuse me till i dropped asleep whenever they failed to make their appearance as was sometimes the case i felt lonely and discontented i kept up a lively conversation with them not by language or by signs for the attempts on my part to speak or move would at once break the charm and drive them away in a fret but by a, a peculiar sort of spiritual intercommunion when their attention was directed towards me i could feel and respond to all their thoughts and feelings and was conscious that they could in the same manner feel and respond to mine sometimes they would take no notice of me but carry on a brisk conversation among themselves principally by looks and gestures and now and then an audible word in fact there were but few with whom i was very familiar these few were much more constant and uniform in their visits than the great multitude who were frequently changing and too much absorbed in their own concerns to think much of me i scarcely know how i can give an idea of their form and general appearance for there are no objects in the material world with which i can compare them and no language adapted to an accurate description of their peculiarities they exhibited all possible combinations of size shape proportion and color but their most usual appearance was with the human form and proportion but under a shadowy outline that seemed just ready to melt into the invisible air and sometimes liable to the most sudden and grotesque changes and with a uniform darkly bluish color spotted with brown or brownish white this was the general appearance of the multitude but there were many exceptions to this description particularly among my more welcome and familiar visitors as will be seen in the sequel besides these rational and generally harmless beings there was another set of objects which never varied in their form or qualities and were always mischievous and terrible the fact of their appearance depended very much on the state of my health and feelings if i was well and cheerful they seldom troubled me but when sick or depressed they were sure to obtrude their hateful presence upon me these were a sort of heavy clouds floating about overhead of a black colour spotted with brown in the shape of a very flaring inverted tunnel without a nozzle and from ten to thirty or forty feet in diameter they floated from place to place in great numbers and in all directions with a strong and steady progress but with a tremulous quivering internal motion that agitated them in every part whenever they approached the rational phantoms were thrown into great consternation as well as might be for if a cloud touched any part of one of the rational phantoms it immediately communicated its own colour and tremulous motion to the part it touched in spite of all the efforts and convulsive struggles of the unhappy victim this color and motion slowly but steadily and uninterruptedly proceeded to diffuse itself over every part of the body and as fast as it did so the body was drawn into the cloud and became a part of its substance it was indeed a fearful sight to see the contortions the agonizing efforts of the poor creatures who had been touched by one of these awful clouds and were dissolving and melting into it by inches without the possibility of escape or resistance this was the only visible object that had the least power over the phantoms and this was evidently composed of the same material as themselves the forms and actions of all these phantoms varied very much with the state of my health and animal spirits but i never could discover that the surrounding material objects had any influence upon them except in this one particular namely if i saw them in a neat well-furnished room there was a neatness and polish in their form and motions and on the contrary if i was in an unfinished rough apartment there was a corresponding rudeness and roughness in my aerial visitors 
a corresponding difference was visible when i saw them in the woods or in the meadows upon the water or upon the ground in the air or among the stars every different apartment which i occupied had a different set of phantoms and they always had a degree of correspondence to the circumstances in which they were seen it should be noted however that it was not so much the place where the phantoms themselves appeared to me to be that affected their forms and movements as the place in which i myself actually was while observing them the apparent locality of the phantoms it is true had some influence but my own actual locality had much more thus far i have attempted only a general outline of these curious experiences i will now proceed to a detailed account of several particular incidents for the sake of illustrating the general statements already made i select a few from manifestations without number i am able to ascertain dates from the following circumstances i was born in april eighteen o two and my father died in july eighteen o eight after suffering for more than a year from a lingering organic disease between two and three years before his death he removed from the house in which i was born to another at a little distance from it what occurred therefore before my father's last sickness must have taken place during the first five years of my life and whatever took place before the removal of the family must have taken place during the first three years of my life before the removal of the family i slept in a small upper chamber in the front part of the house where i was generally alone for several hours in the evening and morning adjoining this room and opening into it by a very small door was a low dark narrow unfinished closet which was open to the other side into a ruinous old chase house this closet was a famous place for the gambols of the phantoms but of their forms and actions i do not now retain any very distinct recollection i only remember that i was very careful not to do anything that i thought would be likely to offend them yet otherwise their presence caused me no uneasiness and was not at all disagreeable to me the first incident of which i have a distinct recollection was the following one night as i was lying alone in my chamber with my little dog brutus snoring beside my bed there came out of the closet a very large indian woman and a very small indian man with a huge bass viol between them the woman was dressed in a large loose black gown secured around her waist by a belt of the same material and on her head she wore a high dark gray fur cap shaped somewhat like a lady's muff ornamented with a row of covered buttons in front and open towards the bottom showing a red lining the man was dressed in a shabby black colored overcoat and a little round black hat that fitted closely to his head they took no notice of me but were rather ill-natured towards each other and seemed to be disputing for the possession of the bass viol the man snatched it away and struck upon it a few harsh hollow notes which i distinctly heard and which seemed to vibrate through my whole body with a strange stinging sensation the woman then took it and appeared to play very intently as much to her own satisfaction but without producing any sound that was perceptible by me they soon left the chamber and i saw them go down into the back kitchen where they sat and played and talked with my mother it was only when the man took the bow that i could hear the harsh abrupt disagreeable sounds of the instrument at length they arose went out of the back door and sprang upon a large heap of straw and unthreshed beans and disappeared with a strange rumbling sound this vision was repeated night after night with scarcely any variation while we lived in that house and once and once only after the family had removed to the other house the only thing that seemed to me unaccountable and that excited my curiosity was that there should be such a large heap of straw and beans before the door every night when i could see nothing of it in the daytime i frequently crept out of the bed and stole softly down into the kitchen and peeped out of the door to see if it was there very early in the morning i attempted to make some inquiries of my mother but as i was not as yet very skilful in the use of language i could get no satisfaction out of her answers and could see that my question seemed to distress her at first she took little notice of what i said regarding it no doubt as the meaningless prattle of a thoughtless child 
my persistence however seemed to alarm her and i suppose that she feared for my sanity i soon desisted from asking anything further and shut myself more and more within myself one night very soon after the removal when the house was still and all the family were in bed these unearthly musicians once made their appearance in the kitchen of the new house and after looking around peevishly and sitting with a discontented frown and in silence they arose and went out of the back door and sprang on a pile of corn stalks and i saw them no more our new dwelling was a low studded house of only one story and instead of an upper chamber i now occupied a bedroom that opened into the kitchen within this bedroom directly on the left hand of the door as you entered from the kitchen was the staircase which led to the garret and as the room was unfurnished some of the boards which enclosed the staircase were too short and left a considerable space between them and the ceiling one of these open spaces was directly in front of my bed so that when i lay upon my pillow my face was opposite to it every night after i had gone to bed and the candle was removed a very pleasant-looking human face would peer at me over the top of that board and gradually press forward his head neck and shoulders and finally his whole body as far as the waist through the opening and then smiling upon me with great good nature would withdraw in the same manner in which he had entered he was a great favorite of mine for though we neither of us spoke we perfectly understood and were entirely devoted to each other it is a singular fact that the features of this favorite phantom bore a very close resemblance to those of the boy older than myself whom i feared and hated still the resemblance was so strong that i called him by the same name harvey harvey's visits were always expected and always pleasant but sometimes there were visitations of another sort odious and frightful one of these i will relate as a specimen of the rest one night after i had retired to bed and was looking for harvey i observed an unusual number of the tunnel-shaped tremulous clouds already described and they seemed intensely black and strongly agitated this alarmed me exceedingly and i had a terrible feeling that something awful was going to happen it was not long before i saw harvey at his accustomed place cautiously peeping at me through the aperture with an expression of pain and terror on his countenance he seemed to warn me to be on my guard but was afraid to put his head into the room lest he should be touched by one of the clouds which were every moment growing thicker and more numerous harvey soon withdrew and left me alone on turning my eyes towards the left-hand wall of the room i thought i saw at an immense distance below me the regions of the damned as i had heard them pictured in sermons from this awful world of horror the tunnel-shaped clouds were ascending and i perceived that they were the principal instruments of torture in these gloomy abodes these regions were at such an immense distance below me that i could obtain but a very indistinct view of the inhabitants who were very numerous and exceedingly active near the surface of the earth and as it seemed to me but a little distance from my bed i saw four or five sturdy resolute devils endeavoring to carry off an unprincipled and dissipated man in the neighborhood by the name of brown of whom i had stood in terror for years these devils i saw were very different from the common representations they had neither red faces nor horns nor hoofs nor tails they were in all respects stoutly built and well-dressed gentlemen the only peculiarity that i noted in their appearance was as to their heads their faces and necks were perfectly bare without hair or flesh and of a uniform sky-blue color like the ashes of burnt paper before it falls to pieces and of a certain glossy smoothness as i looked on full of eagerness the devils struggled to force brown down with them and brown struggled with the energy of desperation to save himself from their grip and it seemed that the human was likely to prove too strong for the infernal in this emergency one of the devils panting for breath and covered with perspiration beckoned to a strong thick cloud that seemed to understand him perfectly and whirling up to brown touched his hand brown resisted stoutly and struck out right and left at the cloud most furiously but the usual effect was produced the hand grew black quivered and seemed to be melting into the cloud then the arm by slow degrees and then the head and shoulders 
at this instant brown collecting all his energies for one desperate effort sprang at once into the centre of the cloud tore it asunder and descended to the ground exclaiming with a hoarse furious voice that grated on my ear there i've got out damn ye if i haven't this was the first word that had been spoken through the whole horrible scene it was the first time i had ever seen a cloud fail to produce its appropriate result and it terrified me so that i trembled from head to foot the devils however did not seem to be in the least discouraged one of them who seemed to be the leader went away and quickly returned bringing with him an enormous pair of rollers fixed in an iron frame such as are used in iron mills for the purpose of rolling out and slitting bars of iron except instead of being turned by machinery each roller was turned by an immense crank three of the devils now seized brown and put his feet to the rollers while two others stood one at each crank and began to roll him in with a steady strain that was entirely irresistible not a word was spoken not a sound was heard but the fearful struggles and terrified agonizing looks of brown were more than i could endure i sprang from my bed and ran through the kitchen into the room where my parents slept and entreated that they would permit me to spend the remainder of the night with them after considerable parleying they assured me that nothing could hurt me and advised me to go back to bed i replied that i was not afraid of their hurting me but i couldn't bear to see them acting so with c brown pooh pooh you foolish boy replied my father sternly you've only been dreaming go right back to bed or i shall have to whip you knowing that there was no other alternative i trudged back through the kitchen with all the courage i could muster cautiously entered my room where i found everything quiet there being neither cloud nor devil nor anything of the kind to be seen and getting into bed i slept quietly till morning the next day i was rather sad and melancholy but kept all my troubles to myself through fear of mr brown this happened before my father's sickness and consequently between the four and six years of my age during my father's sickness and after his death i lived with my grandmother and when i had removed to her house i forever lost sight of harvey i still continued to sleep alone for the most part but in a neatly furnished upper chamber across the corner of the chamber opposite to and a little distant from the head of my bed there was a closet in the form of an old-fashioned buffet after going to bed on looking at the door of this closet i could see at a great distance from it a pleasant meadow terminated by a beautiful little grove out of this grove and across this meadow a charming little female figure would advance about eight inches high and exquisitely proportioned dressed in a loose black silk robe with long smooth black hair parted up her head and hanging loose over her shoulders she would come forward with a slow and regular step becoming more distinctly visible as she approached nearer till she came even with the surface of the closet door when she would smile upon me raise her hands to her head and draw them down on each side of her face suddenly turn around and go off at a rapid trot the moment she turned i could see a good-looking mulatto man rather smaller than herself following directly in her wake and trotting off after her this was generally repeated two or three times before i went to sleep the features of the mulatto bore some resemblance to those of the indian man with the bass viol but were much more mild and agreeable end of chapter eighteen part one read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 18, Part 2 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, Old Town Folks, 1869, Part 2. I awoke one bright moonlit night and found a large, full length human skeleton of an ashy blue color in bed with me i screamed out with fright and soon summoned the family around me i refused to tell the cause of my alarm but begged permission to occupy another bed which was granted for the remainder of the night i slept but little but i saw upon the window-stool companies of little fairies about six inches high in white robes gambling and dancing with incessant merriment two of them a male and female rather taller than the rest were dignified with a crown and sceptre 
they took the kindest note of me smiled upon me with great benignity and seemed to assure me of their protection i was soothed and cheered by their presence though after all there was a sort of sinister and selfish expression in their countenances which prevented my placing implicit confidence in them up to this time i had never doubted the real existence of these phantoms nor had i ever suspected that other people had not seen them as distinctly as myself i now however began to discover with no little anxiety that my friends had little or no knowledge of the aerial beings among whom i spent my whole life that my allusions with them were not understood and all complaints respecting them were laughed at i had never been disposed to say much about them and the discovery confirmed me in my silence it did not however affect my own belief or lead me to suspect that my imaginations were not realities during the whole of this period i took great pleasure in walking out alone particularly in the evening the most lonely fields the woods and the banks of the river and other places most completely secluded were my favorite resorts for there i could enjoy the sight of innumerable aerial beings of all sorts without interruption every object even every shaking leaf seemed to me to be animated by some living soul whose nature in some degree corresponded to its habitation i spent much of my life in these solitary rambles there were particular places to which i gave names and visited them at regular intervals moonlight was particularly agreeable to me but most of all i enjoyed a thick foggy night at times during these walks i would be excessively obsessed by an indefinite and deep feeling of melancholy without knowing why i would be so unhappy as to wish myself annihilated and suddenly it would occur to me that my friends at home were suffering some dreadful calamity and so vivid would be the impression that i would hasten home with all speed to see what had taken place at such seasons i felt a morbid love for my friends that would almost burn upon my soul and yet at the least provocation from them i would fly into an uncontrollable passion and foam like a little fury i was called a dreadful tempered boy but the lord knows that i never occasioned pain to any animal whether human or brute without suffering untold agonies in consequence of it i cannot even now without feelings of deep sorrow called to mind the alternate fits of corroding melancholy irritation and bitter remorse which i then endured these fits of melancholy were most constant and oppressive during the autumnal months i very early learned to read and soon became immoderately attached to books in the bible i read the first chapters of job and parts of ezekiel daniel and revelation with most intense delight and with such frequency that i could repeat large portions from memory long before the age at which boys in the country are usually able to read plain sentences the first large book besides the bible that i remember reading was morse's history of new england which i devoured with insatiable greediness particularly those parts which relate to indian wars and witchcraft i was in the habit of applying to my grandmother for explanations and she would relate to me while i listened with breathless attention long stories from mather's magnalia or magnilly as she used to call it a work which i earnestly longed to read but of which i never got sight till after my twentieth year very early there fell into my hands an old school book called the art of speaking containing numerous extracts from milton and shakespeare there was little else in the book that interested me but these extracts from the two great english poets though there were many things in them that i did not well understand i read again and again with increased pleasure at every perusal till i had nearly committed them to memory and almost thumbed the old book into nonentity but of all the books that i read at this period there was none that went to my heart like bunyan's pilgrim's progress i read it and re-read it night and day i took it to bed with me and hugged it to my bosom while i slept every different edition that i could find i seized upon and read with as eager a curiosity as if it had been a new story throughout and i read with the unspeakable satisfaction of most devoutly believing that everything which honest john related was a real verity an actual occurrence oh that i could read that most inimitable book once more with the same solemn conviction of its literal truth that i might once more enjoy the same untold ecstasy one other remark that seems proper to make before i proceed further to details 
the appearance and especially the motions of my aerial visitors were intimately connected either as cause or effect i cannot determine which with certain sensations of my own their countenances generally expressed pleasure or pain complacence or anger according to the mood of my own mind if they moved from place to place without moving their limbs with that gliding motion appropriate to spirits i felt in my stomach that peculiar tickling sensation which accompanies a rapid progressive movement through the air and if they went off with an uneasy trot i felt an unpleasant jarring through my frame their appearance was always attended with considerable effort and fatigue on my part the more distinct and vivid they were the more would my fatigue be increased and at such times my face was always pale and my eyes unusually sparkling and wild this continued to be the case after i became satisfied that it was all a delusion of the imagination and it so continues to the present day End quote it is not surprising that mrs stowe should have felt herself impelled to give literary form to an experience so exceptional still more must this be the case when the early associations of this exceptional character were as amusing and interesting as they are shown forth in old town fireside stories none of the incidents or characters embodied in those sketches are ideal the stories are told as they came from mr stowe's lips with little or no alteration sam lawson was a real character in eighteen seventy four mr whittier wrote to mrs stowe quote, i am not able to write or study much or read books that require thought without suffering but i have sam lawson lying at hand and as corporal trim said of yorick's sermon i like it hugely End quote the power and literary value of these stories lie in the fact that they are true to nature professor stowe was himself an inimitable mimic and story-teller no small portion of mrs stowe's success as a literary woman is to be attributed to him not only was he possessed of a bright quick mind but wonderful retentiveness of memory mrs stowe was never at a loss for reliable information on any subject as long as the professor lived he belonged to that extinct species the general scholar his scholarship was not critical in the modern sense of the word but in the main accurate in spite of his love for the marvellous it is not out of place to give a little idea of his power in character painting as it shows how suggestive his conversation and letters must have been to a mind like that of mrs stowe's natick july fourteenth eighteen thirty nine i have had a real good time this week writing my oration i have strolled over my old walking places and found the same old stone walls the same old footpaths through the rye fields the same bends in the river the same old bullfrogs with their green spectacles on the same old terrapins sticking up their heads and bowing as i go by and nothing was wanting but my wife to talk with to make all complete i have had some rare talks with old uncle jaw bacon and other old characters which you ought to have heard the curtises have been flooding uncle jaw's meadows and he is in a great stew about it he says quote, i took and told your uncle isaac to tell them our curtises that if the devil didn't get em for flowing my meadow out of that sort i didn't see no use of having any devil End quote. have you talked with the curtises yourself yes hang the scary dogs and they took and telled me that they'd take and flow clean up to my front door and make me go out and in in a boat why don't you go to the law oh they keep alterin and a tinkerin up them laws so here in massachusetts that a body can't get no damage for flowin they think cold water can't hurt nobody End quote mother and aunt nabby each keep separate establishments first aunt nabby gets up in the morning and examines the sink to see whether it leaks and rots the beam she then makes a little fire gets her a little teapot of bright shining tin and puts into it a teaspoon of black tea and so prepares her breakfast by this time mother comes creeping downstairs like an old tabby cat out of an ash hole and she kind of doubts and reckons whether or no she had better try to get any breakfast being as she has not much appetite this morning but she goes to the leg of bacon and cuts off a little slice reckons she'll broil it then goes and looks at the coffee-pot and reckons she'll have a little coffee don't exactly know whether it's good for her 
but she don't drink much so while aunt nabby is sitting sipping her tea and munching her bread and butter with a matter-of-fact certainty and marvellous satisfaction mother goes doubting and reckoning round like miss diffidence in doubting castle till you see rising up another little table in another corner of the room with a good substantial structure of broiled ham and coffee and a boiled egg or two with various etc which mrs diffidence after many desponding ejaculations finally sits down to and in spite of all presentiments makes them fly as nimbly as mr ready to halt did miss much afraid when he footed it so well with her on his crutches in the dance on the occasion of giant despair's overthrow i have thus far dined alternately with mother and aunt susan not having yet been admitted to aunt nabby's establishment there are now great talkings and congresses and consultations of the allied powers and already rumors are afloat that perhaps all will unite their force and dine at one table especially as harriet and little hattie are coming and there is no knowing what might come out in the papers if there should be anything a little odd mother is very well thin as a hatchet and smart as a steel trap aunt nabby fat and easy as usual for since the sink is mended and no longer leaks and rots the beam she has nothing to do but watch it and uncle bill has joined the washingtonians and no longer drinks rum she is quite at a loss for topics of worriment uncle ike has had a little touch of palsy and is rather feeble he says that his legs and arms have rather gin out but his head and pluck are as good as they ever were i told him that our sister kate was very much in the same fix whereat he was considerably affected and opened the crack in his great pumpkin of a face displaying the same two rows of great white ivories which have been my admiration from my youth up he is sixty-five years of age and has never lost a tooth and was never in his life more than fifteen miles from the spot where he was born except once in the ever memorable year of eighteen nineteen when i was at bradford academy in a sudden glow of adventurous rashness he undertook to go after me and bring me home for vacation and he actually performed the whole journey of thirty miles with his horse and wagon and slept at a tavern the whole night a feat of bravery on which he has never since ceased to plume himself i well remember that awful night in the tavern in the remote region of north andover we occupied a chamber in which were two beds in the unsuspecting innocence of youth i undressed myself and got into bed as usual but my brave and thoughtful uncle merely divesting himself of his coat put it under his pillow and then threw himself on to the bed with his boots on his feet and his two hands resting on the rim of his hat which he had prudently placed on the apex of his stomach as he lay on his back he wouldn't allow me to blow out the candle but he lay there with his great white eyes fixed on the ceiling in the cool determined manner of a bold man who has made up his mind to face danger and meet whatever might befall him we escaped however without injury the dowdy landlord and his relentless sons merely demanding pay for supper lodging horse feed and breakfast which my valiant uncle betraying no signs of fear resolutely paid End quote mrs stowe has woven this incident into chapter thirty two of old town folks where uncle ike figures as uncle jacob mrs stowe had misgivings as to the reception old town folks would meet in england owing to its distinctly new england character shortly after the publication of the book she receives the following words of encouragement from mrs lewes george eliot july eleventh eighteen sixty nine i have received and read old town folks i think that few of your readers can have felt more interest than i have felt in that picture of an elder generation for my interest in it has a double root one is my own love for our old-fashioned provincial life which had its affinities with a contemporary life even all across the atlantic and of which i have gathered glimpses in different phases from my mother and father with their relations the other is my experimental acquaintance with some shades of calvinistic orthodoxy i think your way of presenting the religious convictions which are not your own except by way of indirect fellowship is a triumph of insight and true tolerance both mr lewes and i are deeply interested in the indications which the professor gives of his peculiar psychological experience and we should feel it a great privilege to learn much more of it from his lips 
it is a rare thing to have such an opportunity of studying exceptional experience in the testimony of a truthful and in every way distinguished mind End quote. old town folks is of interest as being undoubtedly the last of mrs stowe's works which will outlive the generation for which it was written besides its intrinsic merit as a work of fiction it has a certain historic value as being a faithful study of new england life and character in that particular time of its history which may be called the seminal period whether mrs stowe was far enough away from the time and people she attempts to describe to make her mind as still and passive as a looking-glass or a mountain lake and to give merely the images reflected there is something that will in great part determine the permanent value of this work its interest as a story merely is of course ephemeral this ends chapter eighteen read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter nineteen of the life of harriet beecher stowe compiled from her letters and journals by her son charles edward stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the byron controversy eighteen sixty nine through eighteen seventy mrs stowe's statement of her own case the circumstances under which she first met lady byron letters to lady byron letter to dr holmes when about to publish the true story of lady byron's life in the atlantic dr holmes's reply the conclusion of the matter it seems impossible to avoid the unpleasant episode in mrs stowe's life known as the byron controversy it will be our effort to deal with the matter as colorlessly as is consistent with an adequate setting forth of the motives which moved mrs stowe to awaken this unsavory discussion in justification of her action in this matter mrs stowe says what interest have you and i my brother and my sister in this short life of ours to utter anything but the truth is not truth between man and man and between man and woman the foundation on which all things rest have you not every individual of you who must hereafter give an account of yourself alone to god an interest to know the exact truth in this matter and a duty to perform as respects that truth hear me then while i tell you the position in which i stood and what was my course in relation to it a shameless attack on my friend's memory had appeared in the blackwood of july eighteen sixty nine branding lady byron as the vilest of criminals and recommending the guiccioli book to a christian public as interesting from the very fact that it was the avowed product of lord byron's mistress no efficient protest was made against this outrage in england and littell's living age reprinted the blackwood article and the harpers the largest publishing house in america perhaps in the world republished the book its statements with those of the blackwood pall mall gazette and other english periodicals were being propagated through all the young reading and writing world of america i was meeting them advertised in dailies and made up into articles in magazines and thus the generation of to-day who had no means of judging lady byron but by these fables of her slanders were being foully deceived the friends who knew her personally were a small select circle in england whom death is every day reducing they were few in number compared with the great world and were silent i saw these foul slanders crystallizing into history uncontradicted by friends who knew her personally who firm in their own knowledge of her virtues and limited in view as aristocratic circles generally are had no idea of the width of the world they were living in and the exigency of the crisis when time passed on and no voice was raised i spoke End quote. it is hardly necessary to recapitulate at any great length facts already so familiar to the reading public it may be sufficient simply to say that after the appearance in eighteen sixty eight of the countess guiccioli's recollections of lord byron mrs stowe felt herself called upon to defend the memory of her friend from what she esteemed to be falsehoods and slanders 
to accomplish this object she prepared for the atlantic monthly of september eighteen sixty nine an article the true story of lady byron's life speaking of her first impressions of lady byron mrs stowe says i formed her acquaintance in the year eighteen fifty three during my first visit to england i met her at a lunch party in the house of one of her friends when i was introduced to her i felt in a moment the words of her husband quote, there was awe in the homage that she drew her spirit seemed as seated on a throne it was in the fall of eighteen fifty six on the occasion of mrs stowe's second visit to england as she and her sister were on their way to eversley to visit the rev c kingsley that they stopped by invitation to lunch with lady byron at her summer residence at ham common near richmond at that time lady byron informed mrs stowe that it was her earnest desire to receive a visit from her on her return as there was a subject of great importance concerning which she desired her advice mrs stowe has thus described this interview with lady byron after lunch i retired with lady byron and my sister remained with her friends i should here remark that the chief subject of the conversation which ensued was not entirely new to me in the interval between my first and second visits to england a lady who for many years had enjoyed lady byron's friendship and confidence had with her consent stated the case generally to me giving some of the incidents so that i was in a manner prepared for what followed those who accuse lady byron of being a person fond of talking upon this subject and apt to make unconsidered confidences can have known very little of her of her reserve and of the apparent difficulty she had in speaking on subjects nearest her heart her habitual calmness and composure of manner her collected dignity on all occasions are often mentioned by her husband sometimes with bitterness sometimes with admiration he says quote, though i accuse lady byron of an excess of self-respect i must in candour admit that if ever a person had excuse for an extraordinary portion of it she has as in all her thoughts words and deeds she is the most decorous woman that ever existed and must appear what few i fancy could a perfectly refined gentlewoman even in her femme de chambre End quote this calmness and dignity were never more manifested than in this interview in recalling the conversation at this distance of time i cannot remember all the language used some particular words and forms of expression i do remember and those i give and in other cases i give my recollection of the substance of what was said there was something awful to me in the intensity of repressed emotion which she showed as she proceeded the great fact upon which all turned was stated in words that were unmistakable mrs stowe goes on to give minutely lady byron's conversation and concludes by saying quote, of course i did not listen to this story as one who was investigating its worth i received it as truth and the purpose for which it was communicated was not to enable me to prove it to the world but to ask my opinion whether she should show it to the world before leaving it the whole consultation was upon the assumption that she had at her command such proofs as could not be questioned concerning what they were i did not minutely inquire only in answer to a general question she said that she had letters and documents in proof of her story knowing lady byron's strength of mind her clear-headedness her accurate habits and her perfect knowledge of the matter i considered her judgment on this point decisive i told her that i would take the subject into consideration and give my opinion in a few days that night after my sister and myself had retired to our own apartment i related to her the whole history and we spent the night in talking it over i was powerfully impressed with the justice and propriety of an immediate disclosure while she on the contrary represented the fatal consequences that would probably come upon lady byron from taking such a step before we parted the next day i requested lady byron to give me some memoranda of such dates and outlines of the general story as would enable me better to keep it in its connection which she did on giving me the paper lady byron requested me to return it to her when it had ceased to be of use to me for the purpose intended 
accordingly a day or two after i enclosed it to her in a hasty note as i was then leaving london for paris and had not yet had time fully to consider the subject on reviewing my note i can recall that then the whole history appeared to me like one of those singular cases where unnatural impulses to vice are the result of a taint of constitutional insanity this has always seemed to me the only way of accounting for instances of utterly motiveless and abnormal wickedness and cruelty these my first impressions were expressed in the hasty note written at the time london november fifth eighteen fifty six dearest friend i return these they have held mine eyes waking how strange how unaccountable have you ever subjected the facts to the judgment of a medical man learned in nervous pathology is it not insanity great wits to madness nearly are allied and thin partitions do their bounds divide but my purpose to-night is not to write to you fully what i think of this matter i am going to write to you from paris more at leisure the rest of the letter was taken up in the final details of a charity in which lady byron had been engaged with me in assisting an unfortunate artist it concludes thus i write now in all haste en route for paris as to america all is not lost yet farewell i love you my dear friend as never before with an intense feeling that i cannot easily express god bless you h b s the next letter is as follows paris december seventeenth eighteen fifty six dear lady byron the kansas committee have written me a letter desiring me to express to miss blank their gratitude for the five pounds she sent them i am not personally acquainted with her and must return these acknowledgments through you i wrote you a day or two since enclosing the reply of the kansas committee to you on that subject on which you spoke to me the last time we were together i have thought often and deeply i have changed my mind somewhat considering the peculiar circumstances of the case i could wish that the sacred veil of silence so bravely thrown over the past should never be withdrawn during the time that you remain with us i would say then leave all with some discreet friends who after both have passed from earth shall say what was due to justice i am led to think this by seeing how low how unworthy the judgments of this world are and i would not that what i so much respect love and revere should be placed within the reach of its harpy claw which pollutes what it touches the day will yet come which will bring to light every hidden thing there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed neither hid that shall not be known and so justice will not fail such my dear friend are my thoughts different from what they were since first i heard that strange sad history meanwhile i love you forever whether we meet again on earth or not affectionately yours h b s before her article appeared in print mrs stowe addressed the following letter to dr holmes in boston hartford june twenty sixth eighteen sixty nine dear doctor i am going to ask help of you and i feel that confidence in your friendship that leads me to be glad that i have a friend like you to ask advice of in order that you may understand fully what it is i must go back some years and tell you about it when i went to england the first time i formed a friendship with lady byron which led to a somewhat interesting correspondence when there the second time after the publication of dread in eighteen fifty six lady byron wrote to me that she wished to have some private confidential conversation with me and invited me to come spend a day with her at her country seat near london i went met her alone and spent an afternoon with her the object of the visit she then explained to me she was in such a state of health that she considered she had very little time to live and was engaged in those duties and reviews which every thoughtful person finds who is coming deliberately and with their eyes open to the boundaries of this mortal life lady byron as you must perceive has all her life lived under the weight of slanders and false imputations laid upon her by her husband 
her own side of the story has been told only to that small circle of confidential friends who needed to know it in order to assist her in meeting the exigencies which it imposed on her of course it has thrown the sympathy mostly on his side since the world generally has more sympathy with impulsive incorrectness than with strict justice at that time there was a cheap edition of byron's works in contemplation meant to bring them into circulation among the masses and the pathos arising from the story of his domestic misfortunes was one great means relied on for giving it currency under these circumstances some of lady byron's friends had proposed the question to her whether she had not a responsibility to society for the truth whether she did right to allow these persons to gain influence over the popular mind by a silent consent to an utter falsehood as her whole life had been passed in the most heroic self-abnegation and self-sacrifice the question was now proposed to her whether one more act of self-denial was not required of her namely to declare the truth no matter at what expense to her own feelings for this purpose she told me she wished to recount the whole story to a person in whom she had confidence a person of another country and out of the whole sphere of personal and local feelings which might be supposed to influence those in the country and station in life where the events really happened in order that i might judge whether anything more was required of her in relation to this history the interview had almost the solemnity of a deathbed confession and lady byron told me the history which i have embodied in an article to appear in the atlantic monthly i have been induced to prepare it by the run which the guiccioli book is having which is from first to last an unsparing attack on lady byron's memory by lord byron's mistress when you have read my article i want not your advice as to whether the main facts shall be told for on this point i am so resolved that i frankly say advice would do me no good but you might help me with your delicacy and insight to make the manner of telling more perfect and i want to do it as wisely and well as such story can be told my post office address after july first will be westport point bristol county massachusetts care of mrs i m soule the proof sheets will be sent you by the publisher very truly yours h b stowe in reply to the storm of controversy aroused by the publication of this article mrs stowe made a more extended effort to justify the charges which she had brought against lord byron in a work published in eighteen sixty nine lady byron vindicated immediately after the publication of this work she mailed a copy to dr oliver wendell holmes accompanied by the following note boston may nineteenth eighteen sixty nine dear doctor in writing this book which i now take the liberty of sending to you i have been in a critical place it has been a strange weird sort of experience and i have had not a word to say to anybody though often thinking of you and wishing i could have a little of your help and sympathy in getting out what i saw i think of you very much and rejoice to see the hold your works get on england as well as this country and i would give more for your opinion than that of most folks how often i have pondered your last letter to me and sent it to many friends god bless you please accept for yourself and your good wife this copy from yours truly h b stowe mrs stowe also published in eighteen seventy through sampson low and son of london a volume for english readers the history of the byron controversy these additional volumes however do not seem to have satisfied the public as a whole and perhaps the expediency of the publication of mrs stowe's first article is doubtful even to her most ardent admirers the most that can be hoped for through the mention of this subject in this biography is the vindication of mrs stowe's purity of motive and nobility of intention in bringing this painful matter into notice while she was being on all hands effectively and evidently in some quarters with rare satisfaction 
roundly abused for the article and her consequent responsibility in bringing this unsavory discussion so prominently before the public mind she received the following letter from dr o w holmes boston september twenty five eighteen sixty nine my dear mrs stowe i have been meaning to write to you for some time but in the midst of all the wild and virulent talk about the article in the atlantic i felt as if there was little to say until the first fury of the storm had blown over i think that we all perceive now that the battle is not to be fought here but in england i have listened to a good deal of talk always taking your side in a quiet way backed very heartily on one occasion by one of my most intellectual friends reading all that came in my way and watching the course of opinion at first it was to be expected that the guiccioli fanciers would resent any attack on lord byron and would highly relish the opportunity of abusing one who like yourself had been identified with all those moral enterprises which elevate the standard of humanity at large and of womanhood in particular after this scum had worked itself off there must necessarily follow a controversy none the less sharp and bitter but not depending essentially on abuse the first point the recusants got hold of was the error of the two years which contrived to run the gauntlet of so many pairs of eyes some of them were made happy by mouthing and shaking this between their teeth as a poodle tears round with a glove this did not last long no sensible person could believe for a moment you were mistaken in the essential character of a statement every word of which would fall on the ear of a listening friend like a drop of melted lead and burn its scar deep into the memory that lady byron believed and told you the story will not be questioned by any but fools and malignants whether her belief was well founded there may be positive evidence in existence to show affirmatively the fact that her statement is not peremptorily contradicted by those most likely to be acquainted with the facts of the case is the one result so far which is forcing itself into unwilling recognition i have seen nothing in the various hypotheses brought forward which did not to me involve a greater improbability than the presumption of guilt take that for witness that byron accused himself through a spirit of perverse vanity of crimes he had not committed how preposterous he would stain the name of a sister whom on the supposition of his innocence he loved with angelic ardour as well as purity by associating it with an infamous accusation suppose there are some anomalies hard to explain in lady byron's conduct could a young and guileless woman in the hands of such a man be expected to act in any given way or would she not be likely to waver to doubt to hope to contradict herself in the anomalous position in which without experience she found herself as to the intrinsic evidence contained in the poems i think it confirms rather than contradicts the hypothesis of guilt i do not think that butler's argument and all the other attempts at invalidation of the story avail much in the face of the acknowledged fact that it was told to various competent and honest witnesses and remains without a satisfactory answer from those most interested i know your firm self-reliance and your courage to proclaim the truth when any good end is to be served by it it is to be expected that public opinion will be more or less divided as to the expediency of this revelation hoping that you have recovered from your indisposition i am faithfully yours o w holmes while undergoing the most unsparing and pitiless criticism and brutal insult mrs stowe received the following sympathetic words from mrs lewes george eliot the priory twenty one north bank december tenth eighteen sixty nine my dear friend in the midst of your trouble i was often thinking of you for i feared that you were undergoing a considerable trial from the harsh and unfair judgments partly the fruit of hostility glad to find an opportunity for venting itself and partly of that unthinking cruelty which belongs to hasty anonymous journalism for my own part i should have preferred that the byron question should never have been brought before the public because i think the discussion of such subjects is injurious socially but with regard to yourself dear friend i feel sure that in acting on a different basis of impressions you were impelled by pure generous feeling 
do not think that i would have written to you of this point to express a judgment i am anxious only to convey to you a sense of my sympathy and confidence such as a kiss and a pressure of the hand could give if i were near you i trust that i shall hear a good account of professor stowe's health as well as your own whenever you have time to write me a word or two i shall not be so unreasonable as to expect a long letter for the hours of needful rest from writing become more and more precious as the years go on but some brief news of you and yours will be especially welcome just now mr lewes unites with me in high regards to your husband and yourself but in addition to that i have the sister woman's privilege of saying that i am always your affectionate friend m h lewes End of chapter 19. Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 20, Part 1 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son, Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20, George Eliot, Part 1 correspondence with george eliot george eliot's first impressions of mrs stowe mrs stowe's letter to mrs fallen george eliot's letter to mrs stowe mrs stowe's reply life in florida robert dale owen and modern spiritualism george eliot's letter on the phenomena of spiritualism mrs stowe's description of scenery in florida Mrs. Stowe concerning Middlemarch, George Eliot to Mrs. Stowe during Rev. H. W. Beecher's trial, Mrs. Stowe concerning her life experience with her brother H. W. Beecher and his trial, Mrs. Lou's last letter to Mrs. Stowe, diverse mental characteristics of these two women, Mrs. Stowe's final estimate of modern spiritualism. It is with a feeling of relief that we turn from one of the most disagreeable experiences of Mrs. Stowe's life to one of the most delightful, namely the warm friendship of one of the most eminent women of this age, George Eliot. There seems to have been some deep affinity of feeling that drew them closely together in spite of diversity of intellectual tastes. George Eliot's attention was first personally attracted to Mrs. Stowe in 1853 by means of a letter which the latter had written to Mrs. Fallon. Speaking of this incident, she, George Eliot, writes, quote, Mrs. Fallon showed me a delightful letter which she has just had from Mrs. Stowe, telling all about herself. She begins by saying, I am a little bit of a woman, rather more than forty, as withered and dry as a pinch of snuff, never very well worth looking at in my best days, and now a decidedly used-up article. The whole letter is most fascinating and makes one love her. Footnote from George Eliot's Life, edited by J. W. Cross, Volume 1. End of footnote. The correspondence between these two notable women was begun by Mrs. Stowe and called forth the following extremely interesting letter from the distinguished English novelist. The Priory, 21 North Bank, May 8, 1869. My dear friend, I value very highly the warrant to call you friend which your letter has given me. It lay awaiting me on our return the other night from a nine-week absence in Italy, and it made me almost wish that you could have a momentary vision of the discouragement, nay, paralyzing despondency, in which many days of my writing life have been passed, in order that you might fully understand the good I find in such sympathy as yours, in such an assurance as you give me that my work has been worth doing." but I will not dwell on any mental sickness of mine. The best joy your words give me is the sense of that sweet, generous feeling in which you dictated them. I shall always be the richer because you have, in this way, made me know you better. I must tell you that my first glimpse of you as a woman came through a letter of yours and charmed me very much. The letter was addressed to Mrs. Fallon, and one morning I called on her in London how many years ago, and she was kind enough to read it to me because it contained a little history of your life and a sketch of your domestic circumstances. 
i remember thinking that it was very kind of you to write that long letter in reply to inquiries of one who was personally unknown to you and looking back with my present experience i think it was kinder than it then appeared for at that moment you must have been much oppressed with the immediate results of your fame i remember too that you wrote of your husband as one who was richer in hebrew and greek than in pounds or shillings and as an ardent scholar has always been a character of peculiar interest to me i have rarely had your image in mind without the accompanying image more or less erroneous of such a scholar by your side i shall welcome the fruit of his goth studies whenever it comes i have good hopes that your fears are groundless as to the obstacles your new book old town folks may find here from its thorough american character most readers who are likely to be really influenced by writing above the common order will find that special aspect an added reason for interest and study and i dare say you have long seen as i am beginning to see with new clearness that if a book which has any sort of exquisiteness happens also to be a popular widely circulated book the power over the social mind for any good is after all due to its reception by a few appreciative natures and is the slow result of radiation from that narrow circle i mean that you can affect a few souls and that each of these in turn may affect a few more but that no exquisite book tells properly and directly on a multitude however largely it may spread by type and paper witness the things the multitude will say about it if one is so unhappy as to be obliged to hear their sayings i do not write this cynically but in pure sadness and pity both travelling abroad and staying home among our english sights and sports how slowly the centuries work toward the moral good of men and that thought lies very close to what you say as to your wonder or conjecture concerning my religious point of view i believe that religion too has to be modified according to the dominant phases that a religion more perfect than any yet prevalent must express less care of personal consolation and the more deeply awing sense of responsibility to man springing from sympathy with that which of all things is most certainly known to us the difficulty of the human lot letters are necessarily narrow and fragmentary and when one writes on wide subjects are likely to create more misunderstanding than illumination but i have little anxiety in writing to you dear friend and fellow laborer for you have had longer experience than i as a writer and fuller experience as a woman since you have borne children and known a mother's history from the beginning i trust your quick and long-taught mind as an interpreter little liable to mistake me when you say quote, we live in an orange grove and are planting many more and when i think you must have abundant family love to cheer you it seems to me that you must have a paradise about you but no list of circumstances will make a paradise nevertheless i must believe that the joyous tender humour of your books clings about your more immediate life and makes some of that sunshine for yourself which you have given to us i see the advertisement of old town folks and shall eagerly expect it that and every other new link between us will be reverentially valued with great devotion and regard yours always m l lewes mrs stowe writes from mandarin to george eliot mandarin february eighth eighteen seventy two dear friend it is two years nearly since i had your last very kind letter and i have never answered because two years of constant and severe work have made it impossible to give a drop to anything beyond the needs of the hour yet i have always thought of you loved you trusted you all the same and read every little scrap from your writing that came to hand one thing brings you back to me i am now in florida in my little hut in the orange orchard with the broad expanse of the blue st john's in front and the waving of the live oaks with their long gray mosses overhead and the bright gold of oranges looking through dusky leaves around it is like sorrento so like that i can quite dream of being there and when i get here i enter another life the world recedes i am out of it it ceases to influence its bustle and noise die away in the far distance and here is no winter an open-air life 
a quaint rude wild wilderness sort of life both rude and rich but when i am here i write more letters to friends than ever i do elsewhere the mail comes only twice a week and then is the event of the day my old rabbi and i here set up our tent he with german and greek and hebrew devouring all sorts of black-letter books and i spinning ideal webs out of bits that he lets fall here and there i have long thought that i would write to you again when i got here and so i do i have sent north to have them send me the harper's weekly in which your new story is appearing and have promised myself leisurely to devour and absorb every word of it while i think of it i want to introduce you to a friend of mine a most noble man mr owen for some years our ambassador at naples now living a literary and scholar life in america his father was robert dale owen the theorist and communist you may have heard of in england some years since years ago in naples i visited mr owen for the first time and found him directing his attention to the phenomena of spiritism he had stumbled upon some singular instances of it accidentally and he had forthwith instituted a series of researches and experiments on the subject some of which he showed me it was the first time i had ever seriously thought of the matter and he invited my sister and myself to see some of the phenomena as exhibited by a medium friend of theirs who resided in their family the result at the time was sufficiently curious but i was interested in his account of the manner in which he proceeded keeping records of every experiment with its results in classified orders as a result of his studies and observations he has published two books one footfalls on the boundary of another world published in eighteen sixty and latterly the debatable land between this world and the next i regard mr owen as one of the few men who are capable of entering into an inquiry of this kind without an utter drowning of common sense and his books are both of them worth a fair reading to me they present a great deal that is intensely curious and interesting although i do not admit of course all his deductions and think he often takes too much for granted still with every abatement there remains a residuum of fact which i think both curious and useful in a late letter to me he says Quote, there is no writer of the present day whom i more esteem than mrs lewes nor any one whose opinion of my work i should more highly value End quote. i believe he intends sending them to you and i hope you will read them lest some of the narratives should strike you as such narratives did me once as being a perfect arabian night's entertainment i want to say that i have accidentally been in the way of confirming some of the most remarkable by personal observation in regard to all this class of subjects i am of the opinion of goethe that quote, it is just as absurd to deny the facts of spiritualism now as it was in the middle ages to ascribe them to the devil End quote i think mr owen attributes too much value to his facts i do not think the things contributed from the ultra mundane sphere are particularly valuable apart from the evidence they give of continued existence after death i do not think there is yet any evidence to warrant the idea that they are a supplement or continuation of the revelations of christianity but i do regard them as an interesting and curious study in psychology and every careful observer like mr owen ought to be welcomed to bring in his facts with this i shall send you my observations on mr owen's books from the christian union i am perfectly aware of the frivolity and worthlessness of much of the revealings purported to come from spirits in my view the worth or worthlessness of them has nothing to do with the question of the fact do invisible spirits speak in any wise wise or foolish is the question a priori i do not know of any reason why there should not be as many foolish virgins in the future state as in this as i am a believer in the bible and christianity i don't need these things as confirmations and they are not likely to be a religion to me i regard them simply as i do the phenomenon of the aurora borealis or darwin's studies on natural selection as curious studies into nature 
besides i think some day we shall find a law by which all these facts will fall into their places i hope now this subject does not bore you it certainly is one that seems increasingly to insist on getting itself heard it is going on and on making converts who are many more than dare avow themselves and for my part i wish it were all brought into the daylight of inquiry let me hear from you if ever you feel like it i know too well the possibilities and impossibilities of a nature like yours to ask more but it can do you no harm to know that i still think of you and love you as ever faithfully yours h b stowe the priory twenty one north bank regent's park march fourth eighteen seventy two dear friend i can understand very easily that the last two years have been full for you of other and more imperative work than the writing of letters not absolutely demanded either by charity or business the proof that you still think of me affectionately is very welcome now it has come and more cheering because it enables me to think of you as enjoying your retreat in your orange orchard your western sorrento the beloved rabbi still beside you i am sure it must be a great blessing to you to bathe in that quietude as it always is to us when we go out of reach of london influences and have the large space of country days to study walk and talk in when i am more at liberty i will certainly read mr owen's books if he is good enough to send them to me i desire on all subjects to keep an open mind but hitherto the various phenomena reported or attested in connection with ideas of spirit intercourse and so on have come before me here in the painful form of the lowest charlatanery but apart from personal contact with people who get money by public exhibitions as mediums or with semi-idiots such as those who make a court for a mrs blank or other feminine personages of that kind i would not willingly place any barriers between my mind and any possible channel of truth affecting the human lot the spirit in which you have written in the paper you kindly sent me is likely to touch others and rouse them at least to attention in a case where you have been deeply impressed yours with sincere affection m l lewes begun april fourth by mrs stowe mandarin florida may eleventh eighteen seventy two my dear friend i was very glad to get your dear little note sorry to see by it that you are not in your full physical force owing to the awkwardness and misunderstanding of publishers i am not reading middlemarch as i expected to be here in these orange shades they don't send it and i am too far out of the world to get it i felt when i read your letters how glad i should be to have you here in our florida cottage in the wholly new wild woodland life though resembling italy in climate it is wholly different in the appearance of nature the plants the birds the animals all different the green tidiness and culture of england here gives way to a wild and rugged savageness of beauty every tree bursts forth with flowers wild vines and creepers execute delirious gambols and weave and interweave in interminable labyrinths yet here the great sandy plains back of our house there is a constant wondering sense of beauty in the wild wonderful growths of nature first of all the pines high as the stone pines of italy with long leaves eighteen inches long through which there is a constant dreamy sound as if of dashing waters then the live oaks and the water oaks narrow-leaved evergreens which grow to enormous size and whose branches are draped with long festoons of grey moss there is a great wild park of these trees back of us which with the dazzling varnished green of the new spring leaves and the swaying drapery of moss looks like a sort of enchanted grotto underneath grow up hollies and ornamental flowering shrubs and the yellow jasmine climbs into and over everything with fragrant golden bells and buds so that sometimes the foliage of the tree is wholly hidden in its embrace this wild wonderful bright and vivid growth that is all new strange and unknown by name to me has a charm for me it is the place to forget the outside world and to live in oneself and if you were here we would go together and gather azaleas and white lilies and silver bells and blue iris 
These flowers keep me painting in a sort of madness. I have just finished a picture of white lilies that grow in the moist land by the watercourses. I am longing to begin on blue iris. Artist, poet, as you are by nature, you ought to see all these things. And if you would come here, I would take you in heart and house, and you should have a little room in our cottage. The history of the cottage is this. I found a hut built close to a great live oak, twenty-five feet in girth, and with overarching boughs eighty feet up in the air, spreading like a firmament, and all swaying with mossy festoons. We began to live here, and gradually we improved the hut by lathe, plaster, and paper. Then we threw out a wide veranda all around, for in these regions the veranda is the living room of the house. Ours had to be built round the trunk of a tree, so that our cottage has a peculiar and original air, and seems as if it were half tree, or a something that has grown out of the tree. We added on parts, and have thrown out gables and chambers, as a tree throws out new branches, till our cottage is like nobody else's, and yet we settle into it with real enjoyment. There are all sorts of queer little rooms in it, and we are accommodating at this present a family of seventeen souls. In front, the beautiful Grand St. John stretches five miles from shore to shore, and we watch the steamboats plying back and forth to the great world we are out of. On all sides, large orange trees, with their dense shade and ever-vivid green, shut out the sun so that we can sit and walk and live in the open air. Our winter here is only cool, bracing outdoor weather, without snow. No month without flowers blooming in the open air, and lettuce and peas in the garden. The summer range is about 90 degrees, but the sea breezes keep the air delightfully fresh. Generally, we go north, however, for three months of summer. Well, I do not mean to run on about Florida, but the subject runs away with me, and I want you to visit us in spirit, if not personally. My poor rabbi, he sends you some Arabic, which I fear you cannot read. On diablerie he is up to his ears in knowledge, having read all things in all tongues, from the Talmud down. Ever lovingly yours, H. B. Stowe. Boston, September 26th, 1872. My dear friend, I think when you see my name again so soon, you will think it rains, hails, and snows notes from this quarter. Just now, however, I am in this lovely little nest in Boston, where dear Mrs. Fields, like a dove, sits brooding on the charmed wave. We are both wishing we had you here with us, and she has not received any answer from you as yet in reply to the invitation you spoke of in your last letter to me. It seems as if you must have written, and the letter somehow gone astray, because I know, of course, you would write. Yesterday, reading Middlemarch, we were both out of our senses with mingled pity and indignation at that dreadful stick of a Casabon, and to think of poor Dorothea dashing like a warm, sunny wave against so cold and repulsive a rock. He is a little too dreadful for anything. There does not seem to be a drop of warm blood in him, and so, as it is his misfortune and not his fault to be cold-blooded, one must not get angry with him. It is the scene in the garden, after the interview with the doctor, that rests on our mind at present. There was such a man as he, over in Boston, high in literary circles, but I fancy his wife wasn't like Dorothea, and a vastly proper time they had of it, treating each other with mutual reverence, like two Chinese mandarins. My love, what I miss in this story is just what we would have if you would come to our tumbled-down, jolly, improper but joyous country, namely, jollitude. You write and live on so high a plane. It is all self-abnegation. We want to get you over here and into this house, where, with closed doors, we sometimes make the rafters ring with fun and say anything and everything, no matter what, and won't be any properer than we's a mind to be. I am wishing every day you could see our America, travel as I have been doing from one bright, thriving, pretty, flowery town to another, and see so much wealth, ease, progress, culture, and all sorts of nice things. 
this dovecot where i am now is the sweetest little nest imaginable fronting on a city street with back windows opening on a sea view with still quiet rooms filled with books pictures and all sorts of things such as you and mr lewes would enjoy don't be afraid of the ocean now i've crossed it six times and assure you it is an overrated item froud is coming here why not you besides we have the fountain of eternal youth here that is in florida where i live and if you should come you would both of you take a new lease of life and what glorious poems and philosophies and what not we should have my rabbi writes in the seventh heaven an account of your note to him to think of his setting off on his own account when i was away come now since your answer to dear miss fields is yet to come let it be a glad yes and we will clasp you to our heart of hearts your ever loving h b s end of chapter twenty part one read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Chapter 20, Part 2 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20, George Eliot, Part 2. During the summer of 1874, while Mrs. Stowe's brother, the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, was the victim of a most revolting, malicious, and groundless attack on his purity, Mrs. Lewes wrote the following words of sympathy. My dear friend, the other day I had a letter from Mrs. Fields, written to let me know something of you under that heavy trouble, of which such information as I have had has been quite untrustworthy, leaving me in entire incredulity in regard to it except on this point, that you and yours must be suffering deeply. Naturally, I thought most of you in the matter, the public aspects being indeterminate, and many times before our friend's letter came, I had said to Mr. Lewes, what must Mrs. Stowe be feeling? I remember Mrs. Fields once told me of the wonderful courage and cheerfulness which belong to you, enabling you to bear up under exceptional trials, and I imagined you helping the sufferers with tenderness and counsel, but yet, nevertheless, I felt that there must be a bruising weight on your heart. Dear honored friend, you who are so ready to give warm fellowship, is it any comfort to you to be told that those afar off are caring for you in spirit and will be happier for all good issues that may bring you rest? I cannot, dare not, write more in my ignorance, lest I should be using unreasonable words. But I trust in your not despising this scrap of paper, which tells you, perhaps rather for my relief than yours, that I am always in grateful sweet remembrance of your goodness to me and your energetic labors for all. End quote. It was two years or more before Mrs. Stowe replied to these words of sympathy. Orange Blossom Time, Mandarin, March 18, 1876. My dear friend, I always think of you when the orange trees are in blossom. Just now they are fuller than ever, and so many bees are filling the branches that the air is full of a sort of still murmur. And now I am beginning to hear from you every month in Harper's. It is as good as a letter. Daniel Deronda has succeeded in awaking in my somewhat worn-out mind and interest. So many stories are tramping over one's mind in every modern magazine nowadays that one is macadamized, so to speak. It takes something unusual to make a sensation. This does excite and interest me as I wait for each number with eagerness. I wish I could endow you with our long winter weather, not winter except such as you find in Sicily. We live here from November to June, and my husband sits out on the veranda and reads all day. We emigrate in solid family. My two dear daughters, husband, self, and servants, come together to spend the winter here, and so together to our northern home in summer. My twin daughters relieve me from all domestic care. They are lively, vivacious, with a real genius for practical life. We have around us a little settlement of neighbors who, like ourselves, have a winter home here and live an easy, undress, picnic kind of life far from the world and its cares. 
mr stowe has been busy on eight volumes of gorez on the mysticism of the middle ages this gorez was professor of philosophy at munich and he reviews the whole ground of the shadowland between the natural and the supernatural ecstasy trance prophecy miracles spiritualism and stigmata etc he was a devout roman catholic and the so-called facts that he reasons on seem to me quite amazing and yet the possibilities that lie between inert matter and man's living all-powerful immortal soul may make almost anything credible the soul at times can do anything with matter i have been busying myself with st beau's seven volumes on the port royal development i like him st beau his capacity of seeing doing justice to all kinds of natures and sentiments is wonderful i am sorry he is no longer our side the veil there is a red bird cardinal grosbeak singing in the orange trees fronting my window so sweetly and insistently as to almost stop my writing i hope dear friend you are well better than when you wrote last it was very sweet and kind of you to write what you did last i suppose it is so long ago you may have forgotten but it was a word of tenderness and sympathy about my brother's trial it was womanly tender and sweet such as at heart you are after all my love of you is greater than my admiration for i think it more and better to be really a woman worth loving than to have read greek and german and written books and in this last book i read i feel more with you in some little fine points they stare at me as making an amusing exhibition for my dear i feel myself at last as one who has been playing and picnicking on the shores of life and waked from a dream late in the afternoon to find that everybody almost has gone over to the beyond and the rest are sorting their things and packing their trunks and waiting for the boat to come and take them it seems now but a little time since my brother henry and i were two young people together he was my two years junior and nearest companion out of seven brothers and three sisters i taught him drawing and heard his latin lessons for you know a girl becomes mature and womanly long before a boy i saw him through college and helped him through the difficult love affair that gave him his wife and then he and my husband had a real german enthusiastic love for each other which ended in making me a wife ah in those days we never dreamed that he or i or any of us would be known in the world all he seemed then was a boy full of fun full of love full of enthusiasm for protecting abused and righting wronged people which made him in those early days write editorials and wear arms and swear himself a special policeman to protect the poor negroes in cincinnati where we then lived where then were mobs instigated by the slaveholders of kentucky then he married and lived a missionary life in the new west all with a joyousness an enthusiasm a chivalry which made life bright and vigorous to us both then in time he was called to brooklyn just as the crisis of the great anti-slavery battle came on and the fugitive slave law was passed i was then in maine and i well remember one snowy night his riding till midnight to see me and then our talking till near morning what we could do to make headway against the horrid cruelties that were being practised against the defenceless blacks my husband was then away lecturing and my heart was burning itself out in indignation and anguish henry told me then that he meant to fight that battle in new york that he would have a church that would stand by him to resist the tyrannic dictation of southern slaveholders i said i too have begun to do something i have begun a story trying to set forth the sufferings and wrongs of the slaves that's right hattie said he finish it and i will scatter it thick as leaves of valambrosa and so came uncle tom and plymouth church became a stronghold where the slave always found refuge and a strong helper one morning my brother found sitting on his doorstep poor old paul edmondson weeping his two daughters of sixteen and eighteen had passed into the slave warehouse of bruin and hill and were to be sold my brother took the man by the hand to a public meeting told his story for him and in an hour raised the two thousand dollars to redeem his children 
over and over again afterwards slaves were redeemed at plymouth church and henry and plymouth church became words of hatred and fear through half the union from that time until we talked together about the fugitive slave law there was not a pause or stop in the battle till we had been through the war and slavery had been wiped out in blood through all he has been pouring himself out wrestling burning laboring everywhere making stump speeches when elections turned on the slave question and ever maintaining that the cause of christ was the cause of the slave and when all was over it was he and lord garrison who were sent by government once more to raise our national flag on fort sumter you must see that a man does not so energize without making many enemies half of our union has been defeated a property of millions annihilated by emancipation a proud and powerful slave aristocracy reduced to beggary and there are those who never saw our faces that to this hour hate him and me then he has been a progressive in theology he has been a student of huxley and spencer and darwin enough to alarm the old school and yet remained so ardent to supernaturalists as equally to repel the radical destructionists in religion he and i are christ worshippers adoring him as the image of the invisible god and all that comes from believing this then he has been a reformer an advocate of universal suffrage and women's rights yet not radical enough to please that reform party who stand where the socialists of france do and are for tearing up all creation generally lastly he has had the misfortune of a popularity which is perfectly phenomenal i cannot give you any idea of the love worship idolatry with which he has been overwhelmed he has something magnetic about him that makes everybody crave his society that makes men follow and worship him i remember being at his house one evening in the time of early flowers and in that one evening came a box of flowers from maine another from new jersey another from connecticut all from people with whom he had no personal acquaintance who had read something of his and wanted to send him some token i said one would think you were a prima donna what does make people go on so about you my brother is hopelessly generous and confiding his inability to believe evil is something incredible and so has come all this suffering you said you hoped i should be at rest when the first investigating committee and plymouth church cleared my brother almost by acclamation not so the enemy have so committed themselves that either they or he must die and there has followed two years of the most dreadful struggle first a legal trial of six months the expenses of which on his side were one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars and in which he and his brave wife sat side by side in the courtroom and heard all that these plotters who had been weaving their webs for three years could bring the foreman of the jury was offered a bribe of ten thousand dollars to decide against my brother he sent the letter containing the proposition to the judge but with all their plotting three-fourths of the jury decided against them and their case was lost this was accepted as a triumph by my brother's friends a large number of the most influential clergy of all denominations so expressed themselves in a public letter and it was hoped the thing was so far over that it might be lived down and overgrown with better things but the enemy intriguing secretly with all those parties in the community who wish to put down a public and too successful man have been struggling to bring the thing up again for an ecclesiastical trial the cry has been raised in various religious papers that plymouth church was in complicity with crime that they were so captivated with eloquence and genius that they refused to make competent investigation the six months legal investigation was insufficient a new trial was needed plymouth church immediately called a council of ministers and laymen in number representing thirty-seven thousand congregational christians to whom plymouth church surrendered her records her conduct all the facts of the case and this great council unanimously supported the church and ratified her decision recognizing the fact that in all the investigations hitherto nothing had been proved against my brother they at his request 
and that of Plymouth Church, appointed a committee of five, to whom within sixty days, and one, should bring any facts that they could prove, or else forever after hold their peace. It is thought now by my brother's friends that this thing must finally reach a close. But you see why I have not written. This has drawn on my life, my heart's blood. He is myself. I know you are the kind of woman to understand me when I say that I felt a blow at him more than at myself. I, who know his purity, honor, delicacy, know that he has been from childhood of an ideal purity, who reverenced his conscience as his king, whose glory was redressing human wrong, who spake no slander, no, nor listened to it. Never have I known a nature of such strength and such almost childlike innocence. He is of a nature so sweet and perfect that though I have seen him thunderously indignant at moments, I never saw him fretful or irritable. A man who continuously, in every little act of life, is thinking of others. A man that all the children on the street run after, and that every sorrowful, weak, or distressed person looks to as a natural helper." In all this long history, there has been no circumstance of his relation to any woman that has not been worthy of himself, pure, delicate, and proper. And I know all sides of it, and certainly should not say this if there was even a misgiving. Thank God there is none, and I can read my New Testament and feel that by all the Beatitudes my brother is blessed. His calmness, serenity, and cheerfulness through all this time have uplifted us all. Where he was, there was no anxiety, no sorrow. My brother's power to console is something peculiar and wonderful. I have seen him at deathbeds and funerals, where it would seem as if hope herself must be dumb, bring down the very peace of heaven, and change despair to trust. He has not had less power in his own adversity. You cannot conceive how he is beloved by those even who never saw him old paralytic distressed neglected people poor seamstresses black people who have felt these arrows shot against their benefactor as against themselves and most touching have been their letters of sympathy from the first he has met this in the spirit of francis de sales who met a similar plot by silence prayer and work and when urged to defend himself said god would do it in his time God was the best judge how much reputation he needed to serve him with. In your portrait of Deronda, you speak of him as one of those rare natures in whom a private wrong bred no bitterness. Quote, the sense of injury breeds not the will to inflict injuries, but a hatred of all injury. End quote. And I must say, through all this conflict, my brother has always been in the spirit of him who touched and healed the ear of Malchus when he himself was attacked. His friends and lawyers have sometimes been aroused and sometimes indignant with his habitual caring for others and his habit of vindicating and extending even to his enemies every scrap and shred of justice that might belong to them. From first to last of this trial, he has never for a day intermitted his regular work preaching to crowded houses, preaching even in his short vacations at watering places, carrying on his missions, which have regenerated two once wretched districts of the city, editing a paper, and in short, giving himself up to work. He cautioned his church not to become absorbed in him and his trials, to prove their devotion by more faithful church work and a wider charity, and never have the Plymouth missions among the poor been so energetic and effective. He said recently, The worst that can befall a man is to stop thinking of God and begin thinking of himself. If trials make us self-absorbed, they hurt us. Well, dear, pardon me for this outpour. I loved you. I love you. And therefore wanted you to know just what I felt. Now, dear, this is over. Don't think you must reply to it or me. I know how much you have to do. Yes, I know all about an aching head and an overtaxed brain. This last work of yours is to be your best, I think, and I hope it will bring you enough to buy an orange grove in Sicily or somewhere else and so have lovely weather such as we have here. 
your ancient admirer my husband who usually goes to bed at eight o'clock was convicted by me of sitting up after eleven over the last installment of daniel deronda and he is full of it we think well of gwendolen and that she isn't much more than young ladies in general so far next year if i can possibly do it i will send you some of our oranges i perfectly long to have you enjoy them your ever loving h b stowe p s i am afraid i shall write you again when i am reading your writings they are so provokingly suggestive of things one wants to say h b s in her reply to this letter mrs lewes says incidentally quote, please offer my reverential love to the professor and tell him i am ruthlessly proud of having kept him out of his bed i hope that both you and he will continue to be interested in my spiritual children End quote. after mr lewes death mrs lewes writes to mrs stowe the priory twenty one north bank april tenth eighteen seventy nine my dear friend i have been long without sending you any sign unless you have received a message from me through mrs fields but my heart has been going out to you and your husband continuously as among the chief of the many kind beings who have given me their tender fellow-feeling in my last earthly sorrow when your first letter came with the beautiful gift of your book footnote uncle tom's cabin new edition with introduction and footnote i was unable to read any letters and did not for a long time see what you had sent me but when i did know and had read your words of thankfulness at the great good you have seen wrought by your help i felt glad for your sake first and then for the sake of the great nation to which you belong the hopes of the world are taking refuge westward under the calamitous conditions moral and physical in which we of the elder world are getting involved thank you for telling me that you have the comfort of seeing your son in a path that satisfies your best wishes for him i like to think of your having family joys one of the prettiest photographs of a child that i possess is one of your sending to me please offer my reverential affectionate regards to your husband and believe me my dear friend yours always gratefully m l lewes as much as has been said with regard to spiritualism in these pages the subject has by no means the prominence that it really possessed in the studies and conversations of both professor and mrs stowe professor stowe's very remarkable psychological development and the exceptional experiences of his early life were sources of conversation of unfailing interest and study to both Professor Stowe had made an elaborate and valuable collection of the literature on the subject, and was, as Mrs. Stowe writes, over head and ears in diablerie. It is only just to give Mrs. Stowe's views on this perplexing theme more at length, and as the mature reflection of many years has caused them to take form. In reference to professional mediums and spirits that peep, rap, and mutter, she writes, quote, each friend takes away a portion of ourselves there was some part of our being related to him as no other and we had things to say to him which no other would understand and appreciate a portion of our thoughts has become useless and burdensome and again and again with involuntary yearning we turn to the stone at the door of the sepulchre we lean against the cold silent marble but there is no answer no voice neither any that regardeth there are those who would have us think that in our day this doom is reversed that there are those who have the power to restore to us the communion with our lost ones how many a heart wrung and tortured with the anguish of this fearful silence has throbbed with strange vague hopes at the suggestion when we hear sometimes of persons of the strongest and clearest minds becoming credulous votaries of certain spiritualist circles let us not wonder if we inquire we shall almost always find that the belief has followed some stroke of death it is only an indication of the desperation of that heart hunger which in part it appeases ah were it true 
were it indeed so that the wall between the spiritual and material is growing thin and a new dispensation germinating in which communion with the departed blessed shall be among the privileges and possibilities of this our mortal state ah were it so that when we go forth weeping in the grey dawn bearing spices and odours which we long to pour forth for the beloved dead we should indeed find the stone rolled away and an angel sitting on it but no such angel have we seen no such sublime unquestionable glorious manifestation and when we look at what is offered to us ah who that had a friend in heaven could wish them to return in such wise as this the very instinct of a sacred sorrow seems to forbid that our beautiful our glorified ones should stoop lower than even to the medium of their cast-off bodies to juggle and rap and squeak and perform mountebank tricks with tables and chairs to recite over in weary sameness harmless truisms which we were wise enough to say for ourselves to trifle and banter and jest or to lead us through endless moonshiny mazes sadly and soberly we say that if this be communion with the dead we had rather be without it we want something a little in advance of our present life and not below it we have read with some attention weary pages of spiritual communication purporting to come from bacon swedenborg and others and long accounts from divers spirits of things seen in the spirit land and we can conceive of no more appalling prospect than to have them true if the future life is so weary stale flat and unprofitable as we might infer from these readings one would have reason to deplore an immortality from which no suicide could give an outlet to be condemned to such eternal prosing would be worse than annihilation is there then no satisfaction from this craving of the soul there is one who says i am he that liveth and was dead and behold i am alive for evermore and i have the keys of hell and of death and this same being said once before he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and i will love him and will manifest myself unto him this is a promise direct and personal not confined to the first apostles but stated in the most general way as attainable by any one who loves and does the will of jesus it seems given to us as some comfort for the unavoidable heart-breaking separations of death that there should be in that dread unknown one all-powerful friend with whom it is possible to commune and from whose spirit there may come a response to us our elder brother the partaker of our nature is not only in the spirit land but is all-powerful there it is he that shutteth and no man openeth and openeth and no man shutteth he whom we have seen in the flesh weeping over the grave of lazarus is he who hath the keys of hell and of death if we cannot commune with our friends we can at least commune with him to whom they are present who is intimately with them as with us he is the true bond of union between the spirit world and our souls and one blessed hour of prayer when we draw near to him and feel the breadth and length and depth and height of that love of his that passeth knowledge is better than all those incoherent vain dreamy glimpses with which longing hearts are cheated they who have disbelieved all spiritual truth who have been sadduceic doubters of either angel or spirit may find in modern spiritualism a great advance but can one who has ever really had communion with christ who has said with john truly our fellowship is with the father and the son can such an one be satisfied with what is found in the modern circle for christians who have strayed into these enclosures we cannot but recommend the homely but apt quotation of old john newton what think ye of christ is the test to try both your word and your scheme in all these so-called revelations have there come any echoes of the new song which no man save the redeemed from earth could learn any unfoldings of that love that passeth knowledge anything in short such as spirits might utter to whom was unveiled that which eye hath not seen nor ear heard neither hath entered the heart of man to conceive 
we must confess that all those spirits that yet have spoken appear to be living in quite another sphere from john or paul let us then who long for communion with spirits seek nearness to him who has promised to speak and commune leaving forever this word to his church i will not leave you comfortless i will come to you end of chapter twenty read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana